gentlemen, welcome to podcast. First rule of podcast is you do not talk about podcast. The second rule of podcast is you do not talk about podcast. Third rule of podcast, someone yells stop, goes limp, taps out, the pod is over. Fourth rule, only two guys to a pod. Fifth rule, one pod at a time, fellas. Sixth rule, no shirts, no shoes. Seventh rule, pods will go on as long as they have to. And the eighth and final rule, if this is your first time at podcast, uh-huh. you have to pod. <laughs> uh-huh. Now, if I went limp during this podcast, the podcast yeah. would not stop. You should admit that. Yes. And also, <laughs> it, we're, this is a four-person episode. I should make it clear. We're breaking rule number four. Oh, that's four. true. And also, all our shirts are on. Yes. Well, and so also, far. And shoes. So far. Has well, any quote ever been more preordained? Oh, your shoes are off. My shoes are off. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, a little saucy toe wiggle. A little saucy toe wiggle. Um, That's the kind question. of energy at Fight Club, right? People talk about no, saucy toe The only question was, yeah. did, were you going to hold podcast off for the end? Yeah, we, were if you going to sprinkle it in throughout? Fight, if this is your first time at Fight Club, you have to podcast. I, I didn't know if we'd hear it. No, I want I wanted all of it. Yeah, I wanted all of it. I wanted it uh, everywhere. Now, it does put us in a difficult position. Uh, not, not the quote I just read, but the actual quote in the movie. We're here ostensibly to talk about this film, but are we not allowed to? And I'm not saying because of the, the SAG WGA strikes where people are very muddy on the idea of what is or isn't legal podcasting and are going to false conclusions. That's not the issue here. The issue here is we've been told specifically not to talk about Fight Club. I mean, this is a no-biz podcast. It's though. a no-biz So podcast. we would never do something like that where we would incorporate some weird element of the movie and then sort of like have it affect the episode. I think if we just chose to not discuss the movie at hand and spend the next three hours talking about Becker, people would be happy. Sure. I think there is a track record. Have you seen Becker? Of people being no. happy when that not happens. Not even one ep? No, not one the, single solitary Becker's minute of all kind of got Becker? big ARP energy. The, um, yeah, well, <laughs> you would maybe reboot Becker my if only, you started watching Becker. My only association with Becker, I guess you guys have resuscitated, was sure. the South Park joke. I don't remember the, the South, South Park, Park joke? joke. You guys don't remember this? It was like, I don't know, 2005 South Park where they were just watching it and it was Ted Danson, like cartoon animated flat face. And he just said, I'm T. Becker. The T is for terrific. <laughs> And I'd never seen it or really heard of it at the time. And I just thought, this is either very funny or very stupid. But either way, it makes me laugh and I have no context for it. Um, he is uh, uh, John Becker, though. Jay. Well, take it up with Matt and Trey. Yeah. If Dr- I ever Dr- meet Dr- Matt and Trey, the first thing I'll say to them is like, why did you get Becker's name wrong? It's also possible dicks? I'm misremembering this, possible. but I'm, I'm 90% no, joke, certain though. that the T is for terrific. Um, Becker obviously debuted in 1998. So canonically within the, you know, the show, Becker might have seen Fight Club. Mm-hmm. He might have been like, yeah, I'll go, go see a movie. Summer of 99. Maybe I'll see Fight Club. Fall of 99. I thought it was summer. Why he's did it- shit out of luck if he's going in the summer. Poor guy. You're right. It's the fall. Why did I associate it with the summer? I think it's I just such an October movie. In my I, it is, but I, that's why I think in my head I was like they sort of weirdly whiffed and put it out in August or something. But uh, I'm wrong, very wrong, which is silly. Maybe could it have come out that late in Britain? Let's look it up. Hmm. You mean back, a year later? Like back in the day, that would happen. Like they would release shit. In, I mean, they honestly they still do it sometimes. No, nope, came out in November. So what? Came, came out in November out immediately. So. Uh, or yeah, know, a month later. a month later. Yeah. Feels like an Empire Magazine movie. Uh, the biggest, yes. Alex, you bringing up things that have lingered with you in terms of being funny that you still think about and laugh on a regular basis. The T is for terrific. T is for terrific. I I want to pull this up, get it verbatim. Uh, Sunday, April sixteenth of this year. Uh, okay. Apropos of nothing, you text me at nine forty a.m. You ever think what John Henson is up to? John Henson, the basketball player? I respond from... Incorrect, David. I way respond... Off, way, way off. From Talk Soup. That's right. Oh, the comedian guy. The, the most white forgotten guy, right? Talk Soup host. And then you say, of course, on any given day, 98 to 2000, in parentheses, pre-Kilborn, my answer for funniest person alive. Oh, oh, so oh in 1998, you were like, when I want comedy, I turn to John Henson, <laughs> the host of Talk Soup. His, his rhythms, his everything <laughs> about him was like my absolute favorite. And then look, this is... Look Keeping at, in mind, you say 940 
as David and I know, I've been up at that point for three hours. I know, I'm, yeah. I'm not yeah, rolling out sure. of not, bed and texting you. This is like the middle of my day. I'm not saying that. It, <laughs> I, I'm just saying, I just, for context, and then I, I forgot the direct transition here is, I respond, no, I never think about what he's up to. Then I say, it looks like he hosted Wipeout for seven years. Right. And then in April, I text you, by the way, I think we're doing Fincher after Park Chan Wook, if any picks spring to mind. And you go, oh yeah, hell yeah, anything. Fight Club, of course, the defining movie of my life for four years. That's right. I worry that me on Fight Club has potential to be too obnoxious, but much like Clockwork Orange, maybe irresistible. Or pivot back to the old Alex selection method and do Panic Room. Now, this is a big thing. Your your selection method used to be pick the least essential film in any person's filmography. Or just the kind of one that people would say like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. And then your last three picks, including this one, it's a new trilogy of, Movies that basically are the building blocks of your entire personality. It's Halloween, Clockwork Orange, and now Fight Club. Right. Yeah. You've gone from being like, I pick the things that don't exist or the most marginal to the things that are the most important to you on a cellular level. Yeah. What if we... We'll close the book on the trilogy, maybe. But make I, this I, episode I, 70 minutes long. Just like tru truly piss everyone off. No, I mean, off. I have to be somewhere in 90 minutes. Do you? Uh, no. Okay, good. Great. Yes. Uh, uh, funny that I, I, I do issue. right here starting to talk about the movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> 90 minutes from now, we will uh, the begin clock. the plot. Yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I don't, I mean, it would be fun. Would, would would it be Panic Room? I feel like that's kind of the one that's just. Yeah, it's that or Button. But it's I think, not really right, a Fincher where you can be like, no one remember. Panic Room is right. probably the close closest. And I'm sure yeah. you have a superior guest for that than that. We have I a lovely guest for Panic guess. Room. Yeah. Uh, look forward to that next week. Yeah. In fact. Yes. But this is a blank check with Griffin and David. I am Griffin. I'm David. Jumpin' Jack Sims. <laughs> Call me Whoopi because I am Jumpin' Jack Sims. He is Jumpin' Jack Sims. When I uh, real quick, if you, as long as you're Please. referencing it. Oh, absolutely. So when we were promoting, or no, for some reason after Listen Up Philip came out, mm -hmm. Jonathan Price was in New York, and at Metrograph, I was like, well, we got to do something. So we screened Brazil, mm -hmm. and I did a Q and A with him. But then Jake Perlin, former programmer of Metrograph, was yeah. like, as long as Price is in the building. I want to have him introduce Jumping Jack Flash. So it was a sold-out screening of Brazil. Yeah. Where I sat next to Jonathan. He watched the movie for the first time in 25 years. What do you think? He was so emotional. He was like... It'd be so funny if he was like, this thing's a piece of shit. No one in the studio so didn't want it. He people in this he, movie you. that we've lost. I think Hoskins had maybe just died. Okay. He just was like, I cannot believe... Like, in the right. room, the room was going wild. Yeah. Such a good movie. And then yeah, he introduced a 35-millimeter print of Jumping Jack Flash for seven people. <laughs> And he was just like, I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't yeah. think I'm actually also, in this movie. I think I just I do the voiceover. Say, he has like a small role in that film. I think I he's just, just in the final scene. Yeah, and, it's not and, like he's the villain or something. And Jake, Incredible move from to, Berlin. To, yeah. the, to this day, it's just like, man, remember that? That was one of my all-time wins. <laughs> yes, no, that's incredible. <laughs> yes. But anyway, uh, Jumpin' Jackson. We were just talking Price the other day because we're doing the Bras and Bonds oh, over great. on oh, uh, Patreon. So we we're talking his his Murdoch-esque turn. Yeah, I yes. will say that... the villain of Tomorrow Never so Dies. We were at the Locarno Film Festival mm -hmm. or Listen Up, Philip. Getting to like walk around a European film festival sure, with, with a him. Bond oh, uh, villain, character yeah, right, yeah. was really interesting because yeah. to me... Even one of the lesser Bond yeah, villains. No offense like, to uh, um, no, whatever not. his name is. People Elliot Carver. forget yeah. that he's... Yes. I, I had forgotten he's in that movie. Yes. And he's good in it, but like the, the mania he's doing of, exactly what it wants. of European yes, yes. fans coming up to a Bond villain mm. was outrageous. Right. And Hand someone at some that. point handed yeah. him like a James Bond, um, like a cookie. Like the a James Bond cookie? Like the frosting was arranged to say 007 or something. And they wow. were like, can you take a picture with this? I take pictures of every Bond girl or Bond villain that I encounter with a cookie. Like it was, That's it was wild. wild. The cookie guy. People really love interacting with a Bond character in yeah. Europe. Um, I love Jonathan Bryce, but he we, is not we, in Fight we Club. Him. No. But we may cover Jumpin' Jack Flash one day. Uh, because it's a penny. Yeah, I mean, I think we got to do her someday. It's her first film. That'll be a fun app. If we ever decide to to give a penny for our thoughts. Exactly. Or our thoughts on penny. Right. Um, This is a podcast about Take filmography. Take a penny, leave a penny. Take a penny, leave a penny. That's what it'll be called. It's the first mini series where we only cover every other film in her filmography. We take one penny, we leave one out of the schedule. Um, But Jumping Jack Flash is essential. Listen, it's a podcast about filmography. It's also a guest, guest, guest. It's a what? It's, a, it's Rolling Stones song. It's a gas, gas, gas. Jumping Jack. Flash. Oh, oh, sure, 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 sure. Um, directors who have massive success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. And sometimes those checks clear and sometimes 
They Fight Baby. It's a miniseries on the films of David Fincher. It is called The Curious Pod of Benjamin Buttcast. Maybe our best title ever. It's the best one. I'm glad, I, I'm glad I learned that. Yeah. On, on, air, on yeah. air. Got it. We got a, a genuine chuckle out of you. Yep. Uh, our guest today returning to the show, uh, completing his uh, My DNA Makeup trilogy, uh, Alex Ross Perry. And I can't be obnoxious. I didn't because I'm underprepared. I, I I have no wow. real... Oh, you're not coming in with like a no, folder? No, like or... a few pages here in my notebook. You uh, can print it out. You no, know I mean? just... I went, I went back to basics in that regard that all okay. I have is what I wrote down Stripped while watching down. the movie. I think that's fine. We have a yeah. big fat dossier as always, of course. Yeah, we're not allowed to talk a about a lot of dossier. Right, that's an yeah. issue. I kind of want to get some dossier on this because I found the Wikipedia page for this movie to be insufferable. Yes, and also, unsurprisingly... It's quite fat. It's a I big was, old... Page. But I was a, going it's a Wikipedia through, page that some people have uploaded their dissertations to, which right, I don't right, like. Right. Sometimes it's yes. a problem. I also right. was like reading stuff on the Wikipedia page as I was watching the movie with commentary on and in real time hearing Fincher negate what was reported on the Wikipedia page. Right. Which is weird because it's usually a like bulletproof source for information. I've never read one wrong thing on Wikipedia Look, up until this moment. People shit on Wikipedia, but a good Wikipedia page, yes. well maintained, yeah. you know, is 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 a lovely thing. And then, yep, sometimes, like you say, people are just be dropping paragraphs. It you is know? amazing that it exists. Yeah, it is. And it's, it is an, better it's a, to it's have a good it resource as an imperfect right. resource. Right, 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 right. Yes, I mean it's really good for like I want to learn about. Elementary physics. It's less good for like, I need gossip from behind the scenes of my favorite movie or whatever. Yes. Right? Um, but uh, yes, Fight Club. Fight Club. 1999's Fight Club. Uh, David Fincher's, I want to say, fourth film. Uh, That's right. Correct. Um, wow, wow, that was impressive, David. You did that math in real time? I counted one, two, three, four. <laughs> wow. We're doing these out of order. <laughs> and uh, a... Moderate flop on release yep. and instant cult classic, mm -hmm. uh, generational cult classic. Would one of you agree? one of the big DVD generation movies. Part of the legend of 1999 as yes. an iconic year for film. A mm -hmm. defining power of DVD movie. Yeah, very much so. In, in every sense, in like DVD, DVD sales, looked like a little box. Right. The the DVD itself as an object. The using the medium of the DVD and the special features and everything, and then also just just immediate reclamation. Immediate cult reappraisal, right. basically the second this thing hits disc it, and and goes into profit, like basically oh, yeah. was a flop in theaters, and within a year of it being on DVD, has gone into profit. One of Anna's questions when we finished watching the movie, and I put it back in the DVD that I've had for twenty three years, the brown paper the, bag. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, why is this a brown paper bag? There's not a single image like that in the movie. Yeah, and she said, "Is it meant to contain soap? And if so." Why did they decide on this design? I believe that is exactly the idea. I think that's part of it. And I think the other part of it... Bespoke soap. I thought yes. it was supposed to look maybe like, you know, like pornography in the mail, brown paper bag. Like what's inside is... That makes some sense. Too hot yeah. to handle. Uh, now I'm trying to find where I read this quote and I'm embarrassed if it is from the Wikipedia. <laughs> but uh, I think their, their whole thought was, uh, knowing that he prepared this whole holistic thing for it, they were like, we wanted to make a package that spoke to the um, anti-consumerist message of the movie. So to make the movie too, look sure. as sort of nondescript as possible. And it's just like, here's the plainest packaging. Like, it's almost their version of the Repo Man labels, right? Where they're like, this is like just like garbage. It's like brown paper with a string around it and just says the movie on it. This movie also had like iconically, quote unquote, bad marketing yes yeah you know sort of a famous example of like they don't know what to do they're putting soap all over the posters like they're confused mischief mayhem soap mischief mayhem great soap. tagline julie markell 20th century fox's senior vice president of creative development said the dvd packaging complemented fincher's vision the film is meant to make you question the package by extension tries to reflect an experience that you must experience for yourself what the fuck does that mean the more you look at it the more you'll get it i don't know what the fuck that means what are some other DVDs in the running for most iconic DVDs of this time. Well, I would say 1999 has has Fight Club and The Matrix. Yeah, which but The are Matrix two... DVD is a snap case. Like, it was a snap. A big, oh, you're yeah. saying the look? A exactly. huge okay. DVD, I'm just but that's to think of, not like, like DVDs that had things on. In no, them. no, like that, The Matrix was obviously, I think, the first million selling DVD. Right. But like, it was not a beautiful object. Like, no, this was like a DVD that you had to own. It yeah. was the law. Here's the better quote. I'm sorry. We want the package to be simple on the outside so that there would be a dichotomy between the simplicity of brown paper wrapping and the intensity and chaos of what's inside. That's, sure. I think, I the mean, idea. That's fine. 
Uh, yeah. Griff, come on, answer his question. This well, is, I feel like it's a real Griff, a what, real Griff yes, question. No, what I'm looking through right the now. The other ones were like the Boogie Nights Magnolia kind of two fur the way this and the see, seven the two fur. The reason I have to tap out of this is I grew up in Britain. Different packages. And the packages are different. And usually, yeah. honestly, God, like God bless the United Kingdom, bad. but they're usually worse. I feel like they do not yeah. have a good history of like a beautiful package. We Britain lacks the snap case cardboard that never existed. It was always the plastic case. Hmm, interesting. Um, but then obviously also you have to have your... What was your, it like when you first saw a snap case? Um, and what was hmm. your first snap? <laughs> it would have to be... LA Confidential, I think, was my first snap case. A Warner case. or a New Line movie. It was yeah. the only and, snap. And, was it platinum, uh, a platinum series? Uh, I can't remember. I watched that you movie like, so how do many I open times. This? <laughs> 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 Took a hammer to it. <laughs> I watched. I just lit it on fire. Yeah, it was like I was driving <laughs> on the other side of the road. Just like, I watched like Confidential so many times on DVD. I actually broke the DVD, which I didn't know was possible. I'm trying to find this article. There was an Entertainment Weekly article in 2001 that was the 50 essential DVDs, and it was when DVD was taking over. It was the cover story. And it was basically, here are the 50 DVDs everyone should own. You and are Fight not Club, going to find that ever. I have, because Googling 50 essential DVDs no, no, really gets you so much weekly. swill. Their, their fucking formatting is so bad that yes, it's like it split is. across multiple pages. But they put their Fight Club at number one. Makes Good. sense. I remember uh, Criterion Rushmore being way up there, which I think was another I found big it. one. You found the full list? Uh, well, um, it's... Like you say, uh, Boogie Nights is number two. Yes. Uh, their site is so broken. This is the thing, God, the formatting this is so broken. sad. Yes. That like you actually can't see the rest. But some of their inclusions were just good movies that are now on yeah, DVD. Yeah, it's like, okay, I'm seeing like Casablanca, right. Three Kings. The Conversation Disc, which has right, like we gotta no drop good this. special. We got to drop this. Excuse me, we're going deeper into this. Are you, well, I have to ask while you're, you know, you're doing yep. Fincher. Right. Are you? Are, is anyone letting you guys be frank? Are you going to be frank during this miniseries? We haven't recorded that one yet. You are. You're going to be frank. We are. What? Yes. What? We're going to be frankly. I don't understand. I That's bet you genuine. thought I'd never talk but about. We're not this movie. doing that. You're not. We're not doing House of Cards. We're doing The Voice. Oh well, okay. I don't think of being frank <laughs> as. <laughs> I think he's referring to House of Cards. No, he is. Oh, okay. But I'm saying. Or, yeah. Or, or, or just being frank. Perhaps someone will have an opinion on these movies that you never invited into the studio. <laughs> sure. So you're not doing House you of Cards. You said it was illegal for me to be on podcast. Well, I can do House of Cards for you right now. That show's dog shit. All you, right. You, you don't uh, like the first There was a little mini episode. We yeah. just did it. You know, I'll, like, I'll do House of Cards for you. Credits. I'll do House of Cards for you quickly. Well, well, well. <laughs> I bet you thought I'd never be on mic again. You don't like the first two Fincher episodes. Uh, no, I think House of Cards stinks. It stinks. Uh, like the, the Fincher episodes, are, you, that's probably the worst shit he's ever done. I mean, they, it looks fine. I never watched it. I'm, I'm a much bigger it, fan of the short Kevin form Spacey content. It's Kevin Spacey delivering monologues to you in that fucking accent. Right, which yeah. he's well, done really well three times <laughs> on YouTube on Christmas Day. Yeah. That's the best version of it. Cut the fat. <sighs> We've said this before, right, Alex, that you had this thought of like, I should make every actor audition. Yeah, with, with, let me be frank. Right. And you're well. just like, if they can deliver this, then they can do anything. That's the only thing to test. They don't need to read pages from my actual script. I'm really compelled by Kevin Spacey's ongoing trial and all these character witnesses that are just coming in and saying like, he's a really good guy. Normal. Let's drop that. Let's drop the DVD okay, thing. Let's talk about Fight Club. When did you first see it, Alex? Not permitted to be frank, apparently. Apparently. Uh, opening yeah. night, like October, whatever, 15th? Uh, October 15th, we'll right? Run amok. You're not even allowed to be frank anymore. I mean, literally, yes. <laughs> like, what do you think? Yes. Don't woke talk culture, about frank. Woke culture has like made it difficult for Kevin Spacey to participate in polite society because of the crimes he's accused of. You're almost making it sound like it's illegal <laughs> to be frank. Like, if like, you were frank, you'd currently funny. be on trial. It's funny to do, like, a joke version of, like, oh, I can't even, like, eat an M&M anymore without the woke police. It's like, wow, I can't even talk about Kevin Spacey without there being some sort of woke discussion. Apparently, I'm not even crimes. allowed to be Kevin Spacey without people getting upset. You laugh, wow. David. Can you bring him up and impersonate him saying various things you without laugh, people David. having a problem with that? Yes. But, you know... Schrader would agree. He would say, I can't simply tell producers of a film that this movie would only work with Kevin in the lead role right. without yeah. someone telling me I can't and cast Kevin And that is why Spacey it is literally in, in contracts that he has to log off Facebook when his movies Well, come well, out. well. Entertainment <laughs> Weekly says Matrix is the fifth best DVD of all time in a snapper case. <laughs> Not to quote something of my own, but in the doc 
documentary I made about Schrader where he says, you know, this script is just a fastball coming right down the plate and Kevin's just there ready to hit it. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I have thought of that quote. And I also think about that thing where Ridley Scott cut him out of all the money in the yeah. world. And they were like, was he good in the movie? Though? And Ridley Scott's like, yeah, he's great. But, you know, just I wanted to put my fucking movie out. Yeah. Like, so he's got to go. Like. I just, I, just, I just imagine uh, Kevin Spacey standing at an actual uh, yeah. home plate. Kevin at the plate. <laughs> Kevin at the plate. <laughs> I like swear to God. Baseball, like We're a probably going to cut all fitting. this out, right? Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think so. You know what's one of my favorite parts of that Ridley Scott press tour? Uh, for all the money in the world. It was around then when someone was like... One of his worst like, films. Yeah. Um, it's not that bad. It was like around the time that like he was reshooting that or Lord Miller got fired and people mm-hmm. were just like, so what do you think of like young directors running amok? Right. Do you remember this? I feel no. like this is one of the most underrated I mean, Ridley I, quotes. I think that anytime Ridley Scott gives an interview, this you're going to get at ones. least I one swear, nice slab of you know, juicy nearly, ham. Yes, nearly verbatim. Uh-huh. Where he's like, well, look, you hire someone who has experience. You know what you're getting. So like when you pay me my fee, which is considerable. <laughs> yes, I remember yeah. that. Yes, I do remember that's, that. that. Which is considerable. That right. is what I always think of is yeah. him just saying like, look, I'm not going to lie. I need a lot of money. Yeah. But what you're getting is someone who's going to get in and get out and not give you any trouble. I just feel like he had that thing about the accents in Last Duel where he was like, shut the fuck up. Stop worrying about it. That I appreciate. Like that's been going around a lot. He's just got so many good quotes. You're not really cutting out the House of Cards talk. This is Fincher or Jason. Cut, we're going to cut some of it. It's Fincher, it it's, it. it's Fincher or Jason. Nope. I saw Fight Club opening night. I also saw it again Saturday night. You saw it two different nights in people, a row. Yeah. Was that the plan? No. Or after you saw it, you oh, were it was, just like, it I got to beca- go right back. It became back. the plan by the end of the movie. When, where where did you see it? At the AMC Marple 10. Wow. Uh, a big multiplex in Marple Newton, Pennsylvania. Newtown, Pennsylvania. Griffin. Near a circuit city in a big parking lot. You would have been, nay, 10 years old? Correct. When Fight Club came out? I did not see this movie I can't imagine you saw it in that No, I think, uh, the, like, the following spring or summer. Okay. Uh, would have friend been out on DVD by Boys that point. sleepover party. Boys having a sleepover? Mm-hmm. And they watched Fight Club? I think it was not even uh, Kidding me. DVD. My memory is that it was perhaps VHS. Hey, man. His mom rented a couple R-rated movies. He was uh, one of the kids whose parents let him watch R-rated movies. And they put Fight Club on, and I was pretty into it. Uh-huh. And everyone was just going, like, when do we see tits? When do we see tits and blood? And it's like, no, this movie's kind of more about, like, sort of how, like, Gen X guys feel like they don't have any balls. <laughs> like, you, it's like yep. a bunch of 13-year-olds. You got to the <laughs> the weird bullet time sex sequence. Sure. Where everyone started, like, pausing and trying to, like... Right, like, like right, discern. Frame nudity. by frame it. Uh-huh. And then pretty shortly after that, they were like, let's watch something else. And then we probably oh, wow. flipped to... You didn't I, even finish Fight Club. Who knows what. Uh, 2000, maybe we, we put on How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Well, wait, was there another R-rated movie? Did maybe someone find out yeah, I'm who, what someone did last summer, perhaps? Right, or like something about Mary. Or, I'm guessing yeah. we went to a comedy. Sure. Right, but I remember one other person at the party being like, that was kind of good, right? Yeah, I was kind of digging right. the... So then I rented it after that. I somehow talked to my parents and let me rent it, or I saw it on cable or whatever it was. I saw it shortly after that. FX used to have a thing, getting back to the important subject, Called DVD on TV. I remember. I, remember this. Yes. I think this was Where maybe they would the like first way. Give you some special features. They put the special yes. features in the broadcast. I remember that. Yeah. So no commercial breaks, but they sort of take the uncensored version of the film where the commercial breaks would be. But imagine being that person. It's like, hey, did you buy that on DVD? <laughs> I'm waiting for FX DVD on TV. I watch DVD on TV. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to put a thing into another thing. You the experience this these is how the big features. companies trick you. They make you think you got to buy the DVD. They put the DVDs on TV for free. <laughs> Ben, did you see Fight Club in theaters? No. No. You well, also would have been I was, a little young. Yeah. Now, were you too busy fight Aren't clubbing? Are we the same age, Ben? <laughs> no, I think... I'm 38. Yeah, yeah, I think you're two years older than Ben. I turned 39 last week, so I was... Happy birthday. If we'd record this earlier, I would be 38. Okay. Yeah. How are you too we young? We fucked it Perfect up. age for a guy like you to want to join Project yeah. Mayhem. I suppose that's true. Did you want to... been like 14. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just like you can't automatically sneak into an R-rated movie when you're 14. I mean, I did. Yeah, he did. but like, but it was like, back then. I feel like it probably was a little more like, all right, we gotta. Well, this was still we got a plan the, the to post, sneak in, the right? Post Columbine yeah. crackdown on R-rated movies, where ah, theaters were encouraged yeah. to be very, very hard right. on. We can't let the kids watch movies that would make them go bad. Most of '99, it was really like theaters would ask to see an ID. My my big movie. thing was I had a a Visa Bucks card. 
which mm. was the credit card made for children, basically. That uh-huh. was like a debit card. That, sure, your parents could put a little money like on it. Like a hundred dollars a month or whatever. Or whatever. Yes. Right. And once they started putting the ticket machines in theaters, rather than having to go to the yes. ticket taker, I could, as a young person with a hundred dollars a month to spend, go to the machine, buy a ticket, and they'd be like, you're 18? And I'd be like, absolutely. You know, 14, I look like I'm nine. Right. And they'd be like, and they ID'd you? And I went, yep, they ID'd uh, me when I sort bought of, the ticket. You could act like, I already talked to that guy. That right. guy already cleared yeah. me. Yeah, that I, was my move for years. Lisa Ben, so you saw it. Did you see it on the porch? Um, For sure. I've yeah. watched this movie hundreds I, of times. I mean, I, I have no doubt you've seen Fight Club many, many times. I, I right? will say uh, the way that I was able to get my hands on the DVD is me and my friends shoplifted. Oh, wow. Well, just like steal this well, movie. This know? movie well. is so pivotal to me. This is like me taking acid for the first time. Like mm. this is my introduction to what it's like to be a misanthrope adult. This is your brain. Right. This is your brain on Fight Club. Yes, yeah. absolutely. A hundred percent. Right. I'm not surprised to hear this. This is like around the time of me like starting to take drugs and reading Bukowski and the Fight Club is somewhere right in there. Yeah. A lot of, you know, like you, you're you you're a millennial, but you the Gen X, you know, uh, disconnected, like fuck, you know, fuck consumer capitalism, fuck the man yeah. mindset is, is very appealing to you. Absolutely. Did you want to fight? Did oh, you, yeah, sure. Did, did, did that make you specifically want appeal? To, to yeah, maybe have always, a fight club? Right. You've always uh, struck me as a, a kind of perpetual uh, uh, hellion mm. near do well. Just like mm. saying, me, I'm a lover, not a fighter, right. some might say. I don't get big fight energy from you as much. Yeah, my friends and I did not start a fight club right. after watching this Good. movie. Because even when the most mad I've ever seen you get, you kind of just like stomp around. <laughs> Yeah, and I yell. Yeah. And I punch You're, things. You punch things. So I will say I, I was kind of more the type of beat yourself up. You were doing the Edward Norton in the office. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did yeah. you Such was, a fucking idiot? Was right. the mayhem appealing? Did you want to do the sort of public art destruction and Absolutely. Art arson? Like hundred percent. That seems more interesting to you and me also than fighting. Yes. I, I right away was like, I should commit vandalism. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, did you get went really on into, to uh, get into graffiti? Of course. What was your t- what was uh, your tag? I'm not gonna say. Okay. Well, he won't is say it. it. Still, this has come up before. It's come up before. It still stands in some places. It, well, I think so. Okay. I'm sure it does. Banksy. Um, um, ben. Uh, what was the thing I was going to say? Did you get into soap? Soap making. No. Fat no. rendering. No. Okay. I did not see this in theaters, mm-hmm. for it was rated 18 mm. in the United mm. Kingdom. Illegal. Can't sneak into an 18. I could sneak into a 15. So you're 12. I'm 13. 13. I'm 13. Oh. And I snuck into the Matrix, which was rated 15. Yeah. But I did not sneak into Saw Fight that Club. Saw that at the Marple Newton yeah. theater as well. You entered the Matrix. So that, that, was, that was the theater for 99. Three Kings there as well. Three Kings. Saw, hey. every, saw everything there. Three Kings. I believe number 47 on Entertainment Weekly's 50 Best DVDs. Yeah. Using me, yes. I owned it. Wait, can I just give a DVD tangent of this era after yeah. after David finishes his story? Uh, I don't but, have a story. I don't remember when I first saw this movie. It was on video. video. Yes. Yeah. Like probably the year after. Um, do you guys remember the website real.com? Of course. R-E-E, yes. Which was yes. the DVD selling website? Yes. Do you remember, this was like 99, 2000, their daily trivia question Hmm. where if you got it right, you got either a quarter or 50 cents of credit. Wow. And you played every day. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it would just be like a multiple choice trivia question. Okay. And it wasn't one winner. It was anyone who got it right. Anyone who got it right. I think it was a quarter. Would get a quarter. Okay. Of credit for for real.com. Yeah. And I, in in a very Ben prankster way, I had... Set up a second email address. Sure. So that on one, I got it right. Which every- was harder to do back then. You yes. couldn't just set up no. an email address for free easily. No, no there's no Gmail. It, yes. it required like a little bit. I think I just used my dad's email address yes, or sure. something. And so I would play it on mine, mm-hmm. get it right some of the time, mm-hmm. then go to the other account, get it right every single day because now I knew the answer. Sure. And then like every, you know, two months, I had enough money to buy like a fourteen ninety nine Snapcase DVD. Yeah. And that was how I got Three Kings. That's Snap. Just, I, I can Snap like it. a hot dog. Right. Because every other company was like some variation on plastic, like yeah, deep case. A, a, a clamshell of right. sorts. And yes. then Warner Brothers and New Line were just like, what if it's 90% cardboard? Right. What if, if, you le- if you left it out in the rain once yes. ruined. <laughs> it's also like it would bend and fold. Yes. I'm just looking here at this cover story. I remember most of these not even being on the list. 
The images they have for the DVD cover are Aaron Brockovich, The X-Files, Gladiator, Silence of the Lambs, I think the Criterion version. Gladiator was a big one. That was one yeah, of the first great. movies that, was that came one. out concurrently on DVD and video. Yes, and I think it was a two-disker. Sixth Sense, which I assume would have been the Vista version edition. Toy Story, which they had the Ultimate Toy Box box set. Wizard of Oz, Saving Private Ryan. And then the it, it's You've Got the Player. Now here's our guide to the essential yeah. disc. The only other thing on the cover is the banner on top is a picture of Eminem. And it says, will Grammy reward Eminem's hate rhymes? Ah, Thoughts on that, David? Let, them, let him be frank. Yeah, Eminem does want to be. Let him be Marshall. <laughs> Sorry, I think I'm. The, I think the Gladiator thing isn't that it came out at the same time because that was like 2000. I think it was that Gladiator and X Men came out the same day. I could see that. And that was like I, I, I remember the Gladiator for DVDs. Yeah. I remember the Gladiator DVD being very heavy on special features, yes. and the whole story with that movie, of course, was like they, they recreated Rome as it as it stood. Yeah, that was three thousand years ago. I was that was like Black Friday when I was working at Suncoast Video at the mall when those two yeah. DVDs came out, and I had to wear like a Gladiator button and an X-Men button. And people would come up and they would hit you on the chest for which, which movie one, they yes. wanted. Right. And then I yeah, whipped one from behind. Yeah. Right. I, I remember having to buy or, or wanting plays. to buy mm -hmm. the X-Men DVD at Blockbuster because they had a promotion where, where if you bought it there exclusively, it came with a mini CD-ROM <sighs> that had additional special features that weren't on the disc. But one of those horribly sized CD-ROM. Yeah, the, the, the tiny GameCube size That would sometimes ones. get lodged inside and fuck up your machine. They sure would. You, yes. need, you really needed a tray that had yes. the little divot that you could put it inside. I almost remember it being like, uh, like rectangle-shaped. Trust if you fear the rest. It wasn't rectangle-shaped. You was found circular. this? You found the mini? Uh, no, I mean, no. no. But th those mini discs were, were circular. They had to be. My friend, they did not have to. I remember getting some oddly shaped ones that would fuck you up. That was the whole point. They'd be like, this has to, you can only play it in certain types of players because otherwise the shape will mess it up. No, but it's the whole, the I'm going to find Disc trays the had this thing, yes. this yes. divot in the middle that was I'm circular. Old. Yes. Well, you could spin a rectangle. It in was there. smaller <laughs> than that space, but oddly shaped. I guarantee I, I, you, I'm, I'm going to find David this. on this. I don't think Griffin. I don't. I don't think the, the the technology exists I for that I'm because find the this. laser wouldn't wouldn't be able to. It I'm going to find sense. this. Let's keep talking about Fight Club. I'm going to find this. Uh -huh. so I'm the only one who saw this on initial release. This makes me feel like I'm 10 years older than you guys. But it's, of it's one. just a very slim, you know, like if I was just a couple years older, it probably would have. Yeah. It was rated 18. Sure. Well, let me It was say that this. sort of thing. Like the movie is violent and obviously has sex, but I think it was truly like rated 18 for like, this is too anarchic and grown up, right? Like just fundamentally. Like, mm -hmm. well, if I can be frank, I will say that, like, <laughs> whatever I was, 14, maybe 15, great age to see this movie in the theater twice opening weekend. Uh, yeah. Changed no, everything. I mean, really let me know what the world was about. I mean, look, I like Fight Club. I'm happy to talk about it today, but it, it just was not this movie for me. I feel like it wasn't for you either, Griff. No. I know it was fundamentally for many people yes. of our generation. Was that because you came to it? six months or a year later because no. you just didn't have the thoughts that lined up with this movie. Yes. I just did not have that masculine. You weren't mad at no. the fucking world? No. No. The, the oh, Matrix you happy? is... Yeah, I was so happy. No, The Matrix is my 1999 The World Doesn't Make Sense movie more than Fight Club. Okay. Right? I mean, sure. and if you think about me now... Sure. That's sort of where I fall to this day. Totally. That you are wearing, we should say, all leather with a floor length jacket. Right. And the propeller heads are playing from yeah. a speaker on my shoulder. Whereas okay. Ben is shirtless listening to the Dust Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Good score. I'm sending. We're, we'll talk about the music. Griffin is about to send an oblong eBay DVD or whatever. Well, now, I don't have anything um, in front I, of me. So I, I, I was right and wrong. The X Men CD ROM I was remembering was, in fact, was a little text. three inch round. Yes. CD ROM. Yes, it's a mini. This is a mini CD. But I'm going to send you as a supplement that I was not fundamentally wrong that sometimes they were oddly shaped. Let me see. Uh, what this eBay listing refers to as Animal House odd shaped CD. Look at this little guy. Look at this funny little disc. Look at this funny little disc. Animal House odd shape. Now, well, okay, now what's happened here? Yeah. I tried it. He's so David sick. David is still right. <laughs> it's though. basically, I am he was right. right about the X Men one. No, I'm no, right no. in general. This is a what? circular DVD that this, has, has. This reaches yeah. the edges of the tray. You, yes. I'm going to keep finding this. So, what You're this not is, going to find if it. you this zoom in on this, you can see that the amount of space on the yes. disc is less than the wonky shape. Correct. So, this they, still they have, fits in your tray. They have created a mini. I mean, it looks. So stupid. It basically it looks, looks so like dumb. someone took two bites. Oh no, I'm out looking. Of, at oh, you're it. looking. Yeah. Okay. Out of a out of a regular size disc. Uh it is so silly. Look, 
we love DVDs. We love them. And as we pointed out, Anna and I, when we watched this, when he flaps his arms and says, whoa, in front of the car, that was in like every Fox Power of DVD pre-roll. Right. That shot is in every like welcome to DVD. Um, and that's why it's important. Fight Club. Uh, another that's, that's, question. That's the reason the movie's important because of its role in the Fox Power of DVD pre-roll. I, look, I, we, I cannot deny this film's importance in DVD culture. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. like yeah, that is certainly a, a bedrock of its, you know, Don't deny uh, it. legacy. I won't deny it. Ben, what's up, Griff? Our sponsor for this week's episode is Chex Notes. No sponsor? That's right. It's the ultimate bid. Usually, society plays the bid on us trying to sell us stuff shove it down our throats. You need to improve yourself. You gotta buy stuff. You are what you own. Get better clothes. Get better furniture. Get a friggin' mattress. Buy a bunch of action figures. Society is constantly telling all of us to buy action figures all the time. Like the Fight Club action figures I bought and recently put in our shelf in the studio. The point is, Ben, we said let's get meta with it. No ads this episode. That's right. This is our anti-establishment stance it's for this bit, one episode. It's a bit that costs us money. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, sure, I did uh, plan uh, when we set this in motion to come up with a bunch of fake ads. And I ran out of time. Because that's what society wants you to do. They want you to work for free. They want you to come up with fake ads, sell fake products. To mock companies that pay us your money. Little catalogs, but we're sticking it to those sponsors for one week and one week only. Next week, we'll work on them back warmly. <laughs> Thank you for supporting our podcast. But this week, you can't sell anything to us. Yeah, man. We, we haven't sold out at all. At all. For this one week. For this one For this week. one week, we pointedly didn't sell out. Because usually we go, oh, good, we sold out this episode. All three ad slots filled. This week we said no ads. We x them. We x them out. We went, Ugh. And I think it's really brave of us. I think it's really brave. I think this is the year we should finally win a streamy. And OB is the one I've been really angling for for a while. A streamy? A streamy. I'm not familiar. Isn't I, it like the Internet Awards? Isn't I think it called? you're thinking of Webby. Oh, yeah. I think the streamy is something as well, maybe. Maybe. But let's get, let's get them all. All right, yeah. This is the year, though, for us to actually just get an honorable mention for yes. bravery. And a Nobel Peace Prize. Absolutely, and a Pulitzer. Yes. In the war against advertisement. Yep. Yeah, and once again, next week, our sponsors are back, and we love them. <laughs> we love every single one of but them. But this week, you can't sell us shit, 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 shit. Have any of you read the book? Oh, yeah. That's my other question. Oh, I assume DVD. And I assume, right. Did you read it after? I read it after. Right. Yep, yep, me too. But me then too. I became a real, like, diehard Polonick. I was definitely reader. with Polonick for a couple of years as well. I was looking at his bibliography. He's trying actually to written out a lot of where fucking I, well, books. Well, for a while, he was like one a year. Yeah. He's one of those guys. He's not unlike a Kevin Smith where it's just like he has his fan base. Yeah. He will pack a bookstore once a year with right. the same people. You will sell the same number of books. You can't go broke and you'll never get rich. But like, there's just that fan base there. Yeah, yeah. I, I was with him for a while. Teach, they're not going to teach him in literature classes. Do you know what I mean? He's like a little bit. Well, now they Ben. Well, well, Ben. Well, well, I read this book in college what? as part of my post-American, to post-war American literature class. It was the last book we studied. And wow. this guy was like, this is a totemic work of like, you I want to point of out ben is, ben is punching the wall right now. He is. He's, he's so, so mad. mad. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> I read the book. Uh, I read it in college. When, yeah. This book and American Psycho were like the first two books I ever read in my life for fun after I was a child. Like there was a, there was like a <laughs> nine year. Funny if you think, like, <laughs> there's like a nine year gap where I didn't read a book. Uh, why not? Because reading was lame. I was a kid. I had video games to play and like fires to start. But reading's great. I'm hooked on phonics. Well, right, but I've also heard that reading is fundamental. When reading became <laughs> homework, you don't want to do it. Is that a poster? It. Yeah. As well. You don't remember that one? I get it's Britain, man. I was probably told that reading was like a big cup of tea or whatever they were telling me <laughs> over there. <laughs> whatever their fucking propaganda campaign was. I mean, to be clear, I loved reading. But you, okay, when did well, you drop reading? reading? Like, like age when it 10? became homework. 
Yeah. All right, Griffin's sending another. God, let's when see what this one homework. is. Uh, look. <laughs> It seems to be a square. <laughs> it is a yeah, fucking that's cool. rectangle I remember these. business card, blank CD that is no longer available right. for sale, but was sold in packs of 100 from B&A. <laughs> Do the they still sell them? And can the blank check business cards be on these? Yep, I found another link. We could uh, <laughs> order them from... Uh, this is, okay, Band It says CDs. no longer available. Sure, yeah, Band yeah, yeah. CDs.co.uk. We are currently having issues sourcing stock of the business card CDs, so unfortunately we will not be able to deliver any new orders. I'm trying to see if anyone's still printing them. Imagine the joy of slapping one of those in someone's palm <laughs> and saying, like, go home and... Feel that weight, buddy. Go home and pop it and don't scratch it. Don't put it in your pocket. <laughs> no. Yeah, you better not let anything touch any other metal objects. Um, Do you like the book, David? Uh, I, I, and did you I, read I, other Palinic? I think I read Survivor, which that's that's like the airplane the, uh, the, the airplane mm-hmm. cult one. I read Choke. Mm-hmm. That may be it. But I remember the Diary after, and Haunted being kind of big books. What's the one after Choke with like a bird on the cover? Lullaby. I think that was the last one I read. Lullaby. I always loved cool. the detail in that where the character is building his own monument to himself. He's like stacking rocks up in like his like backyard. I always just found that to be intriguing. That, that sounds good. I mean, I remember Choke, and then, then that was a movie. Did someone make a diary movie? I think. No. Or maybe someone wanted just Choke. to. Choke was, was Clark Gregg made it. Correct. Right? He's yeah. one of those, like, yeah, like one of those writers that just, he either was I going just, to have like a Grisham-esque run of everything becomes a movie or nothing right. does because it's all just like. Or even like Dennis Lehane. I, yeah, or whatever. it's just too weird, right. too esoteric. Like, I just feel like there was like, it used to be every year his new book, whether or not it got good reviews, yeah, we'd you'd get see up. posters, you'd sure. see, you know, it would be at the front of the, you know, fucking borders, yeah. right? You know, like, and then around 2008, 2009, it's sort of like, you forget about him, he, you know, whatever, but he's still just making a book in a the year. store and yeah. you see his shelf and you're like, right. wow, he has like nine new it books. Sucks. Yeah, no, those are the only two that were made in the films. I did read, I didn't read the book. I read Fight Club 2. Oh, you read which the was uh, graphic his comic novel. sequel, and I didn't realize there was also a Fight Club three, a uh, recent-ish Fight Club three. Um, yes, but most of Fight Club two is about Tyler Durden, sort of trapped inside the narrator's brain. And it was drawn by David Mack, right? Looks looks cool. Oh, the yes. covers, are the right. covers are David yeah. Mack. Cameron Stewart did the art. Fair enough. Yeah, um, I like the book. Yeah, uh, you know, it's you know, I am Jack's blah, or you know, you know, I am John's bile. I am John. You know, it's all that. Mm-hmm. Remember that? Yeah. I haven't read it since 2000. This would be 2006. Yeah, no, I read it like exactly at the when time. I, the movie, you know, I got the movie tie-in edition. Um, it felt like, you know, it felt like a lot of these, these like the, you know, uh, Bukowski or whatever, where I'm like, there's a point of view here. It's, it's this, you know, starkly written thing. I sort of admire it, but I never was like, this guy's talking to me. If that oh, makes sense. I was like, right, right. I was like, he's going there. Right. right he's right, saying right. shit that I think that no one is saying. Mm. Now, how do you feel about Fight Club now? I immediately was radicalized. <laughs> what, again? Watched, again? I, I'm trying to say you watch it now and you are kind of like, I mean, the points I, were I, made. Like, I've written down here, life is bullshit and meaningless. <laughs> sure. It's right there on the top of Ben's yellow legal pad. I will say... We are now the age of the characters in Fight Club. Yeah, which sucks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> almost older, maybe? I mean, at least... Possibly I, I older. Think, yeah, yeah, they're probably I early am, 30s. Yeah, right. It's Yeah, they still seem older than me. Um, I just I, watching oh, it. Oh, sure. Well, they're like uh, adults. Um, I, uh, is Ben Tyler Durden in the series artwork or do we not know yet we don't, we know, don't, yet. We don't know yet I just kind of feel like that's right there that's probably that, what that, happened that, I mean, put him that's in a, a fastball shirt, coming right down sure. the plate right. and Ben's just standing there right. ready to hit it I imagine that I'm uh, seven but I look a lot older Benjamin Button I have to imagine <laughs> that's where I'll end up I mean that's there for you specifically that version <laughs> And David is probably, I don't know, the girl with the dragon tattoo. Hey, fuck. Yeah. You know, go off. That sounds yeah. good. Um, uh, wait, what was the thing I was going to say? Oh, Ben and I were specifically uh, yesterday, mm. uh, after we recorded David and you uh, rushed off, Ben and I were talking about our, our shared insomnia and how bad it's been recently. And then I put this movie on and forgot how much that's a part of it. And it, well, and it just book, immediately so. Right. Like, it's about having insomnia. Way too hard. Mm. Way too hard. Yeah, mm. yeah, I'm going a little crazy. We're, I, we're both not sleeping well. Unfortunately, woke up today at um, five in the morning. Well, yeah. I have fun news for you guys. I'm also sleeping very poorly. Yeah, 
because of stress. Yeah, well, there's that, and also and my, I fell asleep at ten fifteen last night watching Secret Invasion by myself. Well, Secret Invasion, of course, is prescribed this right. year by all doctors. It's more effective for than quick and melatonin. Deep sleep. Yeah, yeah, yes, I exactly. crawled into bed and was yeah. knocked out by ten thirty. I mean, the thing about Secret Invasion is. The episode says it's 50 minutes long. It's actually four minutes long. That's After true. that, it's a black screen. No one actually makes it that far. My problem is my my sleep issue yeah, is stress and whatever, all the all the usual stuff. But also my roommate keeps on fucking bringing Helen Bottom Carter back and having the world's loudest sex with her. And I don't even remember having a roommate. Mm. Who is the who who's the Tyler Durden of the dynamic here? Of our group? Yeah. Ben. Ben is like the potentially fictitious figure who has spawned from your inner well, your inner the one thoughts. who like we wouldn't be doing this if not for ben it's okay. a little suspicious that suddenly what if it's just the two of you if it's just the two of us yeah i think ben i'm is, ben I'm, is meatloaf now who is i'm the david Tyler. Tyler Dirt, no question yeah Griffin's because Tyler right he's yes. the sort of more you know chaotic yeah. sort of Agent yeah chaos. encourage to do bad things yes okay i'm sleepy yeah. terrible. but you sleep well sometimes when yeah um, this I mean, I wake up early. This movie changed everything for young guys, and Pollen it kind of with it. Uh, well, it's also sure. it's it's uh, crystallizing a thing. This movie has the thesis. That, see, here's my thing with Fight Club. Uh, I like this movie. I feel like this is a movie that's reputation is constantly being damaged by the world's most annoying people liking sure. it for the wrong From reasons. From the beginning of its... As with a lot of films, right? And a lot of the most sort of popular, quote-unquote, cult films, as much as that's a thing anymore, Right. Uh, rewatching it, I was like, right, this is so much better than I have remembered it being because of the annoying people, you know? Yeah. Like, the actual act of watching this, I, I really kind of uh, loved. I do find, like, the expression of what this movie is sort of getting at, for me, reaches its peak form in Jackass. Another very, great, in great very instruction manual for right. hurting yourself and, and, and breaking things. And, and not just the fighting part of it, but it's the same thing of like, it's like, this is a generation of men who have no outlet, who have been made like irrelevant, right? There's like some weird animalistic urge that like it no longer has a place. The big, I mean, of course, there's the crossover of Brad Pitt being on Jackass. Yes. And one of the best Jackass moments. Well, yeah. Jackass, yes. I mean, that's that's a fair point. The sort right. of like, what what else can we do I mean, but Pitt damage in this our movie bodies for glee? And Knoxville are aesthetically very similar. They are. Yeah. He looks a lot. He has like a real early Knoxville look. But the, Jackass but is similar as that. That was another thing when I was in high school. Yes. Every, all, all the fucking boys would talk about it all the time. And I'd be like, can we talk about anything else? Was it called yeah. Jack yeah. Arse? Were you? <laughs> they, they would they they would call it that. Yes, they would. They would. Yes, it wasn't spelled that way, but yes, they couldn't help themselves. Really? Jack Ars. Yeah, of course. They would correct it. To yeah. Jack they Ars. fucking can't. They don't. They yeah. can't conceive of certain words. No, Jack Ars. If they said movie. ass, you could feel them having to shift their bodies into yes. being able to say it. Jack Ass. Like they would like have to like sort of stand up straight for a second. J Jack Ars is obviously Jack the Ars. less nihilistic the expression of there? the same instinct. You just spell Jack Ass. And people just say it. All right, finish your thought, Griff. No, I, I just think it, it's a uh, the Fincher. There was a Fincher quote. I don't know if it's in the dossier. You can crack the dossier open now. Here's a good transition point. Yeah, yeah. but there was there's, some there's quote. A, there's a lot in this movie that should be yeah. talked about. There's a quote I found that was basically like the problem is that like men are genetically like designed to be hunters, and we're in a society where there's nothing for them to hunt anymore. So you become like consumers, and there's like some pent up energy that has right. no outlet anymore. And as a teen boy, I felt. Thank God I don't have to hunt and gather. Same. I'd much rather I think sit here and I read my book. Yes. Are the same in that right, sense, where right. those are not the things that make me feel out of touch with society, right. is that I can't hunt. Right. Uh, and Jackass is like the more productive of expression of that same frustration mm -hmm. because it's like, oh, there's a genuine camaraderie found there. Not that I don't relate to the nihilism of this movie, but I feel like my nihilism uh, manifests in a very different way. Um, let me, I'll give you some dossier here. I think that's yep. a good call. Um, so, uh, Chuck Palnick, Palnick, I looked pa up Palnick, the pronunciation as Palnick, 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 uh, write, writes a book called Invisible Monsters that he cannot get published. Um, which I have you, uh, you know, yeah, I'm trying to remember it. what that one's about. It's like about a disfigured that's the, model, I think. Yeah, that's okay. Yes, it was seen like, as too disturbing. She like, you know, feels invisible now that she's not beautiful or something. And it's sort of. Hey, man. Can I, can I read this exact Something quote like just because I found it? It's from Film Comment. He said, we're designed to be hunters and we're in a society of shopping. There's nothing to kill anymore. There's nothing to fight, nothing to overcome, nothing to explore. And that societal emasculation, this everyman, the narrator, is created. Which is the whole thing with this movie. Is it's, this Fincher or Paladin? That's Fincher. 
right. the like 1999 society is collapsing. Nothing matters. What are you reading that Gen from? X. It's a film comment interview. In how'd you find it? I found a hyperlink to Admit it. it. On what? On Wikipedia. Yes. But now I'm on the article itself. Inside Out David Finch that, by Gavin let, Smith. September, October 1999. Go on. Let me let me read from the dossier now. Yes. Chuck Palnock uh, decides, I'm never going to get published. I might as well write something for the fun of it. So Fight Club is written with no thought, really, of commercial success, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Uh, it Norton publishes it. It sells a little bit. 5,000 copies. And Joshua Donan... The son of Stanley Donan. Okay. Do you I know who wondering. Joshua Donan is? No. He had produced two films. The Underneath, Steven Soderbergh's film. Mm-hmm. Not a bad movie. Not but a great one. Yeah. Yes. And Sam Raimi's The Quick and the Dead. A great film. Uh, so he is Stanley Donan's uh, son who is whatever, trying to, you know, kind of make his way in Hollywood. Sure. Nepo, a Nepo baby. Classic. A uh, bit of a Nepo baby. Uh, loves the twist of the book. The iconic twist at the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sends a, he rec- re- basically records a reading of the novel, okay, and sends it to Laura Ziskin at Fox Two Thousand, which mm-hmm. is at the time. Does Searchlight exist in two thousand yes. in like nineteen ninety nine? But like it's sort yeah. of like in between Searchlight and regular Fox, right? It was sort of the concept of Fox Two Thousand. Yes. Right? right. Like it's kind of like we're going to do like mid to big ish. Fox 2000 existed until like five years ago. Very recently, it was one of That's the things true. that finally got shuttered I think their during last movie was the like Disney the, sale. The, Kate Winslet, Idris Elba, Mountain movie. That's uh, ma- the, the Mountain between. Excuse me, the Mountain between. I think that was the last Fox 2000 movie. The, I'm sorry, The Woman in the Window, which ended up being sold to Netflix. Right, they yeah. sold a lot of them off. Was right. the last one, uh, but it was basically shut down in 2019. Um, yeah. But at this point, Fox 2000 will do has done things like One Fine Day. They gave us One Fine Day. Mm-hmm. Uh, Volcano, The Coast was Toast. Mm. The Thin Red Line was a Fox 2000 film. Right? They're kind of all over the place. Never been kissed. This same year. You haven't? I'm working on it. David, reigning threes from um, all over court. No, their 1999 list is Ravenous, Never Been Kissed, Pushing Tin, Lake Placid, Broke Down Palace, Best Laid Plans, Fight Club, Light It Up, Anywhere But Here, Anna and the King. That's a bizarre collection that's of movies. That's just 2000? That's just Fox that's 2000. That's just 99. No, I'm saying that is all Fox Correct. 2000. That's, that's, a, that's a movie every five weeks for yeah, the year. basically. That's crazy. They were their main outlet, I mm. think. And yeah. then Fox was just like Phantom Menace and nothing else. Right, I guess. And then whatever family films they must yeah, have released that year. I mean, they probably felt like they had to clear the deck before the calendar turned and they looked yes. ridiculous come come the year 2000. They, they were like... We right. Ironically, only three films in the year 2000. But, but I mean, like, the thing you just read, the list yeah. of movies, it's exactly, that's exactly right. It's like, you know, you can't even really pinpoint, apart from that those movies, I guess, all were not blockbuster-sized or indie-sized. No that's about it. Right, that just Identity. used to be called movies. Yes. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, Laura Ziskin reads the book and it blows her mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she options it, the rights for $10,000 and it's just like, I don't know how you make a movie out of this, but I want to, you know, figure out if someone can. Um, uh, there's another guy called Raymond Bongiovanni okay. who uh, also uh, worked at Fox and died of a blood infection at 41 Jesus. and his his obituary claimed that bringing Fight Club to the screen was his dying wish. Okay. They throw it to a director named David O. Russell. <laughs> Which makes sense. Absolutely. I like that he's just done flirting with disaster. I can mm-hmm. absolutely see them thinking like, yeah, he, you know, he's got the twisted mind suitable, right? Sure. I mean, sure. No? At the time, yes. Right? I mean, I don't know. I can see it. I can, yeah. Who else was there, really? Uh, Well, uh, well, well, we can well, talk about well, it. Well, well, uh, well. David O. Russell says he did not understand the book. I read it. I didn't get it. I didn't do a good job reading it, obviously, is his uh, retrospective thought on the matter. Of course, he made Three Kings in 1999. Yep. So he's, you know, yeah, he's getting his big project yeah. as well. Um, They get the book over to Fincher. Mm-hmm. And say, you got to read it tonight. And Fincher's like, I'm not going to read a book in one night. And they're like, you know, you, you do. You're going to read it really fast. His his agent uh, reached out and said, you need to read this thing. And he went, yes. I barely read books. Right. And he went, I'm telling you, uh, one night. And he goes, right now, pitch me on the phone the reason I should read this book. Uh, and his uh-huh. agent says to him, there's a guy in it who pisses in soup and splices porn into family films. And there's a scene where he takes a guy out of a convenience store, holds him up at gunpoint, says what do you want to be doing? And he says, I want to be a vet, but the school was too hard. And he says, I, I, I know where you live. I'll come back in a year and shoot you. Or, or six weeks if you're not in classes. 
And Fincher was like, I'm sold. I'll fucking read the book. And what? Well, hang on. Fincher yeah. then said, does this guy with the gun, does he quote Forrest Gump? Does he like Forrest Gump? And the agent said, just read and find out. Just read and find out. I have a lot of thoughts about Tyler Durden's relationship with Forrest Gump. Okay. We'll go. We, we can, can get, get into, into that. that. But uh, basically, put a pin in that. he was like, I absolutely want to do this. Right. He, and then his he, agent's like, great news. Laura Ziskin and Fox just bought it. Right. And then he was like, well, now I'm fucked. Right. He's like, I will not work with Fox. Uh, he, his big comparison, which I do think is very interesting, is he's like, this is the graduate, right? Like, which right. I do love that he, that that's, he's like, it's about coming of age. Right. Except these days, you come of age in your 30s and you feel like disaffected in your 30s now, right? Like, it's like that kind of vibe. And, and beyond um, just that he had obviously had a terrible experience with Fox uh, doing Alien 3, I think sure. he also was just like, this was a thing I was hoping I could option, develop, and then bring to them as a package thing. If they're already trying to develop it internally, it's going to get fucked up. Well, let me um, ask a question about Fincher. Now, you guys, you, so you had, if you didn't even see this in theaters, you probably hadn't seen Seven when you first saw this. No, I have I've seen Seven. Yes. You I, have. On, on video. Yeah, so like that, but not enough that you were like, I want to see the new movie from the guy that made Seven. Probably not. I mean, this is probably around when I'm starting to care about directors yeah. and reading Empire Magazine. Because, and all like, that. at the this is something I felt now rewatching the movie mm -hmm. for the 102nd time in my life, but the first time in I don't know 15 years is like at the time. I think that Fincher made perfect sense as the guy who made this movie after Seven and the Game, which like I didn't know until like 2006 were in that order. Sure, I always was like it must go Seven and then Fight Club. Sure. And it wasn't, I was like, when I learned, I was like, wait, the game's in the middle. It blew my mind. Game fucking rules. It does rule. But then at the time it was like, this is a perfect Fincher thing. And now 20 years later with more, I'm like, I actually can't quite figure out if I think he is the perfect person for this movie, knowing what we know now or at the time, mm. because it does seem very strange considering the filmmaker he has become. And to hear him tell it like, there's some quote on Wikipedia, you know, maybe it's inaccurate, but he's like, ah, oh, this is too much locations, too much moving around for half. It's just like, this doesn't really seem like the path he followed. No. Because this is no. a very anarchic movie. Yes. And nobody would now be like, well, David Fincher, an anarchic filmmaker. Yeah, yeah. So quote, therefore, this now seems very strange to me in a way that I never thought His basically like, I felt like I kept on spending most of my days watching people load and unload stuff off of trucks in order to get three lines of dialogue. Yeah, I want to watch people load and unload stuff in a scene all day. With, with zero lines of dialogue. This is also, though, like to your point, this is the most overtly funny movie that he has made question. up until this point. I think you can make the argument that it's the, I'm mean, Gone Girl, I guess, qualifies now yeah. as that's com comedic ish, but like this is his only funny movie. Like Gone Girl has a black humor to it, but yeah, I this is a comedy. This is, I think Social yes. Network is also this funny. Is a satire. Social Network Go is funny. Social, Social Network, Network is. Funny, it's very it's funny in its yeah. way, yeah. Things, yeah, you know, and all that. But, I, but yes. I, I think this I know what movie you mean. I know what you mean. highlights his like more intense sense of humor more than your. It's easier to identify the comedy right. and things like even Seven and the Game now play funnier. Oh, of course, knowing his sense of it's humor. It's the Kubrick thing. It's like yes. it is, it's, this guy's funny, and there's humor in his movies. But like Social Network is funny because it's Sorkin and there's quirk to it. Gone yeah. Girl is funny because it's campy. Right. This movie is funny because it's a satire. Yes. yes and I don't think true. of Fincher as a satirical filmmaker, especially no, not really. in the decades. I mean, Social Network is not a satire. Uh, like, no, it's not. This no. is a satire. And yeah. that's a very specific kind of comedy. But weirdly, like the fucked upness of this in 99 was connected to his work in a way that I don't think it's connected at all anymore. I think a lot of it truly on a stupid like studio surface level thing was like, well, Seven was fucked up. And it's fucked up in a way that's entirely different from this movie. This guy loves drippy wet houses. Right. And I think they were just like, we need someone who's fucked up. We need something that's like intense. He was you the know? fucked up guy. Right. That was like, He's that was what we loved the fucked about up him. guy. Um, He's such a Gen X guy too. That's Yeah, that's why like true. a Gen X, you'd think a Gen X guy would just not be the guy to make a movie about the golden age of Hollywood because that's just not his thing. Yeah. Mm. But, but it goes back to just like in Maybe this moment, in club. Well, I think in 1999, mm -hmm. the studios Wait, were like, say? nothing, keep going. Coming off the whole like Rebels on the back lot, yeah. right? Um, uh, 90s indie revolution, those guys working their way into the studio system. You guys I, haven't covered any of those guys. This is kind of this the, is the first? Like of the big... Because Soderbergh has so many movies and Tarantino is so over-discussed and I'm trying to think right. who else we got. You David know, O. Russell's that. the greatest filmmaker of all time. Well, obviously David O. Russell. Him. I talk about him so much in my regular life. Right. I just, you know, I get yeah, to I need a break. PTA. <laughs> like, you, you guys haven't really done no, like the 90s no. Gen X Because they are the most discussed filmmakers of our That's generation. Yeah. I think yeah. it's felt a little uh, over-chewed for us. For sure. To a certain degree. 
But um, there, there was that feeling of like, in, in the late 60s, in the early 70s, I think largely spurred by Graduate and Easy Rider, suddenly these movies became really fucking profitable. Mm. And it was the studios reacting to an audience they hadn't thought to make movies for in a style they hadn't understood before. And then 1999 feels like, I think it's the reason it produces so many films that are now like feel like this last gasp, is I think the studios were like, it's time for another reckoning, right? It's time for another disruptive force in cinema. We have to give all these guys big ass budgets and assume that they're going to convert to like well, mainstream success. And so I think even if you're not correctly identifying what is Fincher's skill set, if you're a studio exec in 1997 when this movie's getting set up, you're just like, his shit's edgy and it was popular. For well, sure. Seven made so much money. That's the thing. Yeah. He made this movie that's really fucked up yeah. and it was a big hit. Even if it's a different kind of fucked up than this book. And, the, and he was frank in that movie. He, he was, was very yeah. frank. Let him be frank. Yeah. Um, I just really you, watching this I again. I bet you wonder what's in this box. Thank he you. literally <laughs> is in that movie. Yes, he is. He's <laughs> frank. He's letting him be frank. We haven't recorded Let, seven at this moment. Oh, David, we're going to drive him insane. Yeah, 90% in that frank. No, I'm excited for that. I just, um, this was a very complex rewatch for me as someone who, like Ben, ingested this movie on a molecular level for mm -hmm. many years of my life. Has grown away from it. And I view it now as like, I mean, I love this movie spiritually. Mm -hmm. It's a deeply embarrassing movie to actually admire. I, I kind of agree with like, that. At it this is, point, it's you're very like, oh, you basic. sweeties. Yes. It's like yes. basic, yes. like entry level philosophy 101. It is a stoned shit. person in a bathtub being like, don't you under fucking stand, man? Like corporation. And you're just like, yeah, no, I know. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, uh -huh. like there was some <laughs> quote I came across, I think in the New York Times, Dennis Lim, like Blu-ray special edition article where Norton's like, it's a deeply serious movie made by deeply goofy, unserious people, sure. which yes. is debatable. Edward Norton calling himself that. But what do you like, mean? Edward Norton, laugh riot. Um, yeah. But I'm, no one you funnier. know, it's like, it's on the line of, is this a, Smart movie made for dumb people or a dumb movie That's made by smart whole people. Thing. But it's at this point, I think you can't answer that question. No, you can't. But watching it takes me on so, this journey because yes, I watch this too. movie daily and some like right. I, not in its entirety, but I had a tape of it so I could watch it. But because I had the TV VCR in my room, but the DVD player in the basement, right. so I need to have the tape upstairs. And I would just watch 20, 30 minutes before falling asleep every night. For there are so many it's like what I did movies. with the Wiz in high school. Right, I uh, do that with, but not this one. But I just did it all the time. And watching it again now, it's like, look, this movie is not profound. In fact, it's deeply juvenile and idiotic yeah. and yes. borderline like laughable. Yes, and the music is so of its time, it's and it's just so of its time. Long. The special it's effects are terrible. Long. It's so long. I, Anna, yeah. who knows this movie well, was like. I don't remember the last hour of this movie. Yeah, because you fucking get exhausted with this movie. You get movie. exhausted. It's oh. just, it's so flawed and it is so inherently like stupid in the way yeah. that Gen X angst is stupid. Any generational angst becomes stupid. Yes. I can't look, not love it for what it has meant to me, but watching it again, I was just thinking, man, this is look, like, what does this mean to a 23 year old now? Let, and right. I said to Anna, and this is my final thought. These are important points. Don't cut them off. My man's I, cooking. I just said, this is like, kids watching this now, I think would be like when I watched Easy Rider. And she uh -huh. said, I knew you were going to say Easy Rider, sure. where you watch it in Easy Rider. No, you're right. You're watching and you're Easy Rider. And all you think is, later and sure, like, mm. I guess, like, I can right. see what this was. I can see what this meant. It doesn't work for me at all. Yeah. I don't connect with it. Yeah. I don't understand what they're talking about. Yeah. I don't care what they're talking about. And I don't like these aesthetics. Yeah, because they're too busy posting on Instagram and like, like go it's up, like go the up, bullshit, go up. Line those the bullshit zoomers up. <laughs> of like Ridley Scott is here times now. has gotten worse. <laughs> the, millenni right? the millenniums. Yeah. Like, um, the shit that the he's complaining about, the consumerism, right? Sure. All of that yes. like messaging it, it now has just gotten everywhere. so yes. worse and right. terrible. I mean, that's the thing. They lost. Like what? what right. Now we're just sort of like, yeah, what are you going to do? People right. are self-aware you know. and accepted. It's not like we're oblivious. We're right? all fucking brands now. Well, right. And we it's just walk around as fucking brands. That's your entire career. Currency we, as a human being in wait, this uh, world. What episode? We talked about selling out with the Doughboys the last... Oh, uh, They Live. Oh, sure. Right, like the thing where you now, if it's like, well, you're selling out, people are just like, well, you, cause you, you got money. Get you that know? back. Right, gotta get, you know, gotta rise and grind, motherfucker. Right. You know. um, all right. right, they pay you to sell out. Ben. What's up? Hey, it's, uh, it's me, it's Griffin. You're Ben. Yeah, hey. Uh, sorry to interrupt the episode again. I know we did the ad break where we then revealed it was not an ad break and we didn't have sponsors for this episode. Yes, right. Uh, which is sort of this meta idea in line with the sort of sentiments of Fight Club to, to not do advertisements in the episode. Right. I have to admit that was a, that was a bit. We, uh, 
we decided to forego one of our ad slots. We usually have three. Mm-hmm. We kept one open to make an anti-advertising sentiment. But it, but to be fair, you know, truly, I mean, these ads, they help pay for the salaries, our editors, you know, uh, researcher, our rent here in the studio. So we do, we need to do ads. So it was, we took a little bit of a financial hit on the first one, but we're going to do two other ads. So here's, uh, today's episode sponsored by Just kidding, we still don't have advertising Got you We cut your ass so bad You didn't even see it coming You man. didn't see it coming And to be clear, we love those companies Thank yeah. them for their years of support We will reinstate our relationships with them next week But this week I don't fucking give a care all you fucking listeners, you're sitting there with your napkins tucked into your collar, fork and knife going, please feed me more ads. I'm a pig. Fuck you. Here's your ad. Get a life. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you go to your damn library? Yeah. Read a fucking book. Or even better. How about punch somebody? Well, we can't condone violence. Okay. You're right. We can't condone violence. But, uh, well, this was. Uh, oh, or, you oh, know what? But what? D- defend someone. Yeah. Or read a book about punching somebody. There you go. Like Fight Club, the book. But this is not an ad for the book. No. It's not an ad for anything. It's an ad for nothing. That's right. We don't believe in ads. This one week. Just this one week. Okay, back to the episode. I see my thing. I think why I enjoyed this movie, rewatching it more than I uh, remembered liking this film in my mind's eye is I, I never, it never was uh, a, 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 a a call to rise for me, you know? Sure, like, you th- were not like, I, right, I'm right. i being spoken to by, by Club. Right, right. Yeah. and I think I've always landed on, it's a dumb movie made by incredibly intelligent people, and so I find the movie very fun and entertaining in that level. I also love Easy Rider. It is a movie that I do not relate to any of, but I find it so. I, I like the film itself, but also it's got that You're thing of be, like born to be wild. I, well, I was born to be wild. Um, but I watch it and I'm just like, it's kind of funny watching a movie that is this primal scream from a failed countercultural movement, right? Yeah. Where you're like, at this point, it's just a closed loop time capsule of a thing being presented with the promise of like, are we about to shake fucking everything up? Although that movie, of course, ends with like their deaths being being meaningless, right. right? So I, I, I. I think now with like more distance from this film and the less it actually speaks to our current moment or the attitudes, at least that most people apply to our current moment, I like it more as a time capsule of this is what people were yelling. Sure. Yes. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think I just also these days, I respect any movie that looks good. I think this movie looks great. Yes. Some of the visual effects are like, you know, dated or whatever, but like, yeah. you know, it looks like 1999 in yes. a glass. The, I love that. The other thing I was going to say, uh, what, David? I just, I feel bad for criticizing the last hour of this movie because I, I do want to acknowledge, I do think the ending of this movie is so effective. The ending of the incredible. last hour is bad. It's just, I, or what, you sort of are losing if you've steam seen this a little movie bit. Right. A dozen yeah. times flick it in off. bits and pieces, you're like, I remember Marla. I remember the fights, the like levels of Project Mayhem that goes on for like, it just, and, and him being like, what do you mean? You know, like the Tyler reveal taking 10 minutes yeah. of. Yeah exposition you're just sort of like i get it i get it. but of course the ending is so good that you do you always finish on a high note yeah. at fight club fincher in the commentary said that he really didn't want the movie to be that long right sure and he was like, like two hours 20 yes yeah, and he was like fox was supportive of it but they were like obviously if you could cut it down and make it user friendly <laughs> sure. we understand what we signed up for we wanted fucking countercultural revolution we're going to talk about this specifically right? yes but like, if you can do it, and he was like, I really worked hard and I kept on trying to pair out anything I could. And I got to a point where I said, I don't think I condensed the story down anymore. I really tried to squeeze it as much as I can. And he's recording this commentary maybe a year later. Yeah. And he's like, now I absolutely think I could cut it down. I needed distance. Right. There was a part of me that wishes I could just go off the grid for six months, go into the woods, completely rethink it. And I could absolutely get this down under two hours. But I was so deep in it and I was so committed to like all the different story beats I wanted, uh, using as much of the actual text from the book, all these different gags that I just thought all of this was indispensable. I mean, the the Raymond K. Hessel human sacrifice scene is a perfect example. Like that is a deleted scene. It it has, it's never set up. You see the driver's licenses on the door later, but the human sacrifice element of Project Mayhem is not part of it. Yeah. It's like a scene that could, I mean, you could just lift it out. 
I it, just I find it so fascinating where you. But compare, you need it in there for the Gump reference right. because you have to know that he loves Gump. Tyler He's a Gump. Gump. Uh, I, my question is: Is the fact that Tyler can quote Gump proof that the narrator has such lame taste? Yes. That he himself can quote Gump, of course, because he watches yeah, the it. The narrator is like, so lame. Yeah. He's so lame that he loves Gump. Yeah. Tyler doesn't love Gump. Well, Tyler isn't real. Right, but right. at that moment, before you know that, are you supposed to think he, pro oh. he projected Gump? He's one of the guys he put, who thinks the Pulp Fiction should have won Best Picture. I can't He's conceive mockingly of, quoting Gump. I mean, uh, sure, sure. Whereas the narrator loves Gump. I can't conceive of Tyler as a real person. I don't remember not, you know, I don't remember knowing about this movie before the, you know, I, I think I did sure. watch it not knowing the twist, but I just don't remember I that. will yeah. say to Ben's aggression point of, this movie connecting. I, for a, a, an English class project where I made like a movie of like a, whatever the pro my, you had to do something for a project. Mm. And I made a movie like a 30 minute thing. I put a frame of pornography in it before we watched it for the class on iMovie, because this was when my school switched from VCR to VCR editing to iMovie. And I was like, I can put one frame of porn and in this. Did people notice? No, no. no. One frame is very brilliant. Short. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Unlike the, I mean, now, what they show in the movie is like two cents. I know it's not one frame. No. Uh, but I, to I, I, I didn't to, take. I took that order literally. Uh, from page me. two of this uh, twenty-six Absolutely. page dossier. It's funny. So, JJ sent this to us and then just said, God, "Like, I imagine you're not going to get through any of this," and he's being proven right in real time. <laughs> he is told the movie is set up at Fox. He does not want to work at Fox because, of course, that's where he made Alien Three and had yeah. such a bad time. And he is told, well. Joe Roth isn't there anymore. Tom Jacobson isn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. Good thing about these multinational corporations is the people you loathe are gone so quickly. It doesn't really matter. You know, it's like, it's not like Fox, the big statue with lights doesn't like you. It's just all those fucking guys you fought with. The who lights are gone. actually liked him. Yeah, they, they thought he did a good job. Yeah. I'll see what Deadpool has to say about that. Oh my God. De Deadpool <laughs> Wait a second. Uh, wait, you think Deadpool's watched Fight Club? This is one of those movies where when Deadpool 2 was coming out, Fox re-released like their 20 top selling DVDs with covers where Deadpool was now on the movie and there's an edition of Fight Club you can buy that is Deadpool holding up the soap. Uh, that's fucking disgusting. Yeah, I think I that's hate that. good and definitely the kind of thing that, you know, Tyler Durden would approve of. Yes. Um so okay, so you know, he goes into this meeting with Fox and he says, "Look, I want to make this movie." Like I'm not going to water this down. Mm -hmm. I want to make a balls out version where planes explode and buildings explode and it's for real. I don't want to do this for $3 million. You know, I want to do it for lots of money. Uh, Fox CEO, Bill Mechanic, who I feel like has come up on this podcast before uh, uh, during Selleck, right? Yes. And yes. Uh, uh, all that is sort of like, okay, give us a real outline, you know, like prove it, prove that you can do this. Mm -hmm. uh, so Fincher goes off. Uh, he <laughs> amazingly approached Buck Henry. Yes. Uh, going with his graduate idea, being like, do you want to write my script for I this movie? That was a Fox decision. JJ said it was a, a Fincher thing. I they mean, he says the director reached out. I mean, I, okay. you know, so, but uh, Buck Henry's response was, I don't think there's anything funny about it. Uh -huh. Kind of fun. Okay. Uh, the script written by Jim Yules, 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 I've always thought. Uh, who yeah. had written an, a, a, a spec script called Hard Hearts, which was his like ticket to Hollywood. He's only other credit is Jumper to yeah. this day. I think he's two. a rewrite guy. He's a <laughs> like, it's, it is just interesting that this very big movie was written by a guy who just kind of has no footprint in Hollywood, really. I don't yes. know. Yes. Yes. Right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the, the movie is, the book is very. He's cribbing right from the book, like, but still. Which was Fincher's big thing. It's Apparently, a complex work of adaptation. Right. It's hard to put that book on the What's screen. Her name? Laura, Laura Ziskin, yep. who was in charge, when he had to go pitch it to her, he was just like, I think the thing to do is to really look at the book. I have no radical idea of how to right. adapt this. I think right. it's there. There was sort of a fear about using voiceover so because it was seen as such a hacky cliche. And he was like, you gotta. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the development speak at the time, according to Fincher, was he can't do voiceover. Voiceover is a crutch. The first draft has no voiceover, according to Fincher. Mm -hmm. And he's like, and there he's like, where is the voiceover? And they're like, oh, you know, that's a crutch. And he says, it's not funny if there's no voiceover. It's just sad and pathetic. I think that is so true. Yeah. Imagine this movie without the narrator talking. You'd just be like, what a little dweeb this yes, guy is. Absolutely. Um, you need that kind of, you know, he's, he, 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 Yule says, I never wrote an entire script without the voiceover. I wrote like 10 pages of spec without mm -hmm. it, but you know, they fight over, I guess. Uh, Andrew Kevin Walker, Polish. Sure. As he did with the game. Squeaky, squeaky. <laughs> uh, uh, he says, and I like this quote, 
Jim Mules uh, made an amazing chair and I came in and I sanded some of the edges and put the little things that protect the floor on the bottom. That's his That's his take on what he did. The three detectives in this movie are named Detective Andrew, Detective Kevin, and Detective Walker um, in separate scenes. That's cute. Yeah. I should also mention that I, I, would, I went through a phase where I would buy anything on eBay that was Fight Club. Mm-hmm. I would just search for it and I buy was stuff. Wondering when you were going to bring this up, what you had in your basement? Well, no, that was I didn't buy that. Used, to, but I bought the script, like a, a script, like the kind sure. of thing you would now get on the street in Soho or whatever. Yeah. And I read it. Was the first script I'd ever read, and it like taught me formatting. And I would that makes sense. Read yeah. the script and watch the movie and be like, oh, this is how this is written. And I just had it sitting next to my computer for like five years and just was always like, oh, so that's what a script looks like. So Jim Mules is like such a big name for me, even though. Even, have you ever met him or? No, I don't know. I mean, he's, know. he's the kind of guy who's probably like on the board of governors of the WGA now or sure. something. Did the script read well? Yeah, it was exactly like the movie. Um, Cameron Crowe apparently gave Fincher some advice. Uh, says make sure that he's not so sure about what he's doing because otherwise that's going to be boring. Read Tyler Durden. Sort of yeah, like that. The other thing I saw him say. Art Linson did a pass. I, yes. I got Alex. Alex is laughing. I just, yeah, I'm just seeing these texts now. He's sending Deadpool, Deadpool. Uh, covers. Yes. Yeah, there are like 20 of these. They're they're really bad. They're uh, very funny. Uh-huh. Um, Deadpool's in them. Yes. Uh, oh my God. He They fucking desecrated Assassin's Creed. Creed. Are you in fucking Creed. serious? He's under the hood. Motherfucker! He invaded the Assassin's Creed cover. <laughs> this Ben's is gonna radicalize to Ben more than <laughs> 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 Um, no, the thing I was gonna say, yeah, Cameron he Crow. went to Cameron Crow and he yeah. was like, "My worry is that uh, Tyler Durden is is a little too one dimensional. I want to make him feel a little more rounded as a character." And uh, Crow basically gave him the opposite advice, which was like, "Make him more inscrutable." Right. Make him more unknowable. Good he advice. doesn't need to be a real person. He's you have to go one. lean harder into. Absolutely. Yes. Um, Fincher goes back to Fox and with this giant package he's written up. He's gonna. He's like, it's gonna cost sixty million dollars. Mm-hmm. It's gonna have Brad Pitt and Edward Norton. We're gonna start inside Edward's brain and pull out. Right. We're gonna blow up a plane. All this shit. You have a seventy-two hours. Yes or no? That was and basically. Fox said yes. Yeah. When he went to Laura Ziskin, his pitch was. I don't want to go through the notes. Let me just go off, work on this for six months. I'll come back. I'll give you that right, sell. Right. And he went in with like a book that was fucking humongous of every single thing storyboarded, the two stars. And yeah, uh, Pitt got 17.5. He did. Norton got two and well, a half. Well, you know what? Yeah. Primal Fear is only three years before no, this? No, absolutely. Right. But by the time this comes out, Norton is absolutely... He's hot shit. This is the year well, that Vandy Fair does the off-mentioned... There's no denying it. Ed Norton is the actor of his generation. Is he sufficiently cover. milk toast enough to be this guy? He's. I think he's very well cast because I he's a nervy little rat. I mean, boy. I think he is because that's yeah. how the movie is. But yeah. like, if the guy is supposed to be like the most pathetic office drone every man, Norton does have an edge. I mean, that's why he's so good in Rounders and in sure. American History X, the kind of two movies and Primal Fear where he's in jail. Like he, those three movies you would have seen up until this point. He's well, like right, a scumbag. That was the thing. Or he a bad was, guy. At this or an point, angry guy. Positioning himself as like, I'm the new De Niro. I'm the guy who will go right. there, right? But Fincher casts, casts him in this off of People versus Larry Flint, which is very oh, much right. the same that vibe. Yes, yeah, That's the thing he's like responding to. And then Norton, like, you know, within five years of this movie starts to enter like a wilderness period that he isn't really pulled out of until Wes Anderson reclaims him. And it's like, you are goofy. You are funny applied in goofy ways. And listening to the commentary, uh, Fincher just keeps on talking about, like, his Adam's apple is so funny. <laughs> Look at how, like, goofy he looks. And he just keeps saying, like, Nord has the best eye, under eye bags of any actor I've he, ever he, seen. He's got good bags. We play it up with makeup, but that's, like, that's just how he looks. He's just silly. He kept saying he's like Buster Keaton. It's funny to watch him get punched. Here is Art Linson, producer of the film, mm-hmm. his take on this movie getting made. And he's basically like, you got Brad Pitt and David Fincher. Mm-hmm. Last time they made a movie, it made $300 million worldwide. And it was a $300 million success that no one could have anticipated, right. which makes people take the risk. Well, that's what again. happens when you let them be frank. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, Played you know. well both domestic and overseas. Uh, <laughs> um, the uh, DVD sales weren't too shabby neither. Um, Tyler Durden, Brad Pitt is obviously the choice. Yeah. Uh, Fincher says, I hung up the phone after offering it to him and he was knocking on my door like four minutes later. I live in a gated community. I don't know how he got past security. I mean, this had to have been the best call of Pitt's life, right? Like Pitt is this guy who's so desperately trying to find the way to knock himself out of pretty boy shit. Right. And it's like 12 Monkeys was him finally getting some sense of like serious credibility 
And here it's like you get to do that and you get to essentially be the center guy. But then in between those, he does like just nothing but the, I was the about wrong to say, stuff again. Like totally. he he keeps obviously, you know, throughout his whole 90s. I guess Double yeah. Zone is legitimate, well, but no, it's a terrible movie. But like, like that's he, like a legitimate choice, unlike some of the other paper, movies in the middle. It's sort of a good choice. It's on a paper. Yeah, 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 sure. I mean, but like, yeah, like obviously for much of the early 90s, he's, you know, River Runs Through It, uh, yeah. Legends of the Fall, Interview the Vampire. It's like, you are playing a very pretty, Just you know, golden boy, golden boy and it's, yes. he, he hates Tony it. drama. So, right. Then he does Seven and Twelve Monkeys and you're like, right. all right, baby. Like, you know, and then... Go. California's around that same time too? Yeah, the movie's yeah. horrendous. Sucks, but it's part of the same movement. Well, that's I, I got a monkey. Like, isn't that closer 93. to True Romance? It's 93. Yeah. yeah. Um, then in 96, he makes Sleepers, which sort of is like, I mean, he's not a huge part of that movie, right? right? Everyone's kind of I've been wanting to rewatch that. Me too. It's so long. I know. It's very long. <laughs> that was a huge, when I was a teen, like people, kids being like, that movie's so fucked yeah, up. Yeah, it was like, yeah. to me, like watching that, like this is adult filmmaking. Right. This is sure. serious. In 97, he does The Devil's Own in Seven Years in Tibet, which is just a huge back-to-back -back flop. Disaster year. And then follows yeah. that up with Meet Joe Black. So he's in right. kind of like disaster zone. Right. And obviously this year he does Fight Club. Next year he does Snatch. Yeah. And you're like, and then the next year after that is Ocean's Eleven. You're like, He's found his right. sort of. We just did this on the concert, house. but right. that's the movie. Ocean's Eleven is the one where he crystallizes who Brad Pitt here, here movie I am as a stars. handsome man. Yes. Uh, and then he's like, oh, Troy, let's do it. I, I figured mean, it out. Right. <laughs> let's, God bless. Let's, let's, let's go to war. Uh, yeah, I, I've been thinking of rewatching Troy too. Um, Have fun with that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I will. Good jo luck. My, uh, my wife also keeps being like, we're not doing that. And I'm like, eh, I kind of want to. There's some kind of like medieval section on Apple TV sure. that they keep pushing at me, even though it's a classical, like not a medieval. six hour extended cut of Hell that movie yeah. that probably makes it 2% better. Yeah, exactly. Gets that from a C plus to a B minus. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. This is a funny quote from Pitt uh, that JJ is very happy with. Mm. Uh, he says, um, it's astounding. It's an astounding, extraordinary, amazing movie. It's a pummeling of information. It's Mr. Fincher's opus. It's provocative, but thank God it's provocative. People are hungry for films like this, films that make them think. Fincher is piloting the Enola Gay on this one. He's got the A-bomb. Is that wow. a Mr. Holland's opus reference? Yes. P Pitt's referencing Holland's opus. Yes. That's no weirder than Tyler Durden referencing no. Forrest Gump. Well. Picture Pitt getting his his VHS of Mr. Holland's opus and being like, man, when they played that opus at the end. He couldn't rip the shrink wrap um, all fast enough. Now, Sean Penn wanted to play the narrator. Yes. Which doesn't really make any sense at all. No, but it just He's a little too Fincher. old for it, but he'd worked with Fincher. And the studio, I think, wanted Penn. He's still a huge name. Right. Norton's um, a little more untested. He's rising. But... Obviously, they're seizing on Norton right at the right moment. As you say, People versus Larry Flint, his big monologues in that, doing the uh, court arguments, he's like, okay, good. And that he's movie be is talking all him lot. being put upon next right. to he's good in the irascible movie. wild card. He's great in that movie. I am such a, I'm so mixed on Norton. I feel like we both are, Griff. Obviously, his later career is very he, up I and mean, down. When he's good, he's incredible. And I feel like we have this conversation a lot. And any of our listeners who are my like- My wife's favorite actor and biggest crush. Why? To this day. Will she see him moving now just because he's in it? Absolutely. When he showed up in Alita Battle Angel, a cameo that some people did not even recognize him yes. in that is wordless, yeah. she basically started firing a gun in the air. She was so <laughs> happy. She was like, is that Edward Norton? So she'll see like motherless Brooklyn just to spend time with Norton. Absolutely. I, now, I, she didn't see Gotti, which she only produced. Sure. He produced he Gotti? Sure did. That's so fucking weird. Wanted to bring Gotti to the world. This is probably a five-timers club, but just that, like, th that fucking Vanity Fair cover, right? That moment where he's positioned as the guy. Yes. Uh, my, my sister Romney, who was nine years younger than me, saw Motherless Brooklyn and went, why the fuck did they let this the seventh club. most important guy in the Wes Anderson movies make that movie? And I went, you don't understand. That's like... This has all been, in theory, a weird sidestep from what he was supposed to be doing all along, how this guy was framed to us in the late 90s of like, undeniably, this is the dramatic heavyweight actor of his generation, will be owning the screens for the next 30 years, and now he's going to direct to. How do you feel about it, Eden? Very, I would say at this point, just kind of mixed negative. Yeah. He, because at this point, at the point of Fight Club Contemporary, he was the guy, I mean, I loved him. Yeah. I loved American History X. I had it on Snap DVD. Mm -hmm. Snapcase. You snap that one. I loved Larry Flint. These are, and, I, and this movie was seminal, and I just thought he was the guy. And then now it's like, I don't even really like him now. Like, I don't look back on these and be like, man, I just love watching. I don't, it, you know, like some actors, you just think, I just love watching him in anything. How I feel about Brad Pitt. I'm yes. just, uh, I'm I just don't, I don't love Pitt. watching him in anything. And when I see him in stuff now, I'm just befuddled. I hated him in Glass Onion. 
See, okay, I, I like love him. him glass I love him. Glass he's well cast. I think he's great in Asteroid City. He is. And then I'm looking. He's looking, actually awesome in Asteroid. City. I think he's awesome yes. in Asteroid yeah, City. Yeah. I think that's his best of the West performances. Although I think he's pretty he's good, good in all in of them. Moonrise. And he's uh, and he's very good in um uh, uh yes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's like, right, the last three are Asteroid City, Glass Onion, Friends Dispatch. Then you go back to Motherless Brooklyn, Disaster. I Alita, think that performance is, is um, not good. No. And and just the whole movie Personally. is like on him. And then you're going back further and you're like, Collateral Beauty, what the fuck are you doing? Why is that your follow up to Birdman? Birdman, Birdman is Birdman, awesome. He's great in a movie yeah. we don't like, but I don't he's really great like that in movie, But I think he's really good. But once again, you're just like, this last decade, basically, he is only successful when he's making fun of his own reputation as like precious, self serious, you know. And then you're just like, Born Legacy, you know, outside of the Wes Anderson movies, Leaves of Grass Stone. I'm like, what's the last time I liked him in the sort of like original? hot run and it's like it basically stops in 2002 it's it's 25th hour yeah, yeah i think good. he's very good, not, yeah, he's hour. good um yeah. you know italian job he's the least interesting part italian job is a movie he was forced I know to make it gone but he's like someone i feel like this is the kind of pattern yes. that's obvious sometimes like after 25th hour he never really seems to seek out great directors obviously well, he's obviously he's number 17 on every wes anderson call sheet but right. like but after I, that, who does he want to work but isn't, with? Well, but isn't it also people don't want to work with him? That's he's part, part of it. Like, how do you go right. from Milos Forman, Fincher, Spike Lee, and then just like no A-list director? Well, like, well look, 96 does, to 99 is Primal Fear, Everyone Says I Love You, People vs. Larry Flint, Rounders, American History X, Fight Club. That's right. when that cover comes out. And they're like, this guy has made six films. They are all culturally right. he important. He has two Oscar nominations already. Right. He's like barely 30 years old, probably. He can do yeah. anything he wants. And his next move is, I'm going to write, direct, and co-star with the least interesting part in a faith-based rom-com. He didn't write it. Rom -com. He didn't write. I'm sorry. But I, mean, I think that's almost more insane. Wait, isn't that, like, isn't I'm that going your to wife's direct... favorite movie? Correct. Or one of the, so that's why that she is, loves it. That is my wife's favorite movie. That was one of my brother's faith. favorite movies. He it, showed it, it for a birthday it, party. It, it's a charming film. It's, it's honestly not bad at no, all. at all. But you're like, weird that this is what this guy wanted to make. It's a little bit weird, but you're sort of like, go off, I guess. Right. And then he does the score, which, which is this moment of like, we're putting Brando, De Niro, Norton, they're the three guys, right? obviously that movie is itself unmemorable. And then O2 is Death the Smoochie, Free to Red Dragon, 25th Hour. He's good in Death the Smoochie. He's great in Death the Smoochie. He's good. Uh, he's great in 25th Hour. Red Dragon, he's fine. Oh, he's, yeah. He's pretty sure. fun in that. Yeah, he's, you know, doing what he's doing. Frida, asked. he's dating Salma Hayek. Yes. He was very involved in rewriting that yeah, film. Yeah, he plays Nelson producing. Right. <laughs> but you're like, that's a year where he's still in the yeah, conversation. Yeah, 100%, 100%. And then 2003, Italian job, you're like, he hates that he's in this right. movie. 2004, uh, you have him uh, playing himself in After the Sunset. Yeah, what the fuck well, is that? Because he's Ratner's boy. Right. Kingdom and in of Two Heaven, people like that performance, but he's wearing a mask the whole time. Right. He's really good in Kingdom of Heaven, but it's this kind of like, oh, you know, good for you. You, you did a movie where no one saw your face. Down like, in the Valley is a movie I actually love that I think he's great in, but doesn't exist. i uh, never seen yeah, Never seen and then like illusionist, he's not great. And painted veil, what is this? You know, uh, like no, well, no, wait, wait a second. Excuse me, I'm pumping the brakes. What? I actually don't mind the movie The Illusionist, but I can't, I can't really remember what what he's like in it. He's fine, right? Like I think that movie, yeah. and doing magic. And he's like, ah, I'm a I think magician. that movie is fun. It's fun. Yeah, painted veil. It's just got its. It's just got its lunch eaten by the prestige. Absolutely. A painted At veil. The time and now. Yeah, is a very good movie. Really, uh, that I think he's good in. But obviously, the global appetite for that movie was zero. Ben, do right. you like the Painted Veil? <laughs> I've never fucking heard of it. <laughs> yeah, of course. I painted that veil every week. What are you talking about? Porch classic. We all had veils. But then basically, ben is literally after that, it's doing over. the Joseph Cotton right. and Citizen Kane gif of like he's literally folding paper in half and tearing it up while you run through uh, Edward after, Norton's disaster. That That's the thing, you know. He and basically pride and glory, off of which he's all right in. I right. think, you but know, it's like, like why is this guy doing kind of like third tier movies? Because he sucks. When he announces that he's doing Hulk, it's like, oh, Norton clearly gets it. He's ready to play ball. He right. wants to make good, and then he makes that experience so difficult for everyone right. for a movie that just does not work where they're like you know what you're fucking not part of these when he's in glass onion you are almost kind of like i can't believe ryan johnson with this expensive you know sequel with a lot of expectations took the risk of putting edward norton in the second biggest role 
Sure. Like in a way, like, cause like, I feel like his reputation becomes, he's going to try and take over your movie. But it feels like, like weirdly, don't, you know, don't, don't even bother. But that's like a Warren yeah. Beatty thing. But Norton is coasting on this, like off of what? Everything well, he's I'm author, not saying he's going to take it over and make has, it good. I'm no, just saying like, how can anybody even take that as a serious threat in 2021? Well, or, like, I assume a, that's a Ryan that, Johnson thought. There's right, that, and know? I think there's the other part of it, which is like, it seems like maybe he's less controlling when he's in a comedy. Sure. None sure. of the nightmare stories come from comedies, and his only good work in the last 15 years have been in comedies, usually not as the center guy, never as the center guy. To, 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 to quote Fincher at you, answering your question, and I'm not sure I agree with him, he says, Fincher, re-Fight Club. I wouldn't believe Nat Damon in this role. I don't believe Affleck in this role. I don't be, right. believe Giovanni Ribisi in I this role. I think the studio really wanted Damon. Makes sense. He's he, the guy. He's the ever, also, yeah. like, he's, he is an everyman right. type. Right. And the similar kind of corn-fed, slightly right. dorky, but but still yeah. handsome what enough to be like, What are you talking about, Brad? You know, I mean, like, fucking, yeah. they do that in Ocean's Eleven two right. years later. But he says, Edward makes a great blank slate. His opacity is part of the thing that makes him a terrific everyman. I don't feel that way about Edward Norton. But I do think he's well cast in this movie. I think movie. this totally works. See, because like, I Damon, don't think he's an everyman. Though. Norton, he's no. not at all. Norton seems like a miserable guy. Yes. And sure. this character needs to be miserable from 100%. minute one. Damon yeah. does not seem miserable. No. No, Damon's a, you know, kind of. This right, is the rounder. A happy economy. boy. Damon yeah, can like, be frustrated, totally. but he doesn't yes. seem miserable. You just have to see this guy in the first five minutes and think. God, this guy's just so fucking unpleasant. Right. Just he's unhappy. He's su like, and, and he's got he, nothing. He is the mirror image of Keanu in The Matrix the same year. The, you know, the cubicle guy with the fucking, you know, ill-fitting white shirt. Yeah. And Norton looks like he wants to kill himself. And Keanu looks like he's like asleep, right? He's just like in a daze. Like those right. the two. I mean, this movie in Matrix. Which generation on. really yeah. feared the cubicle? Yeah, well, I, to be fair, I get it. Um, I understand there's a different evil to the the open workspace, but the cubicle thing is, just, I think, one of the most depressing environments in the, the world. The, the felt cubicle under yes. fluorescent lighting is certainly not the most pleasant seeming vibe. Uh, uh, yes. But they have this sort of... Uh, the, the, you guys the, should build cubicles in here. Yeah, we need hmm. separate cubicles where we can't see each other. Peek over. Norton and Pip made this sort of handshake deal where office, Pip office was space like... Office Space 99 too? Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah. And you would not believe what Deadpool did to the cover of that one. <laughs> I'm telling you, blow your fucking mind. It's so disrespectful. Is he covered in post-its? No, he's poking behind the guy covered in post-its. He wouldn't even do it. He wouldn't even do the difficult part. Ben is punching the wall again. Fury is. Ben? Hey, Griff. Hey, this is our third uh, ad read slot. Right. Um, but this time is different. This time's, this time's different. Let's be reasonable. We're, we're adults here. And to sacrifice two ad slots on a big episode, yeah. Fight Club, one of the bigger movies we've Absolutely. ever covered culturally, yeah. would just, it would not be prudent. And once again, it got to keep the lights on. We have salaries to pay. Totally. So we're going to do one ad. We're doing one actual ad, and we're sorry if it feels like Real we're kind ad. of a sellout bailing on the bit. And I feel like the brand that we're about to promote... I, I think actually when you hear who the sponsor is, it'll yeah. make sense. But just again... It like won't that, feel like a betrayal. That we've like had two ads yes. sort of essentially mocking ads. Of course. I feel like the brand may not love that. But, but even give them credit for choosing to stay on as a sponsor in this week, even if it feels sure. like we're kind of selling out because it was pretty cool of them. Because even Audio Boom had to say like... Hey, just so you know, they're doing this bit yeah, without yeah. ads. So that's, and, and okay. Brands usually are not really into our bits. Totally. But this is a, a very tolerant, very cool of them. We're sorry if this feels like, a, a, once again, like we're bailing out on the bit and our integrity. Uh, and if you want to skip ahead, now's the time to do it. It'll just be like a minute or two. We're just going to get through the ad yeah. copy as quickly as we can. Our sponsor for this week's episode is Fuck You, No Ads. We did it. Three yes, for three, we did. and you fucking fell for it. Oh, Even though last time God. we played the same fucking trick on you, and in fact we maybe oversold the setup on this third beat, but we laid out way too much runway to the point where it got suspicious. No, you still fucking fell for it like an idiot. You know why? Because you like ads. You love them. You love them. I'm sitting up in my chair. This is my fucking manifesto, you pigs. 
We just dunked on your we ass. We dunked on your ass so hard. There is actually a sponsor on this episode, really, if you think about it. And the sponsor is you looking like a damn fool <laughs> listening to these ads. And guess what? That sponsor got their money's worth because you look like a damn fool right now. Honestly, the sponsor is you being a fool. I told you to skip ahead. I said skip ahead and you're listening to this. You damn fool. Anyway, David left hours ago. Oh, David is long, He's long gone. gone. When I when I talked to David about this, he said, "Okay, do whatever the fuck you want." Yeah. And we said, "Oh, we will. Trust me. We're going to get our money's worth. The non-money we're not paying to sponsor yeah. this episode with non-ads." And honestly, it's paying out. It's paying out. Not in terms of salary, though. And as we said, we do have about 10 people on payroll and we have the rent we have to pay for for this office. So next week, ads will be back in full effect. Yep. Uh, this is paying out comedically. But once again, we are we are taking a hit financially. Yeah, no, absolutely. Worth it? Absolutely. Oh, I'm so glad that we did this. Yes. But next week, we're going to hawk stuff so hard. You will not believe how hard we're going to sell stuff next week. Because we got we got ourselves into a hole on this one. We really did. This is the most expensive episode we've ever done. Actually, you know what? You're right. In a way, it really Somehow is. Somehow it's become like a Terry Gilliam project that's spiraling out of control. <laughs> Next week, we're selling out. We might have to do a fourth act. We might have to do a fifth act. <laughs> This has been a success. This has been a success. And I did buy the Fight Club action figures, which I thought were kind of funny because it sort of goes against the message of the movie. You can see, I think the other two fell down. They're not very well sculpted, but that's little Edward Norton there. You Those see him? just look like men. That's kind of the in bit. A suit. That's kind of the bit. Yeah. There's the Marla looks kind of distinctive because she's got a. She fell down. She, I guess she's sitting next to Teddy from AI. Ben's looking on the shelf here. Like that specifically looks like her, right? The Edward Norton one's pretty generic. I mean, I guess it just sort of looks like a sick woman. The facial likeness isn't there because I, I think they didn't have a likeness right, so they have to sculpt it just based on the costume and the styling. Yeah. Yeah. I know all this stuff. I go you know, too deep in on licensing agreements for different products. Anyway, Because I hate ads. And I hate products. Establishment. Fuck you. Back to the episode. Pitt and Norton shook hands and were basically like, uh, uh, Norton, I'm going to lose as much weight as I can. Pitt, I'm going to bulk up more than I ever have. Sure. Right, 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 and right, start right. doing it now and continue doing it over the course of the movie. I, that, it's, it's a great it's a great call. So physically. Pitt was basically like, I, I, uh, I was just lifting constantly. Yeah. And Norton was like, I basically was on a diet of vitamins for six months. Which um, makes him look goofier. Uh, he looks all withdrawn. Um, yeah. I will say also, I want to just to to, to complete the Norton thought. Um, they want him for talented Mr. Ripley. Obviously, that ends up going to Damon. They want him for Man on the Moon. Obviously, that ends up Doesn't going to Jim Carrey. he want it for Man on the Moon? Yeah. He yes, wants that because more than they do. Because he's worked with Foreman. Yeah. Uh, they also want him for the biggest of these three movies, Runaway Jury. They're desperate to get Norton he in Runaway Jury. He was signed. Jury. He was supposed to do that. It just Correct. didn't get off the ground. Uh, and it's also, this is all part of the Paramount Pictures, uh, you know, handcuff that he has, uh, you know. Uh, I a, think it was signed picture. from the primal fear, fear moment. It's what they end up using against him to make to him make, do Italian yes. job. He, they, he, gives, yeah. he gets permission to appear in this movie with Italian job as the price, which yes. is why he then complains about the Italian job for the whole press tour while journalists are like, you know, have you seen the movie? It's actually like perfectly fun. Right. And he's like, <laughs> no, it's like this piece of shit. That. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, um, it's very similar to the Emily Blunt Gulliver's Travels thing. Well, with that one, you do feel for her a little bit. Although yeah. she was also spared being in the MC. I Maybe think it's it was, good for her. I think it worked way. out well for everybody. Um, yes. They're making this movie. Uh, Norton says to Fincher as they're starting, he's like, this is a comedy, right? And Fincher's like, yeah, that's the whole point. So, you know, they are aligned, as you're saying. Like, this is a satirical film. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then people watched it and they were like, do they believe what they're saying in this? Is that this we should blow things up? Irresponsible. Because uh, Columbine had happened earlier this year. Yeah. The movie was pushed back from summer to fall. People thought it was because they wanted more distance for Columbine. In fact, Fincher was like, it was the one time in my life, basically, where uh, I'd made the movie. I'd been told I was out of time and had to lock. And Ziskin and Arnold Melchon came to me and they said, like, are you happy with it? And he was like, I'm happy enough. 
Right. And they said, if we could give you six more weeks, would you take it? And would you be able to make it better? And he said, yes. They gave him like $750,000 another six weeks to uh, right. refine it and and push it back because of that. Um, I'm sure they also probably thought... I think they wanted some distance. Some sure. distance and it yeah. played better in the fall. Right. The Matrix has gotten tagged so much with the Columbine shit because the, they were the so close codes. together. Yes. Yeah. Um, Janine Garofalo supposedly was the first choice for Marla Singer. This is one of those legendary... Right. This era of she was the first choice for Jerry Maguire and then the studio balked. She was the first choice for Fight Club. She was at this threshold point of... Yeah. Um, she claims Edward Norton felt she didn't, quote unquote, have the chops. Uh -huh. She's always blamed him. Uh, she said in an interview years later that Brad Pitt came up to her and said, I'm really sorry about how that all went down. And she was like, had nothing to do with you. It wasn't your fault. Norton claims that Janine is mistaken uh -huh. and that that is not true uh, and says, I'm a big fan of Janine's. I'd love to do a reading with her. And if she sees me in the neighborhood, I'll sh I hope she comes say hi. That's kind of an asshole answer. Yep. Yeah, well, he seems like a huge asshole. I have no idea if it's true or not. Uh, and of course, Edward Norton is only allegedly a huge asshole. And I don't right. want him to come for me. No, Edward Norton was dating Courtney Love at this so, time. Okay, well, so we're getting to her He next. was okay. dating but I, Courtney Love at this time. Edward Norton has one of so. the weirdest dating histories ever. But he was dating Courtney Love for a while. So, but, but, so we can all agree that Garofalo doesn't do it. It's yeah. just a matter of we're not sure why. Now, right. Edward Norton wanted been great, to do it and think. she felt... It's sort of, a, yeah. it's fascinating to imagine Garofalo doing this because it would be the kind of like, can you do a role this like this? Like, and if you know, she could and have, she could, it would have opened awesome. everything. Right. Up. Right. I have no idea, obviously. Supposedly, Edward Norton wanted Courtney Love to do it. And Brad Pitt was like, absolutely fucking not. Yes. Like, she is too insane to, like, she will fuck this movie. But conjecture, you could see and Norton. Obviously they had been in People vs. Larry Flint together. It's Courtney Love's right. best performance. Yes. You could see Norton icing uh, uh, Garofalo out because he wanted to create the opening for Love. Conjecture. And then everyone else just went, Love is not getting this. You created an opening for no reason. Absolutely. Yes. Possible. Uh, obviously, Fincher casts um, uh, Helena Bottom Carter. Now, you can read Courtney Love's long exegesis on her getting it's focused and coherent <laughs> it's not real she was on Marin that she said she was it. on it wasn't, Marin uh, she also had I believe a Twitter or Instagram thread sure. maybe where she expanded on it uh, it is fin funny that as Fincher says. said Fincher's pretty blunt about it mm -hmm. in uh, Brian Rafferty's book where he's just like the personal stuff was going to get in the way of it like she Absolutely. understood the character there's right. no doubt but like it was just too much I, I think they're all just basically like do you know how insane it is we're getting to make this at a big budget right. like we cannot introduce like something chaotic like that she says you know? that it's because Pitt wanted their life rights to Kurt Cobain and she wouldn't give them she does and then he that. said don't yeah. cast her that, that seems that is a thing she says like a thing that Courtney Love has said absolutely <laughs> classic Courtney Love <laughs> whether it's Love true or not it's, 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 a good, it's a good story yeah. it's just I if you're going Occam's it. Razor you can definitely see just the stakeholders of this movie being like Courtney Love seems like a, a chaotic person Yes. Right. Fox really wanted Reese Witherspoon and kept on pushing her on him, which is kind of interesting because she hadn't really popped yet, but I guess she was one of those people where well, they said intentions like... Intentions is 98, yeah. right? Like, and I guess a, an election movie. is 99, obviously. Yeah. Like, obviously, again, that's a zag for her. He like, she's been in like Pleasant Too young. Yeah. That was yeah. his whole thing. And then, of course, I, I he fucks her out of her. Gone Girl as well. He's, right. always, he's always fucking Takembe Matumbo in. But Helena, <laughs> Reese Witherspoon. Helena's an interesting choice at this point because she's almost exclusively she's prestige. A period. Whereas this was my introduction to her. Right. I and had this, no sense of her. This reveals in, in room with who I room. now feel like Goth, the public Goth perception Queen, of Helena Bonham, Helena Bonham Carter primarily is. She's yeah. very good in the film, in my opinion. She yeah. is. I agree with that. Is this a but? Th is this a non-character? She's she disappears for I would say almost an hour of. Is the any I mean, character in Fight Club have any dimensionality at all? Bob. You know what? He's I think got, he's the he's, most well-rounded yeah. in a couple of Wait ways. a second. <laughs> I, just, I, I, I feel like Marla Singer is <laughs> iconic as, yes. a, as a sort of twisted female character. Correct. But she's sure. really, after the first 20 minutes of the movie, there's not a single drop of new information about okay. her. Again, is there, and does any no. character in this I, movie I just, have any No, but she's the third, you know, she's yes. whatever. The, third I, the I first lead also has no <laughs> right. It doesn't have a name. The second but one I, is made up. Yes. I was trying to define, like, what is it? But she's almost like a, a flip of a manic pixie dream girl, where sure. it's like the dream manic is that she's... Manic pixie, goth, manic gothy dream girl, but whatever, she's not nightmare manic, girl. It's like laconic. A laconic gothy nightmare girl. There right. you go. Right. <laughs> like That's what it is. This is a big influence on me, where I was like... Wait a second, what? You're checking? 
to this kind of woman? Absolutely. I was like, be mean to me. Step on me, smoke in front of me, blow yeah. smoke in my face. By the way, Ben's current girlfriend is nothing like That's this. That's very and true. You really did not end up with a Marla. Yeah, no, yeah. I've, I've pivoted in, a, in a, look, a good way. We've been friends for 10 years. I remember you dating a couple Marlas. You That's never seem true. particularly happy in the moment. <laughs> you had a couple Marlas blow through your life, like, <laughs> you know, sexy trash bags. Yeah. yeah. Um... He, if Bottom Carter says, "I wanted, I wanted to meet Fincher to assert that he wasn't a complete misogynist," because mm -hmm. I think you're reading the script and you're like, you know, to what extent am I supposed to be taking all of this seriously? Sure. Uh, and she says, "Like I could tell, he's not an all-out testosterone package. Okay, he's got a healthy feminist streak." Mm. Um, and uh, she's yeah, she's awesome. She's uh, she's 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 very crucial to this movie. I think I agree. Uh, making sense. Yes, she looks sick. Uh, she does look a bit As in Ill. unwell or great? Both. Both. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Unhealthy and rad as hell. <laughs> uh, film shot for 138 days, mm -hmm. which is a long time. It was like originally budgeted at like 25. Then when Fincher got a hold of it and he got Pitt involved, the budget went up to 50. 60. Well, 50 was what they agreed upon. Well, according to the research, he said 60. It went to 65, I think. In your linear... 65 is what I heard it ended up at. Right. I think in the commentary, he said 50 was what they... He's lying. He's a liar. You're saying Who's 17 lying? is JJ or Fincher? 17. I would never in, accuse JJ of lying. 17's in Pitt's pocket. 17, 17 right. and a half right to Braddy. Yes. Right. And, and you're and you're yeah. tracking of Fincher, like this, this is that's a long shoot. It's a long movie. But this yeah. is definitely before this ridiculous obsessive reputation gets started. Uh maybe before it gets started, but I don't think I think that is like I consumed yeah. everything about this movie. Right. Every commentary, every article. I never heard like hundred takes. I, I don't know if he's doing a hundred takes, but I think he did a lot of takes. Forty. I kept on hearing him say forty. I mean, that's on the heavier side, but on the this commentary. is before. I mean, I mean, I yeah. feel like Here's a good quote from Edward Norton. Apparently Helena kept laughing during takes, mm -hmm. like corpsing, as the Brits would say. And he he would say to her, like, David's gonna make us do 40 of these. You really wanna make it 70? Stop fucking laughing. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think I think to some degree this movie has so many scenes, so many locations, so many setups that he had to like cut his usual takes in half. But I don't were those usual on the game? I don't think so. I don't I feel like two things happen, and this is where the Fincher heat comes is like yeah. one. This idiotic reputation he's created of as a perfectionist, I think, is absolutely a, a fraud. Like it's just nonsense. Uh -huh. I hate it. Uh huh. Two, he's still shooting on film at this point. I think Panic Room is hybrid, both film and digital. By Zodiac, I feel like he's like, look, Zodiac's one hundred percent. This is the yeah. movie about obsessives. Yeah, I'm gonna just let it all out. I'm now that guy. Right. It, I'm Jake Gyllenhaal is gonna say I did a hundred takes and I watched David delete the first ninety nine. Yes. I'm gonna like th it's time for me to fully put it on the table. I feel like at this point. That reputation is not there. Yeah. Okay, he works people. Long shoots, big budgets, but it's not like, Jesus, that's a marathon. And I think this is for the better. I feel like he went out of his way to create this reputation. We, I kind of, on the Kubrick episode, yeah. you know, we had fun saying like, this reputation I think is kind of complex. I don't really think it's the way people perceive it. Sure. The perfectionism, it's not so much that. Fincher, I think, is the opposite. He kind of like created this for himself. Yeah. He was, I, I think as someone who loves him and is also deeply cynical of his public persona, he seems to have been like, I want to be perceived as a perfectionist so that my work is perceived as perfect. And I think this is charlatanism. And it's nonsense. Like the hundred takes, like, oh, he stitches these frames together so that everything is perfect. And it's just like, to what end? Who cares about this? This is like so not in the context of the work. And then he makes four movies in five years. And it's like, you can't, like, his work does not keep up with this legend he spins about himself. See, I almost think it is, like, it's a green M&M's thing. Okay. Right? Where it's, he like... He has the heels. Conservatives don't like him. <laughs> Hachi, machi! Look at this green M&M! <laughs> Wait, I need my charger. You guys keep talking. Let me tell you, I've always been more of a brown M&M person myself. Uh, Frank's got opinions. They melt in my hand and in my mouth. Quick, David's getting something. Do Frank yeah. Underwood. <laughs> I see you need an AC charger for that laptop, David. Uh, David's going to go take a shit. <laughs> well, Frank, when the David's away, the Frank will play. No, you know, the... David's a defender of this Fincher narrative, so now that he's in the bathroom, we can really debunk it. Yeah. Uh, the Green M&M's thing in The Rider. Which which band was it? Was it Motley oh, Crue? Van Halen, I think. Van Halen, Yes. Uh, you know this thing, right? 
that like for years and years and years that it was cited as this like they are the greatest divas. One of the things in their riders in their concerts for their shows is that they demand that uh, in the at the backstage the green room yeah. there are no green M and M's. I thought this was Ozzy. Sure. Well, other people start doing it, right? Oh, but they're the they're the originators of this. Well, I'm, I think it's Van Halen. I believe I'm, it was Van. I would love Halen. to be proven wrong. But. And it it was sort of this thing that for years they would sort of like not rebut it, but also never really claim it. And it was like, are they that neurotic? Do they think they taste different? Is it like truly just a power control thing? And then it came out decades later that like we had a very complicated tech setup, and our writer had like the full breakdown of how things need to be set up. Uh, because we understood, like, the amount of energy, actual, like, electrical danger was at play, right? And there was one time they did the show, and the equipment was poorly set up, and someone got injured. And they were like, we're going to put the green M&M thing in, like, halfway through the rider. So if we get backstage and we see that there are no green M&Ms in the bowl, we understand that they actually read every word we put in there. And it was this test. But in order to keep Famous the test going... strategic geniuses Van Halen. Right. In order to keep that test going, they could never publicly own up to why they were doing that. And I do feel like there's a similar kind of thing with Fincher where it's like, I get people on set knowing that they would be willing to do this for me. Not that I'm going to ask them to do it as much, you know? Like, I remember some Timberlake interview where he was just like, and was it tough, like the 100 takes thing? And he was like, no, he was just like, he'd do five takes and he'd be like, do you not like... We can be done if you want. We can move on. I've never heard someone who works with Fincher say that. And I certainly ask anyone I meet who's worked with him, like, so what's the deal? And what did they say? They say you work, you do a lot. You do a ton of fucking takes. When I interviewed everyone, they just all were basically like, anyone who doesn't like that is a big baby. But of course, that was his, not his loyal actors, crew. It's not that actors do don't, the you know, I've, and actors say sure. like, I would love to work with, you know, I would love to do that. That sounds like a fun process. But like, I just think he created this this myth of himself rather than it being kind of created despite himself. Mm -hmm. And I think it has led to a perception of his work that I find very irritating and at odds with my occasional love and occasional complete disconnect from his more recent movies. Interesting. It's just myth making. And this movie doesn't have that. And this movie, David, as you say, looks great. Yeah. I feel like he really, I mean, he really, I, Zodiac kind of the exception, but like, his proselytizing of digital, I think, is a huge mistake. And uh -huh. it's like borderline embarrassing at this point. Mm -hmm. Especially when you look at kind of like... Go off. I, I mean, mean, you guys, you're doing off. like you're covering all of House of Cards. So you'll talk about this later. But like... One episode at a time. Like the way he... Well, excuse me. Say that in a different accent, if you will. Uh, we wouldn't want to rush. <laughs> you you're doing them all as, you're doing them all as commentary. So you're having commentaries. Yeah. Slow yeah. and Underwood. steady wins the podcast. I just and you won't race. believe who's the one doing the commentary. <laughs> you miss me? <laughs> you thought it was fast, fascinating when I turned to camera and talked to you. Uh, he, the way he kind of flattened the aesthetic of television with that show and kind of made all TV look like that very stately, very cold. It sucks. Well, and also, I feel like just he's ground zero for all the problems yeah, of prestige I, and streaming TV that we now live I'm with. Right. I don't know if I, if I throw that at Fincher's feet. I throw that more in Netflix's feet. Well, for but, sure. I mean, but I TV, no you know, even, I even Fincher, prestige shows, HBO prestige shows up to 2012 did not look the way House of Cards looked. And now I feel like a lot of shows look that way I because think, he's so yeah. influential. He's so he's aesthetically influential. and visually I just, influential. And Netflix like also likes movies look. things basically being produced in his style because it gives them more ability to manipulate it and post further. Well, for sure. I just feel like, and this is like broader, that again, this movie does not live within, nor mm -hmm. does Seven, nor you know, Panic Room a little bit, Zodiac to a good extent, but like his coldness and his digitalness mm -hmm. is good but it has only had a bad influence. It's good when he does it, yes. but it has only had a completely insidious and horrible impact on people's relationship with changing camera technology, well, people's right. relationship with tone and mood and people's relationship with like this kind of movie, even if it's a kind you of movie. There's anyone else who does it good. Anyone? Surely there's Give me someone. some examples. Soderbergh and Michael Mann. Those are the three guys I think of who like. Michael Mann is a hot stylist though. He's hot. Yes, but no, but I'm just saying all three of them have like gone to video and tried to own what it does differently than rather right. rather than using it to try to replicate or replace film. But Soderbergh 
I, to use Ben Soderbergh is a dang ass freak. Like yeah. he 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 does not even count. He's trying stuff. Right. That, well, because he has like a camera in his butt. And these he's guys just sort of yes, like, yeah. all right, let's let's move it along. He shows up with the Google, movies with the, with the, with the Google right? Glass, and he's just filming you. <laughs> but like, I remember Soderbergh had some quote about Fincher where he was like, "See if you can find this." Where it's like. He was like, yeah, we did color correct. I, I we, quoted we've this talked like about it. And, and, and oh, I just, an and I just thought, like, imagine seeing the whole world right. that way. And it's right. like... Where he's like 25% darker in this quadrant. Like, yes, get the fuck out of here. Like, come on. Well, this is silly. So then what's your take on him? It, it's, very, it's very up and down. I mean, this movie, seminal. Uh-huh. Seven, I've seen dozens of times. Mm-hmm. Right. Zodiac. Well, mas- you were taking notes. Towering masterpiece. Yes, I was taking notes yeah, on man. how to be Zodiac, frank. like one of the great American <laughs> uh, films. Uh, yeah. yeah, a towering masterpiece. And then all of his other, you know, Social Network, Love, right. Dragon Tattoo. I saw it once and then we rewatched it like a year ago. It went from like seven to 12 stars for correct. me. Like, <laughs> correct, 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 correct. <laughs> it's one of those things where like, I said, yes! I enjoyed it. It was on Netflix, you know, like in the dead of What about winter. a movie about a girl who's gone? Uh, like it a lot. Haven't seen it in a while. Uh, wow. I just remember what being about very a, let me be Mank. Terrible. Yeah, yeah, I know. You 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 texted me a rant about Mank so long when it came out that I actually had to put my phone in the fucking bathtub. What about <laughs> a boy who's seven, <laughs> but it looks a lot older? I have not seen that movie since it came out. Ben, and you loved it at the time. Can I ask a lot, a lot, a lot of bits, a lot of bits, a lot of Benjamin bits. Damn. How long we've been recording? I look a lot older. Uh, Thirty minutes. An hour and forty-seven minutes. I joked at the start of this podcast it would be 90 minutes before we started the plot of Fight Club. Well, and trend. my joke was too tame. We've been focused. We've I been know. very on top. I just feel like the Fincher <laughs> question. I'm here. sorry. Could you say that in a different accent for me, please? This no is- <laughs> tangents in this episode. We're on a straight road. This is your point, David. A is road that he to is, four hours. He is so over-discussed that you have to draw a circle around all of it because otherwise, what are you doing? You can't right. just say... Let's talk about the movie because that's not that interesting because people have been doing it. Fight yeah, we can't. Yeah. We, that's why we're not we doing it. We cannot do it. Fight Club is certainly but he's just such... not a movie where we have to be like, all right, the film begins with the narrator who is never named, but often called Jack. Right. You know, like, <laughs> and he's attending various therapy sessions right. for diseases he but does not have. He looks around his apartment. He sees prices on the furniture, which Wait. is a reflection of this capitalist flat packed IKEA furniture I'll everywhere. You guys and are making me want to do this. Access emotion or his own feelings. So he has to watch dead dying people i remember a thing i've invoked on a couple other movies we've covered from this year but i remember seeing entertainment tonight do the exclusive premiere of the trailer Uh which they also did for eyes wide shut maybe a couple other big 99 movies when this is kind of like peak film nerd big 99 movies that were like totally normal and didn't uh, have any provocative elements sure right yeah and they would like be like it's and coming up in the last five minutes the exclusive (laughs) premiere the trailer mayhem yeah Yeah. Uh and so (laughs) Um, the <laughs> missing impression. Right. 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 Yep. Mm-hmm. Much like TRL, where you'd wait to see the video and they'd only play like 30 seconds and of the be video. Like an MTV bug, like right. having sex with someone in the corner. Totally. Yes. Yeah. Moon man <laughs> high fiving. <laughs> Moon man mooning you. Yeah. Um, they they were like selling up the trailer and then they were only playing like excerpts from the trailer and having uh-huh. the horrible uh, Entertainment Tonight correspondents go like, we see a scene in which they go around the room <laughs> and his IKEA furniture all has prices attached Apparently to it. Apparently you can't talk about Fight Club. Right, but they were like uh, speaking to the fact that this movie is maybe a, a satire of capitalist society and consumerism. We'll have to find out. Brad is definitely looking hotter than ever. Uh, I do think that all the things I was just pointing out, such as, yes, he can imagine the prices of everything in his beautiful, shitty apartment, or he's going to, you know, these therapy sessions to feel something. Yang coffee table, right. These all did feel profound in 1999. Absolutely. I, I, I like, cannot like just deny. Like a bag floating in the wind. still fucking resonate. Uh-huh. Still well, like, real but things them. like the therapy set, like things like the, like, this guy is so far from accessing his emotions that he has to experience like the worst human emotions, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, does that feel profound to you now? Because it feels trite, but does it just feel trite because it's like Fight Club did that and it kind became of. like a parody of itself? I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, like this guy, I just want to sit this guy down and be like, will you just like jerk off and relax, you fucking weirdo? He's never heard of it. <laughs> It feels like something a uh, like weird loser misanthrope would do, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. that feels like something that's very uh, swept under the rug, especially back then. Like yeah. men couldn't have 
feelings or whatever in, in the a 90s, normal men way. Men couldn't have feelings. Right. It wasn't allowed. It Until the created, Green M&M yeah. came along. The movie yeah. does. <laughs> that went a little, yeah. <laughs> the movie does literally start with you're probably wondering how I got here. Yes. We have to yes. acknowledge that. Yes. It uh, also then starts with like, let me start earlier. No, 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 even earlier. Okay, that's right. There I am. Like yeah. it's it has every silly cliche and yet it does. But none of, of course, these things, it feels like it's aware of all these cliches. Like Deadpool, it? like Deadpool, right? Deadpool perfected the formula, of course. Yeah. Um, fight cool, wa- fight club fight cool. walked so that Deadpool could run. Fight pool, fight, fight pool. pool. Um, Dead club. The narrator. Uh, the whole first chunk of this movie, right? Mm-hmm. It's right out of the book. The book is exactly the same, except for the sort of last chunk. They kind of right. change. Uh, the whole first chunk is him fighting with Marla over uh, say, the, um, you know, which days you get. my favorite section of course of the it movie. is, because it's like screwball comedy. Yeah. And, like more than screwball and comedy yeah. with a Tim Burton girlfriend. I like it yes. when she's more centrally a part of the film. And right. the, the car recall stuff is dark and fucked up in a, in a fun way. It's yeah. right out of like Douglas Copeland or whatever, right? Like, right. The, you know, like the Gen X people where it's like, you have a job that's so meaningless and surreal. Like it, it speaks to our human condition. Also, like 99, post, like post Cold the War. Gen X cynicism is now metastasizing into a, is the whole world over? Right. Well, right. This, not this just literally Y2K, but also just topic, being like, the end of history. Yes. I knew, yes. I, I knew history. you were going to say the end of history. Of course I was. <laughs> we're talking about Fight Club. It's like one of the most end of history we're, movies David, ever made. David, 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 David we're not, don't say we're talking so about sorry. Fight Club. And then history is now going to end. Now. Yeah. Right. Currently. Yeah. Well, no, that's the end of the world is what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. The idea mm-hmm. of the end of history was that the world wasn't going to end. There just wasn't going to be any more They're new things reset. happening. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then too many things happen. I mean, happen. to be clear, the end of history is more complicated. Can I, can I say something? Yeah. I'm so tired of living in unprecedented times. Can we get precedented times for a change? <laughs> is it, and the history, this feels like history won't stop happening around me. Um, I can't take a damn breather. No, as you said, it's a fucking we, history happening. We can't talk about uh, <laughs> this movie without mentioning 9/11. It's one of the, it's the one of the definitive yeah. like oh I see 9/11 hasn't happened to these people yet. Movies, yeah, yes, right. You know, even more like so than American Beauty. Even if you just showed it to people now, they would think like this has to have been a commentary on 9/11. Right. Is this right. a reaction? Not to 9/11? young people like would be like oh this is one of, of those 99 movies. They would just think like oh this is a 9/11 movie, which it is. Well, and the imagery at the end, which is I still think the most effective imagery in the entire movie. It's so cool. I think this movie has one of the better endings. Uh, you mean the Chinese ending? Yes, that one where they go, Tyler Durden, you're a bad man. Time to go to jail. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> what are you, you talking know this? about? I do know this. Yeah, because <laughs> American Completely films were not allowed in this China is from for a like very a long year time. Ago. This is very recent. Fight Club finally got released in China, and they made their own ending where they were like, "Well, crime cannot pay. You Tyler watch, Durden must you be can punished." Watch it. it ends with a freeze frame of Norton shooting himself, and then a text comes up that says, "Like." Thanks to all the clues, the authorities arrested Tyler Durden and he served time in an insane asylum. He died on the way back to his home planet. The end. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> his home planet? No, 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 it that's ends okay. with a note. It, it's basically a poochie level tacked on ending. It ends with a note to viewers that says, through the clue provided by Tyler, the police rapidly figured out the whole plan and arrested all criminals, successfully preventing the bomb from exploding. After the trial, Tyler was sent to a lunatic asylum receiving psychological treatment. He was discharged in 2012. This Perfect appears in the movie I, I after like it is revealed even like, that Tyler is not cured. a real person. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but the ending but of they, this movie... They, they had to, like, wrap for the day. Like, it was almost 5 o'clock. They yeah. were like, fuck, we forgot to do the Fight Club ending. Uh, they all went to jail. <laughs> yeah, also, they were writing this postscript on Twitter. They only had so many characters they could Tyler do. was rehabilitated by society. <laughs> Basically, a quote tweet on the movie. Um, no, but uh, the I... The ending? The, the ending feels mm-hmm. like literally what you're saying you of, like... a strange time in my life. Yes, and then, like... Two buildings collapse, or it's one building oh, that's many ways, many ways. Right. Right. Yeah. You're watching a bunch of buildings collapse out your high rise well, window. Being exploded. Yes. And then you're sort of just like, I guess this kind of puts things in perspective. <laughs> yeah. Um, How do you feel rewatching it? The Because, David, as you said, we can't watch this movie and not know that. I mean, this blew, blew my mind fake. opening night, of course. Mm-hmm. It, it's, I think it's a good twist, mm-hmm. obviously. Does it work when you rewatch the movie? I had this thought rewatching it just now. Like, is this a, it's almost just as rewarding now that you know? No, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's, it's more frustrating almost. Yes, go on. Well, I just feel like, because you're always like, as Anna was saying, like, so how is he like 
walking around while Tyler's having sex with her. Like, what is the POV that we're in? Very often you're like, is he actually doing this or is he imagined Tyler doing this? Yeah. And it's unclear in the movie kind of plays is fast this and happening loose, I would argue. at all? Or no, is he happening. upstairs with Marla? I think it depends. Imagining that he's also downstairs trying to not listen to it. Like when he's talking to Marla in the kitchen right. post That's the most devastating moment yeah. where he's like, what are you doing here? And she looks at him like very hurt because she's like, we've just been upstairs this whole time. Like... Like, I actually, she plays that moment quite well. She's very good. And it's very good to me, like, representation of, like, as much as he's, like, no one understands me. I am, you know, the Gen X narrator. I am mm -hmm. Jack's bile duct or whatever. It's like, no, you're just, like, an asshole who's not nice to right. the people around yeah. you. <laughs> like, and you're writing this off as, like, well, my insane alter ego best friend Tyler Durden is causing all this trouble. And Tyler Durden is just his evil, you know, male id, right? Uh-huh. Um, it's just that and like the, you know, when you see him later. Kind, it's not like a Sixth Sense twist where you're like, no. good God. They like, you know, like. It was perfect. They it's dodged every. It was there you all know, along. Right. Yes. You know, like, no, it's it's metaphorical. It's right? very metaphorical. Yes. yes. Um, it is obviously, I mean, this was my professor, James Annelsey, post-war American lit. Uh, okay. Shout out, James. Uh, his brag. big, his whole thing was like, watch the movie. Like, Ty, you know, Brad Pitt looking like the sexiest man who ever lived, dressed perfectly uh -huh. with washboard abs, yeah. is like looking at a Calvin Klein ad on the bus and being like, men are fed such, you know, lies that they have to aspire to. And he's like, this is like the funniest shit in the world, like uh -huh. that you have Brad Pitt saying this. Right. Like Brad Pitt is the, the most, most impossible ideal yes. and he's styled in the way that is like insane that yeah. any man would like be like, well, I could never dress like this. Ben, this what, ben what's the read on Tyler Durden's fashion? He is dressed in cheap clothes that you would get at vintage a vintage store. It's all yes. thrift store. Right. Like you know, Hawaiian shirts. Yeah. He at one point Slippers. is wearing like a, a tuxedo pants. He's got right? the, uh, the with bathrobe like, with like the ice creams on it. Yes. You know, all this shit where you're like, no one could ever pull this off. And he's like, and he has a, a, a chin goatee. Like he should look like the biggest idiot in the world. And you're like, he's so cool. It's spiky fucking he's like Mark McGrath tips, hair. Basically, yeah. Right? Uh, in, unless I'm mis misunderstanding this, I think Fincher said in the commentary that these sunglasses were what Brad Pitt's assistant was wearing on set. Uh -huh, and he was and just like, like, you should put those on. Uh-huh. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, but Ben, do you like his look? Absolutely. It was so deeply influential. I feel like uh, around this time, I definitely, me and all my friends started wearing uh, Dave's auto body sure, t-shirt. Absolutely. You know, with right. like... Anything Dickies with a pants. patch on it. Yep. yep. Like, oh, yeah, like absolutely. gas station attendant shirt, like, something like that. Just like shitty bowling jacket slogan t shirt. I mean, that's, the Knox right. that's Knoxville as well. That's yes. the other I mean, convergence like, of these. Totally. I mean, well, Knoxville right. is like fucking Z list Brad Pitt. Like, he's like, I've been trying to be Brad Pitt in Hollywood and no one will take my phone calls. But it's, what it's if I throw myself against it? Chaotic good you know, versus chaotic evil. Yeah, he's yeah, also right. like literally Tyler Durden, where like his friends are walking down the hallway and he's like, I'm just going to like push you into a giant hole. Right. And watch you get out of it. Yeah, the funniest man who ever lived. <laughs> but he's also kind of the hottest man who ever lived. Yeah, he's so fucking he's hot. He's so sexy. Yeah. But only he, once he has become this like jackass loser. Like, I, and then I, yes. anytime he shows up in a scripted movie, you're like, yeah, you're all right. You know? I just remember girls in my school when there was the poster of him shirtless, like, yeah. with the exactly sunglasses on. About. And they were just like, he's the hottest guy alive. And I was like, really? He is? Mm -hmm. Why were you confused? Because I didn't get it. You didn't get it. But you get it now. I was asleep. He thought men had My to look like Johnny open. Bravo. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Women want one thing and it's fucking disgusting. Do the monkey with me. Yeah. Tiny legs. <laughs> Tiny legs. Triangular torso. <laughs> yeah. It's like bigger than the rest of the 25 body. 25 inch tall hair. <laughs> when will we get our Johnny Bravo movie? Why don't you make a Johnny Bravo movie? Fucking The Rock I'm, was attached I'm, I'm to this. Aware. I'm aware. I'm uh, scabbing writing one right now. Thank God. Alex's new bit is that he's scabbing. <laughs> he keeps My new bit is not this. that I have done literally nothing for three months. <laughs> not that you're yeah. going that insane, I'm, not able to do anything. I'm definitely not going insane, but rather than doing nothing for three months is that I'm constantly working for studios under the radar as a scab, but which to be clear, you, I'm not. Is it scabbing if you've already gotten a Johnny Bravo waiver, which they've made very That's clear true. in the, the WGA, outlines of the This is very unknown, but the WGA granted Johnny <laughs> right. Bravo waiver. You went to the WGA and said, can I write a Johnny Bravo movie? And they said, no, we're on strike. Absolutely not. And you said, do the monkey with me. Anyway. <laughs> I had to like Google literally what is Johnny Bravo because this is after my time and what is something of his I could say. Mama. <laughs> Whoa, mama. 
Yeah, I was seeing Fight Club in theaters twice opening weekend while you guys were watching Johnny Bravo. We I just want to be, hit a great yeah, it's funny, true. And I, I want to be like, frank. You know, this is pretty profound, Johnny Bravo. Yeah. He's got a lot to say about yeah, that. masculinity. Like, <laughs> and I was making phone calls Saturday morning being like, you got to come see this movie with me. I'm not going to tell you anything about it. I saw it last night. We're all, I'm rounding up a posse and we're going tonight. How did, meanwhile, I was yelling at my brother down the hall. James, you got to get in here. Johnny Bravo's doing the monkey. This is going to change your fucking mind. How did you feel about the twist at the time? It blew your mind, well, mind. the first That's time you there saw the it. Day. Right. Yeah. But I mean, like, this is a time, you know, this is two months after The Sixth Sense. I know. Twists are hot. You're Especially right. the guy doesn't exist as a twist. It's just crazy. They fooled us twice in two months. Yeah. It's the same thing. Well, it's not. I mean, it's not literally, thing. but it is like, wait a minute. That guy's not real. Right. No one else can see that guy. Um, That's the same twist twice, 10 sure. weeks apart. I mean, no, I mean, you're, you're right that it's two big twisty movies of the same. You're, you're totally right. Um, Technically, the monkey is kind of a twist. Do the monkey with me? Yeah. Go on. Oh, because it's sort of like the twist. Good call. It's a solo dance. Oh, Thank you, Ben. Just, that's like, fine. You're ben, a bing, 10 comedy yeah. points. <laughs> it's a credit to like, I mean, again, this is like the pit magic. And like, I think we could all agree the mm -hmm. first half of the movie is better than the second half. Yes. Pitt's magneticism yes. is so, that 17.5 million is so well spent. Because yes. you can't take your eyes off him. Yeah. The, every time he's even near the center of the frame, that you can't even conceive that this guy is anything less than the sun around which everything in Fight Club orbits. Look, the whole thing with the 12 Monkeys performance, which gets him an Oscar nomination. Sure, it was right. everywhere. Plague of Madness. Um, and I do think I, I love I love that movie. It's a huge movie for me. Yeah. I watch that movie, that performance now, and I'm like, he's trying so hard. It's like a little much at he, times. He, Willis is Paul obviously the great performance needing there. Needing to show the work and needing to show the effort right. and in these I, early years. This yeah. is the good version of that performance yes. where it's like he's obviously he's playing the most obnoxious you know, mile a minute, like, you know, ultra charismatic guy, but he now feels effortless. Like it does no longer feel like... I think he, he feels effortless. I think it feels... Effortless to me. I, I think... It wouldn't uh, take much effort to get me in a mood, you know what I'm saying? Well, I know. But, I, I actually do know what you're saying. I think he gets better at letting this roll off of him more casually, but it's like one of those jackets where the water doesn't touch him. Yeah. I just think he... he gets to better versions of this, but this is the first moment where it's like, what well, you're saying, he's just undeniable. You're like, this is like the center of the universe. And you're watching him so closely. Yes. It's impossible to imagine. That you're, and then later you're like, oh, no, no one else really talks to him. And yeah. like, right. it's very like, you don't even think about that. You don't. Uh, partly Literally when he's not Marla, on screen, you are asking where is Tyler. Tyler. Uh, and then anytime Tyler is talking, everything he's saying is absolute, I'm sorry, nonsense. Like, like when he's putting the soap on his hand, uh -huh. the big soap scene, Anna burning was laughing, his hand, just laughing, and he's just like saying all this stuff, like you have to like hit rock bottom, and you know, like it's I'm the just most like, beautiful moment of your life, and you're what off somewhere are you talking missing. about. This is all fucking nonsense, but not everything, because I also think he has that thing that feels very of its time, where it's like I I know all of this like weird information that I dug up at the library that people you, you don't know. know here's about. how you make dynamite, yeah, all that stuff. Anarchist that sounds cookbook. cool because yes. he's Dis exactly. disinformation. He's the mm -hmm. one that's totally. like. They're lying to you, man. You don't understand. I mean, he's such an armchair philosopher. Right. Of the stoner. He's a Jack Shepard, if you will. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> he is. Absolutely. Uh, well, he is, he is, not he quite is, as yoked. He is but, without yeah. a paddle. <laughs> indeed. He is indeed. He is paddleless. Let me be frank. Um, he's just such an obnoxious Gen X armchair philosopher. Right, who keeps talking about how like men are slaves, waiting tables, pumping gas, you know, all this stuff. You're not like, a snowflake generation of men raised by women. Children this, of history. I wonder if another know. woman is what we need. This like, is the book that coins snowflake. It like it yeah. all stems out of this it, usage. It's, yeah. uh, it's just like so silly, the yes. stuff he's saying. And yet you are to, not your job. You're not your khakis. You're not how much money you have in all that Why do we know stuff. what a duvet is? And yet here we, yeah. we can quote everything he says because it is so simple. And he delivers it so well. Yeah, I agree with you. Everything he says on the in this movie, I think, is sort of like quasi horseshit. Viagra, and yet, Rogaine, Olestra. If this guy wanted to be my friend, probably even today, I'm I'd probably up. kind of be like, "Yeah, let's hang out." You yeah, know, absolutely. you know, while he's going on about duvets, I'm like, "You're so right." Let's go fucking thrifting. <laughs> you would love to hang out like, with this hit, guy. Let's hit fucking cars with bats right now. Okay, but, but the, the, go ahead. The other gen, I mean, in Gen X terms, like this guy, he's he is Tarantino. He's combining this like thrift store aesthetic with mm -hmm. this like, I got to take, man. Like, let me tell you what it's all about. I see the world this way, this, this period of history. So, and you're just like, in, that, in the 90s, people just took this very seriously. Yes. Um, but do any of you, I know mm -hmm. the answer to Griffin is from Griffin will be no. Want to know what hit, a duvet is. 
Yeah, I know what a duvet Do you want to hit each other in the face? No. Do you want to do punchings? Yeah. Which, yeah. of course, is the big... I would, I would do punchings. ...halfway into this movie, or maybe even a little before, just like, all right, come on, man, hit me. Like, Sometimes, you know, pain is, like, cathartic. I mean, you sound like Tyler yeah, Durden before. Right his, his apartment gets blown yeah, it's up. Before. It's like 40 minutes into the movie. Calls him yeah. up for drinks. They've met the one time on, on the, the plane. plane. Yep. Uh, I think in the book, they meet on a nude beach. Is that they correct? Do, uh, they do. That's right. And that's where he first sees him. Then right. They, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Fincher yeah. was basically like, I know that's a non-starter conversation. Why even start the fight over? They're never going to let me shoot that the way I want to. Right. Uh, so it I also, need to come up with like something it else. It actually doesn't make sense that the narrator that we know on screen would go to a nude beach. He seems it too doesn't. sort of pathetic. It doesn't make even. sense he would go to a beach. Exactly. No. To do anything fun. Like right. he, All he does is go to his dumb job and Zach Grenier was mean to him. Right. He's like the idea of and two people. And he travels. You wake up in Des Moines. You wake up in right. I was saying right. this yeah. to Anna, like having seen this movie a hundred times, mm -hmm. every line reading of every like small character is first of all, perfect. And second of all, burned in my brain. Mm -hmm. You guys like, show this over here. To my, I showed this to my man here. You liked it. Like that guy is great in the sure. conference room. The like, you know, a dildo case in point. The dildo, like that guy is great. The amyl nitrate lady at the support group, like all these. Everyone I've who seen has this movie five or six times, but I don't have that kind of. Everyone who has with these it. lines, yeah. you know, like I'm, I'm fucking Lou. Who the fuck are you? Like that every player yeah. who comes in for a small moment is great. Yeah. The all you know the uh, what you know well, now we know it's Holt McElhaney at the time. It's just like that big guy. Yeah. Yes. Like these guys are all you know build a house. Like all, every line reading like that in this movie hits so hard, and it's so funny. Even like the guy at the, you know, there's hope in the inner city. It's like <laughs> that guy, at the, like every line in this movie pops and it's so cynical and cartoonish in this Gen X way of like everyone in the world is so grotesque. Yeah. You know, uh, fat burned into his polyester shirt, almost modern art. Like with all of this stuff, it's just this, which car company do you work for? Like every one of these lines from all, yeah. all these like people that are in one scene are so good. Um, I agree with that. I yes, uh, yeah. And Meatloaf is incredible. We haven't talked. I mean, we, we haven't, haven't really talked about talk Meatloaf. Loaf. Credited He's got a great as face. Meatloaf a day, which right. I love. He keeps because there was a period His last where he name, of course is a day or right. Was. He's no longer with us. This was when he was really trying to like start a second act as like a pure character actor and not as like kind of a gimmicky cameo guy, right? And what his real name was Marvin Lee a day, right? Then he was Meatloaf. Michael Lee. Sorry, Michael Lee. Sorry. Oh, he was born oh, Marvin oh, Lee. Born Marvin that. Lee and went to Michael. I don't know. Um, I think he went Marvin through... Marvin to Michael to meet. He went through a period where he was like, I don't want to fucking be credited as Meatloaf. And this is sort of like the halfway point where he's like, I'm going to add a real last name on to it. Yeah, meatloaf, The Rock, a day. Right, right. Ben, is it okay that I like Bad Out of Hell? I think it's an awesome yeah, album. No, that it fucking is okay. Rules. Know, the it's amazing. Time. I don't know. It's corny. You know, Jim I mean, Steinman is corny. is corny. It is corny, but no, you got to give it up for his like I think, theatrically yes. and his show. Did you see the Meatloaf musical? Uh, no, it never came to Britain. I mean, or America. It, it never came a, to. It, it was on Broadway for like two years. Yeah, recently. Here. 2019? Yeah, I was embarrassed that oh, I missed it. Oh, Bad Out of Hell the Musical. Yeah. yeah. You're right. It was right before the pandemic? Yeah, because I remember it was playing in Toronto one year that I was in Toronto and I kept like Seeing it and being like, should I just duck out for a battle in the hell? Meatloaf yeah. is very good. Battle in the hell is good. And Meatloaf is good. So I, effective in this. It's he's really, very effective. Yeah. In this. I mean, that, you know, the sort of supposed physical grotesquery of him is a little bit like very Gen X y and snarky. Yes. Bitch yes. tits is like a very dumb phrase that even mm -hmm. at the time I hated when people said. Me too. It, yeah. It's annoying. But. Like, again, I just associate with this movie so strongly as well. Like, you know, you know it's the first, you know, what's a Bob had the bitch tits. Like, that's the first line in the book, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Maybe. I think, I think it just helps that he's such a genuine, warm presence. Yeah. Right? yeah. That's that's the thing. Yeah. His face is so nice. Yeah. And so open. And yeah. Yeah. But even like when he's like, you can cry, Cornelius. Right. Like, it's, it's so it's, sad. You're like, this is the first. Uh, guy who's been able to make this dude feel anything for a while, right? Like Tyler Durden's whole thing is like, you need to get punched in the face to feel something. But like Meatloaf gets through to him just as hard just through hugging him and listening to him. It's the line they say, which is like, people listen to you differently if they think you're dying. Right. Yeah. Um. And and Meatloaf like sees him, hears him, acknowledges him. What do we think of uh, Jared Leto? I want to talk Leto. Lido. I like to see him get punched a bunch. Should we so, take so, a walk on the on the Lido deck? I have <laughs> to say, 
I still maintain this opinion. I'm pro Lido. Always <laughs> have been. <laughs> what? No, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Bounced off the backboard. I'm joking. I'm joking. Always will be. You always will be what? I'm sorry. Pro Lido. Pro Lido at all, at all times? No, but like. Because you might want to be frank about that yeah. one. Yeah. Too. Do you like his cult work? <laughs> yeah. I do. Yeah. And I really like his band. Yeah. Jesus. No, Morbius. Like, we're talking like Norton was... Jared Leto has a Swiss cheese recipe. There's some holes. Yes. I, <laughs> you just, were very amped for Morbius or in the light. Morbius. Right. Because Morbius felt like a movie made for you to cover on blank check where it's like, yeah. what is this? Yeah. This yeah. came out? You guys are doing Espinosa, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just feel like we're talking Norton at the time, right? He has all uh -huh. these... For me, yeah. Leto, my so-called life, Catalano, we love that guy. Sure. He's so sure. cool. Of course. By, yeah. by this point, Early 90s he's in this run. Uh-huh. He'd, he'd kind of made an American quilt. He'd run. He'd been a boy uh, the, without limits. <laughs> without limits, he's in Prefontaine, but uh, you get but it. Like this, fuck. like for he me, he trod the thin red line. Mm. This, he heard the urban legend. This American Psycho mm -hmm. and Requiem for a Dream. Yeah, like okay, Vanity Fair. Can and how interrupted? I know you're not including that, but he has those four movies that are all about like disaffection. You, Vanity Fair can have Norton. After these three movies, I was like, this is the guy. Uh huh. This is the guy. Right. After those three, you guys are all like you're all one year too young to have seen. No, 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 no. What I was, was so special about him, especially I just post Requiem. Loved him. As a young man who and was he's so good in American Psycho. As a young man, he's good he in American Psycho. He's, he's good, so in, good I would, in Requiem for a Dream. He's good in all those movies. He's he's well. I think he's well suited to. Those I think films. we do make the he's argument like, in, the, in our next episode that Panic Room's his best performance. He's great in Panic Room. He's, he's great in Panic right? Room. Yeah. Yeah. Highway was. You know, you kind of like tip your hat to that one as a little, uh, you know, uh, 2002. I don't uh -huh. know. Art, I don't uh, even know what that artifact is. with fucking Selma Blair and Jake Gyllenhaal with the goggles. You don't know Highway? It's sort of a VHS about? classic. What is he talking about? This is such a, a VH. I don't think there's any 2002 VHS class. I mean, <laughs> DVD classic. Sorry. You know, a, a rental store classic. You made that Photoshop right now. <laughs> I've never <laughs> seen this image before. <laughs> and then like in 2004, when he's in Alexander, you're like, sure. I remember there was this sort of brief notion of like, hey, could Leto get Oscar buzz? Are we like ready for like some big supporting turn from him. And then after that is he's when just he's like Simpsons going to me. away. It's like, he always will have that 99 to 2000 run mm -hmm. that no matter what, I'm like, yeah, but he was in American Psycho and Requiem for a Dream in the same year. Even with the cat fucking head? Especially with the cat head. He looked awesome. You don't want to dress up like a giant white cat? He took the head off and he had his normal head inside. He looked like a mascot. I just like, I, I, but this was kind of like, you know, this is him doing a great thing. He's like, look, I want to be number 11 in this no, insane I, I movie. Think his appearance in this film is quite effective. Angel right. Face or whatever Angel his face. name is and just Angel get face. like, Pong. he has like five lines. He has five lines right. and half the movie he has crazy makeup of, you know, basically like the worst black guy you've ever seen. I yeah. wanted to destroy something beautiful. He's under control, yes. sir. Um, but, uh, but I love him in this movie. Yeah. He's a great presence. I, I agree. I do think Panic Room is, is like Fincher being like, Having just worked with you, I think it's really great to abuse you on screen. I just yes. wish that you're that the kind people just like react to you. Similar to Fincher and Pitt, like why no more Fincher Lido? Why no more Fincher Lido? Like, he could have been Jill and Hall in Zodiac. What? He'd be terrible. He's I'm not, not saying he'd be better. I'm not saying he'd be better, but you could see Fincher being like, yeah. we've made a couple movies together. Yeah, but but that, that's what I'm saying. By 2007, even you're like oh, he's doing Chapter 27. Oh, boy, he, it's like <laughs> <laughs> he, his fucking leprechaun gold is like melting in his hand. He's got nothing. Like when he came, and you know when he came back after Chapter 27, he makes two one movie before Dallas Buyers Club. He makes Mr. Nobody. Yeah. Uh, Harmony, you know, not Harmony. He Crito, was focusing on uh, Jacko Van Damel. Yeah. What's the name of the band? Fucking Thirty Seconds to Mars. I hate to even say it. It's acid on my tongue. <laughs> Well, speaking of music, can we talk Fight Club music? Sure. Yes. Can we talk Dust Brothers? Can we talk Please Dust do. Brothers? Can I actually, actually, there's a really good quote about the Dust Brothers. Yes. Uh, his Dust. first uh, choice to score this film was Tom York. Mm -hmm. He went to Tom York. It was like this, you know, I'm thinking, okay, computer. Like, you know, I want your music for this. And Tom York was like, I'm busy. We had just done an album. I didn't want to do it. And he sort of regrets it now. He's like, I see the film and I go, oh, you know, would have been fun. But would have been me. So instead, he throws it to the Dust Brothers. What are the Dust Brothers best known for at this point? Three things, in my opinion. Um, they produced Paul's Boutique. The, uh, okay. You know, Beastie mm -hmm. Boys sort of like kind of the, the thinking man's Beastie Boys album, right? Mm -hmm. Totally sample based. Right. Produced Odelay, the Beck breakthrough album that sure. I feel like is sort of a huge deal in the sort of all late 90s. Uh -huh. Produced Mbop. 
One of the did, one of the definitive. Did pop not see that twist coming. Yeah, did not see that coming you're gone. either. And Bob, you're, you're not there. What Very was the true. name of the the band? Hanson. Hanson. Yes. Middle of, of nowhere. Here's my advice to you if you're ever driving your car on a highway, put on Mbop. You will look at the speedometer and be like, I'm going 140 miles an hour. And this then, song is liquid cocaine. And then let go <laughs> of the steering so wheel <laughs> and crash into a car and let that then slide down a hill. If you actually put, Mbop, you if you time Mbop with that scene in Fight Club, it works out perfectly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the funny thing about Dust Brothers, uh, according to one of the brothers, uh, uh, Michael Simpson and Don. John King, not Don King. Um, Simpson says, uh, David said he wanted music that sounded like it was from white guys who thought they were funky, but really weren't. I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> but that's okay. that's that's the vibe. I feel like that's your genre at this time, David. You know, that's, that's your like Brit techno. Jamiroquai. Yeah. I mean, read me for filth. Are we, we going to talk about hip hop Sims? We might. Okay. <laughs> I forgot about that until just now. I might keep it in my pocket for another year. Uh -huh. I think you never this, want to tell me what that's This about. is more of a trip hop movie. Yeah. Sure. Oh, this sure. is the moment of, of like fucking tricky and, yeah. you know, left field and those kinds mm -hmm. of guys. Ben, are you a Dust Brothers or a Chemical Brothers guy? Do you want to keep hope alive? I am a huge Chemical Brothers guy at this time. <sighs> you of prove the my two point. options, I guess I'm going to have to go with Chemical Brothers. They're the fucking greatest. And the music in this movie works very well in this movie. It is dumb, terrible music. I, it's very I, silly. I gotta say, I've never really like, listened it, to the score isolated. It sounds I guess like I being in like a crowded Thai restaurant. <laughs> wow. But is it an authentic, like sort of like <laughs> Thai restaurant on Roosevelt <laughs> Avenue, you know, or no, is it no. like sort of a shitty no, Manhattan? It's like Thai a Thai restaurant, restaurant that has purple lights <laughs> and like a like a bunch of aquariums. <laughs> sure, sure. Do you like the Dust Brothers score for Fight Club, Griffin? I think it works. I think I think it's it, I I basically I think Alex yeah. just nailed it to a wall, and I can't. Finch is very interesting in that. that he has great music obviously in his early movies like David Shire's Zodiac score is so mm -hmm. good right I love uh, the Howard Shore Panic Room score but then like when he gets Reznor and Ross mm -hmm. for Social Network it's kind of the first time he's like okay I've found like my composers I like they will guys. now do me yeah. you know for do everything I do yeah. right yeah. before then he's always kind of like thinking of soundscapes and right. stuff right I guess Seven is also Shore I guess he used Shore a fair amount yeah. in the in the beginning. Yeah, but it yeah. did no, I agree with you that it didn't totally crystallize as like this is a key working relationship until Reznor arrived. Right. Um yeah. but okay, so the music sounds like a Thai restaurant. Anything else? There's the soundtrack. Like, well the obviously. music on I mean, the soundtrack. We ha we have it on CD at home. Iconic soundtrack. Great. I just feel like as the middle of the movie goes on and there are these kind of montages, mm -hmm. fight club building montage. It gets bigger and bigger. There's more people coming than the project mayhem montages. They're all set to like very trip hoppy techno sure. background beats, which is became iconic. It kind of became the sound of this kind of disaffection. I feel like I didn't get enough about fighting. Gr Griff, you don't want to fight. No, I if you guys want to fight, you can fight. I no, I don't fight. I don't either. I, I think maybe that is where this movie Bonus also episode, lost maybe? me. Maybe a slightly. Patreon episode. Yeah. It's just fight we just fight, you know you guys See, could just have a fight club i'm like i'm like so on ben what ben was saying we're, we're in my, at my most mad my fantasy is punching a wall as hard as i can i like it never manifests even in my mind in a hypothetical way as attacking another person because i don't like uh fighting now right. i will say i have yeah. gotten my ass kicked uh -huh. i've been in fights but not in the way where i'm like yeah and then Same. i fucking took that guy Same. down no i got punched in the face so what are you yeah, thinking i have also been the... punched in the face yeah. the movie's but kind of like, like that no, I hated it. It hurt, and then you know what? It kept hurting. It keeps hurting for like a couple days after. Let me ask this: Who punched you? Uh, a person punched me on the face in uh, the on? street. In the face on the street. There's okay. a random person in the face on, on the street. street. Uh, yeah, a random person punched me in the face uh, when I was coming home from work one night when I was like 22 years old. Drive by in, punching. See, I had a park slope knockout game. Like, no, no, you know what? Actually, yeah. that was me. Oh shit! Oh, oh yeah, fuck. really? <laughs> <laughs> can I say forgot that I new... used to walk around park slope punching people? Can we say the new bit you started doing, Alex? I don't. You, you could be referring to any number. I of know things it's right too. Now. It's a fucking thick soup. What are you <laughs> yeah. getting out of that ladle? You and David live fairly close to each other. We, yes, that's you will true. see David like oh, a block yes, away yes, and take a, a picture bit. of him from behind, like a <laughs> creep shot, and just text it to him an hour later. You'll see me like on a bike. Yes, and, that, like, and we'll not reveal were. in the moment no. that you see him. We'll it's just funnier send the to me to see you on a city bike from a block away and take a picture rather than yelling. Right. Yeah. Right. And then just send you these like zoomed in pictures of you from a thousand feet the, away. The zoom makes it feel creepy. No, I take the picture, yes. right. I zoom in, I do a screenshot I understand. of it yes. very blurry. You have a distinct right. size and have a recognizable gait. I can't deny it. And you're just out and about a lot. 
I do love to be a man about town. I am a man about pushing town. a stroller, riding a bike. These are things I do. Ar- arguing. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> arguing with people doing construction loudly. <laughs> Was I arguing with someone? No. Okay. It's like the idea of you <laughs> just me being out. like, "Hey, keep it down." Yeah, just going. I don't, out I don't and think being I've ever done the that. worst kind of the worst kind of pest. <laughs> New you Yorker. call and complain about it. You've done that when we had our construction. Well, trip. sure. When the construction yeah. was so powerful, I didn't call and complain. I called and asked, "What are you doing yeah. next door?" You basically that is shaking the foundation broke down of a skyscraper. And I do, said, I do like my David my cry. David sneak attack photo. Bit. It's it's, it's a, a really good, good bit. Yeah, um, I'll keep doing it. Yeah. Fight Club. Fight Club. Uh, so they're punching each one, other. I feel like once the Fight Club is going well, the movie is flying. It's fun. Sure. You have early on in the Fight Club the scene you reference where the mobster is like, get out of my basement, and Brad just sort of lets him. I feel like beat that's mid. I feel like at that yeah. point, Project Mayhem is close. Like, the, I guess so. The Fight Club itself, I feel like, is not lasting for. I guess it's a fair Because they move in together. That stuff is all fun. Yeah. He's not going to the groups. He's feeling good. The house. I love <laughs> the house. Been working on that for 20 20- Working on what? Alex sent a text text message. Um, uh, There's the you have to get in a fight. Are you going to say what I did? (laughs) Alex? How did you make this? I did work fast. Uh, Griffin has taken the DVD cover to Highway with (laughs) Jerry Leto. Griffin has taken, first of all, we should say, a photo (laughs) of the DVD snap case cover (laughs) for Highway. Not like a... With a flash. Not like a JPEG of... The yeah, cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bro, because for this to work, it has to be a physical, it can't be a poster, it has to be a DVD copy. And he has put Deadpool on all three cast members. David, can you just narrate the poster for Highway? You know, I love when you narrate a poster. Uh, do you want me to narrate the actual poster? No, no, no. The 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 poster. And you have to read the tagline, you have to do the whole thing. <laughs> okay, so. Three Deadpools. So. Uh, <laughs> the poster is, uh, it says Jared Leto, Jake Gyllenhaal, Selma Blair. Then there's a Deadpool, and on Leland, his head on his shoulder is a Deadpool, and then behind him is Deadpool, <laughs> and then it says Highway, and the tagline is, it started as a desperate escape and became the wildest ride of their lives, DVD video. And then there they are on a car on the there desert. That's what I say. The bottom other right, people, yeah. I will say. You got to put really small Deadpools. Tiny Deadpools. Tiny Deadpools. Okay, this, I'll do a second draft. This I must, is why I wanted a notes round. Yeah, this is great, Griffin. I must <laughs> say that I worked in video stores for the entire time after this came out. I have never seen this DVD this or like heard of this DVD movie before. cult classic. I know. I, I have the never goggles, once I just, seen a physical copy of this DVD in my when life. when Gyllenhaal was like, sort of like Donnie Darko. This is his, bu- his, his bubble boy face. He's got yeah. the glasses. That's what I'm saying. You you were like, oh, what else has Donnie Darko been in? Like, well, October Sky, you know, winning family film. Sure. What else? I don't know. He was a weird freak in these movies, Bubble Boy and Highway. No, just Bubble Boy. Okay. Um, the Fight Club is ben, going. what do you think of the house? Paper Street. Paper Street oh, House. I, Very I, cool. I do. I'm the like, worst. Where you want to live. Yeah. Your, your mind that palace that age, is I that was house. Like, oh, this is basically the aspiration for right. where I'm going to settle down you as an adult. You want brown water coming out of every faucet. Absolutely. When it rains, the basement fills up with water. Right. You can just go outside and break bottles. You just smoke cigs and just throw it on the floor when you're done with it. Just discard trash, just, uh, you know, where wherever. Obviously, there are, uh, as Fincher says, there are no Victorian homes with 18-foot ceilings on the West Coast. So they basically built this thing. Like, uh-huh. uh, beyond that, they mostly did location shooting. But the Paper Street House is their creation. It's a very cool creation. It's very it's in the creation. mold of from the m- warped mind who brought you seven. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's like, what is, because where is Fight Club set? Nowhere. Yeah. Nowhere yeah. and everywhere. America, USA. That's right. That's where it's There's set. American flags everywhere in this movie. Mm-hmm. There's even an American flag hanging up in the house when it's Project Mayhem house. Well, it was two years before 9-11. We had to, you know, never forget. Yes. We're, we're trying to make sure we remember. No, you right. see, David, before. that's satire. Yeah. That there's all these Wait American flags. Are you saying these guys don't love America? Uh, the scene where Tyler is in the bathtub and uh, Norton is kind of like bandaging himself up, nursing his wounds. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget what they're talking about in that scene. There's some important information about conveyed in that scene. Yeah, sure. Fight, fight my dad. Right, right, right. right. That's graduated, what it was. Graduated, he told me, get a right. job. Called him yes. five years later, told me, get married. They shot that scene on like a, a children's playground underneath like a rusty swing. Okay. And it was like a thing that that Fincher was really proud of where he's like, oh, it's like interesting that they're having this conversation about how their fathers fucked them up in a child's mm-hmm. environment, whatever. And he watched the scene. And he was like, "This sucks. Right. This sucks." Too and I obvious. think this is important dialogue. And I thought it was so clever. And I was patting myself on the back. And they were about to tear the house down. Uh huh. Uh-huh. And whoever the producer, one of the producers, was like, "Is there anything else you still need in this environment?" Right. And he was like, "That's a good question. Are there any scenes I fucked up 
that could be plussed up by using the space that's Plop interesting. Them back in. And he came up with it and he said it was like a key moment in his career where like the things that bug him the most in the movie. Does Pitt have the towel on his head because he'd shaved his head at that point? Not impossibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There Quite you go. Quite probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But he was like, I, I, mean, I would plan Jameson everything. Out. What? No, yeah, I plan everything out so perfectly. Yep. Good joke. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the things I hate the most in my movies are things where I had convinced myself of them being correct and refused to acknowledge it later when it wasn't working. And he was like, that was really big for me to in that moment recognize, like, sometimes you just need to shake a scene up. Sometimes you've gotten too settled in your head and you need to just like throw it up in a different way and approach it from a different angle. Should we talk gay text and subtext now that we're on the scene. I think it's very important that was to the other big thing uh, he note said. how fucking right. gay this movie right. is. He was like, I needed a scene to show like way. how devoid of self-consciousness and embarrassment Tyler was. Right. He's incredibly, uh, he feels sort of omnisexual, even though in this movie he's also like an alpha who fucks the narrator's crush, right? And you just know. like incredibly comfortable in his own skin. Yes. Which is uh, pretty good skin. Sure. Good skin. All right. Yeah. Stop trying but to skin Brad Pitt. In the Pitt. sort of like obvious <laughs> attraction that narrator has to yes. Tyler. Like, is that ultimately just about this? Because this is like, it, okay, so if he's in love with himself, uh -huh. is this an but, antithesis of the movie? Is this like deep solipsism? I think he's in love with an idea of who he wishes he could be. Yes, I think that's true. But I do also think he, rec he resent, you know, Tyler does also represent his like latent fear of sexuality. Sure. Right? Like in general. Because like, like yeah. as the movie yeah. goes on, Tyler growing apart from him. Including the comfort that comes with being Project like, Mayhem is like, he's acting, he's acting sexuality. spurned. Sure. Yes. Yeah. He's acting very, but he's like, why didn't you tell me about this? I thought right. we, who are these other people? I thought, I thought it was right. you and me. Right. And it it's also the same way all, when she's, when he thinks that Tyler's fucking Marla. Marla. hundred percent. Right. It's and the it's thing all, he's afraid to Yeah. Do. He's jealous he of her, not of him. And he won't even admit that he is attracted to her. Or to Tyler. Well, it's, it's all part of the twist, obviously. But yes, mm -hmm. I do think it's also right. It's his sort of self-hatred and his like, you know. Yeah. Well, the other thing that's in, is much like American Psycho, like decades later when the author was like, I, I'm gay. I was gay when I wrote, like I've been sure. in a relationship since I wrote this book. Mm -hmm. Sure. It took the supposed subtext of people being like, you know, Fight Club kind of gay. And it was like, well, no, like Fight Club questioning masculinity from all angles, including sure. the idea of like, well, why do these guys think, you know, why would you go watch it? Why, why would you, if, if you're not attracted to men, why do we want to watch these cut, beautiful men box each other? Right. How can you watch that and not be in awe of their body? The movie's I, kind of asking that question. Well, and then most of the other guys who are there are gross. They're just normal. What, once again. Yeah, they're just like suits who, you know, the, you know, stuffed shirts who are coming alive, like punching each other. When the first Jackass movie came out and it did well and the young audience rushed out and then it was lingering at the box office and Paramount was like, what's going on here? And they were like, it has been claimed by the gay community. They love that it is a movie about a bunch of dudes who are really comfortable being naked around each other and just like trying shit. Yeah, there's they, covered in semen and shoving things into each other's asses. Right. And there's like no judgment in it. Um, Fincher, uh, this is a funny point, just apparently when Fox started uh, doing lots of ads for Fight Club during wrestling, uh, Fincher says, like, I was like, this movie is pretty homoerotic. Are you sure you guys want to do this? But at this point, no one's listening to him. Right. Basically. But that's the thing, like, two things about that. One, so is wrestling. So what does he care? Two, sure. All, there's all I don't these, know if watch a lot but there's all these quotes of him being like, oh, you know, and we should talk about the marketing where he's just like, oh, you know, you're, that's not how you market it. And it's like, if he really believes in the message of the movie, shouldn't he be like, yeah, market it to people that don't know what's going to hit them. Mm -hmm. right. Get them in the theater to see the bare knuckle boxing. But Fincher... They, Things is, they're getting. And then it's a two-hour screed against capitalism. Because they were basically all right. like... All right, Griffin. What? You just you, said, you asked me to do it. I didn't ask you to do I, that. Let me see. And I did. Oh, he it put, looks good. Yeah, it looks great. I did it pretty quickly. Devils. It's a quick turnaround. I would uh, like to see this printed as a poster the next time I'm here. Okay, you guys have nothing on the walls. Uh -huh. I'd like to see a printed out version. We're getting stuff framed. Once Upon a Highway, the Deadpool cut. Hey, Once Upon a Highway. Can I say, Alex, uh, you came here recently. Ben was helping you do some other work for a different project, yeah. right? And you uh, casually uh, placed on our shelf a VHS copy of Bad Company. Well, that wasn't that reason. That was months and months and months ago. You're right. I'm I did sorry. do that. This was about six months ago. I was also, I was also here two days ago. You were. That's a Ben copy, right? The Small Soldiers? I did yeah. not bring Small yeah. Soldiers. But I placed a VHS com copy of Bad Company, David's favorite movie of that respective year. Right. You said that My that was the bottom movie. of your letterbox on 2002. So you placed it on the shelf. I happened to have an, a, DV a tape of it laying around of that course, I didn't think I was going to ever revisit. It is no longer the Wild Film, obviously. 
What's the bottom? It's not quite This is how this came up. Yeah. Oh, right. I was like, is it worse than so, Bad Company? So I knew so, I had a tape that right. wasn't getting rewatched anytime soon. I thought yeah. I bet David would enjoy that. So you place sure. it on the shelf and you go, I just want to know how long it will take for him to notice. Yeah, this was in March. Yeah. Uh, has Had never noticed. No. And David will walk in and I'll after record, sometimes glance. he'll look at the shelf and go like, hey, Griffin, what new stuff have you put up Right, here? like what's right? this? What's but this? just never noticed it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Max Mangella, mutual uh, friend of the pod, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, when he was going to visit you, mm -hmm. uh, he came, swung by here, and on the way out, he went like, "Oh, that's funny, you have Bad Company on VHS." Immediately, Max noticed. Max good, noticed. Good. Well, Max probably owns a Bad Company shirt because right. all he wears are like <laughs> shirts from shitty movies from the two thousands that he buys on eBay. But pinged it immediately, and then David was like, "Why is that here?" Okay, good. Was that on mic? No. Damn. Well, Sorry. now. I don't. I know we have zero time for this, but we do. I'm still we gonna. Time. We have still time. gonna we have set time. it up. We have time. Uh, do you notice the, behind the hat? Seems to be a gift here for me. Correct. I. I. I Christmas gift. Have a Christmas gift for you. Sure. Christmas is, in July. Of course. Christmas Very belated. Well, you know what? July. My birthday was last week, so we can. Perfect. Well, fold it in. Would you like to open it right now? Yeah. Take a little pause from the Fight Club. I think so. Yeah, we've been too I focused wanna, on the movie. We him. have been focused on the movie. I yeah. want to. After this, we should just talk Project Mayhem and the second. Sure. Yeah. yeah not even half. Like the back part. third of the movie. But this has been sitting here for about six months. Right. And when, the right. other times you've come to the studio, you said, "I, I don't want to open it. I want to wait to open That's it right. until I'm on mic." Oh my god. <laughs> Okay, it's a VHS, unsurprising. Oh, well, no. I mean, you know, this is a vital addition to any I thought I finally was rid of this movie. No. no, no. <laughs> it's, it's a VHS, VHS of, for of the Razzie numbers. winner. Lucky Unopened. Sealed. Sealed. Yeah. Yeah. Sealed. Now, Sealed. Now, also, now, if you open that, there will be a curse on your family for yes. seven years. I don't want that. Now, I also, <laughs> when I brought the Bad Company tape, I brought the Lucky Numbers DVD that right. I had to buy to right. get the Nora Ephron the commentary. ripped commentary. So I've yeah. had like a nice four-month break from having a copy of Lucky Numbers in yeah. my house. Back in your life. Thank, Thank you, you, Ben. You're yeah. welcome. Where did you get? Did you buy this online or did you find this? Uh, my landlord. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Yeah, my I'm landlord sorry. had a like garage sale and he oh. had a ton of He had a sealed lucky numbers. Yeah, he had a I ton guess he of never VHS. Wanted to break Beautiful. The seal. Beautiful. And I saw that and I was like, I know just the guy who's gonna need That's this. one of those movies we covered during the early pandemic where I'm yeah. like, I know I watched it. I sort of remember things about it, but like <sighs> Like kind of forgotten about. Could it. be time for a revisit. And it's like one of Michael our longest episodes. It. Well, of course it was because we were just. What the fuck else were we doing? Yeah, <laughs> could be time for a revisit. We have two copies of it in 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 the mutual lives of this of this space. I want to say something just to pin this for for a distant future that may never Thank come. You, ben. You're welcome. Just because the fact that you got this from your landlord is so fascinating. Mm -hmm. Your landlord is a fascinating figure. Oh, there are things God. that happen in your building that people would not believe how on brand they are to the Ben Hansley universe, <laughs> and we can never talk about them yeah. because if we did, you'd be able to Google it back and figure out where Ben lives. Absolutely. And if you ever leave, if you ever move, yes. we will someday reveal those things, but you will not believe the things that happen right underneath Ben that Ben has no part in. Yeah. It's just happenstance that it, it really aligns with my vibe. Absolutely. And just having a sealed VHS copy of Lucky Numbers fits into that as well. Yes, it yes. does. It does indeed. Alex is in the bathroom. Alex is in the bathroom. Do you David, want to say anything David, else David, how about do you Fight feel Club? like the episode's going? Pretty good, yeah. honestly. The, the Clockwork Orange episode was so... Like, a lot of people texted me with concern after it aired. Oh, because we were ganging up on Right. It. And and I responded to all those people being like, oh, I I think that episode is funny. Like, I think, sure. you know, my frustration is like, you know, I'm playing into it a little bit. It's funny. Yeah. But like, I got a lot of concerned text messages. Yes, there was a, there was a, there were many threads of like, has the show gone too far? Right. And then of course, right, our Reddit and all that. But I'm saying like people who actually know me were in contact. Right. And then my brother remarked, he's like, there's this moment where... Like David says, like, this is not funny anymore. And Ben says, like, it's not. And he says it unhumorlessly. Like Ben is just like yeah. saying that. And Charlie's like, I was really proud of him for leaving that in. Like, that's kind of a it's kind of an intense moment, like to to just sort of like well, not cut out of the show. Was to go in and break the bit. We, we it was get... not the intent. For us to break the bit? Yes. I don't think so. Alex and I, I can fucking pull up the text. Pull we were like, text. this is we're gonna break the bit break i mean obviously you wanted to go as hard as you could i know that we're talking about project mayhem well in a way in yes. a way <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> no, we're talking about your last appearance oh, on yeah. this show okay. on the Clockwork Orange episode. Like and we shouldn't be too self-reflective. Universally yeah. beloved and right. not at all scrutinized appearance. Right, no. right. And then since then, we have made fun of you on this show a few times and you've texted us angrily, which is, which is, which is fun. Oh, angrily in quotes. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if you, did you make fun of me or did you just kind of... Uh, well, we kind of like, you know, ah, Alex, I can't, I can't remember. I honestly. just remember at some point you were like... Uh, Griffin was like, yeah, you know, Alex, uh, running a bit into the ground and you were like, yeah, no shit. Right. Well, yeah, no shit. Yeah, no, um, it was my stated intention to burn it down. Okay, I fair came, enough. I came fair into enough. that episode yeah. and these movies are obviously very unified. This is kind of the clockwork orange for a, another generation. Yes, yes. It's, the, it's the Edgelord trilogy. I came into well, that. Halloween I, less no, so maybe. No, we'll but, find another yeah. Edgelord one. Right. I came in being like, Jumping Jack. Yeah, here's my Project Mayhem homework. I want to find a bit and burn <laughs> it. I want to yes. find a bit and burn it down. Right. Uh huh. Well, I, I want to destroy something that. beautiful. It, it was saved actually, my life. Thank it was. You. It was a yes, quiet good. act of uh, of mercy. Of, yeah. <laughs> Quietly, it was to put you. It was putting the bit out of its misery. To be fair, you had already said, "We're doing boil," and I said, "Huh, oh, it's going to be tough." And you were like, "I have told Griffin the bit has to not exist." Right. I, and when we do I, a British filmmaker. I'm not sure about this timeline on whether that you was told me on the drive prior. there. Absolutely. So I knew that it was okay. Absolutely. On our drive to these guys Ben's are now house. getting a lot of credit for basically being annoying. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, you're like, and, I, and you said, I have, <laughs> said, I have <laughs> said, when we do this filmmaker, I cannot deal with this. Right. And I thought, great. I mean, I, I certainly was, yes, I was preparing for the the ultimatum. Alex what I mean. He said, I, I can't find the text now, but it was, we have to go harder than we've ever gone before. We I have to remember. break. It was bit. on a text with the two of you. Oh, okay. Ben wait, was, let me let, see let, if I can let, find let's it. Let's mention Ben was in on it. Yeah, Ben was in on it. Uh, yeah, yeah, but then Ben wasn't happy. You were uh, not happy. I was not. After I the episode we, was over, you were like, that was too much. And like, you know, well, I Ben's, feel bad for David. Ben has a beating heart. He's a sympathetic figure. Very true. I'm all He's about like pie. the, you know, the the anarchy of it. The content. Right. Burn you it down. Watch the world burn or whatever. What is another Edgelord movie you could do? What's another Edgelord classic from this time for mm. you? Uh, for, for me? Mm -hmm. I will think about that. Okay. Like, like another, a movie like, like Fight Club where you were an like, angry oh young man God. movie. Yes, like I have to see this over and over again. I mean, like, American Psycho is one. Sure, it's funny because I, I think that's that movie's also satirical and yeah. No, I think that movie's from excellent a, from I, like a, a gay's perspective. That is like, well, yeah, I the people who love this that are wrong Club. about what they love about it. Sure, I mean, obviously, a film it's literally with, making, a film and book this with famously if, insane yes, fans. If you yes. much like Fight Club, if you take this at face value, you are a fool and you are missing the point. A good edgelord movie of that time. What's what's this? No, this this text is pretty incredible. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, I'm gonna play uh, the box office game in like ten minutes. Forty five. Have no. all Project Mayhem. Yeah, Ben, um, I told Griffin this uh, the other day, but be prepared to go hard as hell with the England bit during Clockwork Orange episode. <laughs> I'm serious. It's the most British movie you've ever covered. We need to go so far beyond with it that David loses his mind. And Ben's response is, "I fully accept this invitation to take things too far." Like every 20 Not minutes. Not hearing break. Not hearing the word well, break. Well, here's the word break. If only we could have break, away glass, and a pipe to smash as well. Well, that would have been good if you'd done that. But that's a reference to something else. You were not trying to break the bit. We were, we were just to trying to make me mad. We were but trying it was, to break it was, the a, it was a, a benefit of running something into the ground. And then, uh, hey, look, Friday, August 26, 5 or 9 p.m. Really don't feel like that could have gone any better <laughs> vis a vis <laughs> the bits. <laughs> Apparently, I was very pleased with how that went. <laughs> but the funny thing is, like, I feel like some people said, like, to me, like, or, you know, you saw, like, people I feel were, like, like, I seem very exasperated now, and I'm not, and it was People funny. were, like, nagging Like, me. I think people really think that I'm, like, mad that's about the, this. That's exactly right. right. That people right. And thought I'm, that. I'm not. And I'm then not. I was getting you in on this. People were, because I don't have any other form of social media you can at me about other than on Instagram. And people were... Yeah. adding me being like what the fuck man like sure, sure and sure, then sure, you sure. were like hey come on and then there's this notion that's like man david was just so mad we got in the car yeah continued talking about the post home alone career of macaulay calkin as we had done on the drive right. we bands. were basically like unpause <laughs> you, turn, you turned up the prodigy <laughs> we, talked, yeah. we talked about our daughters and yes. just laughed and goofed of course as though this had never happened of course it wasn't like all right you ready to drive home and you said actually i have to go a different way Oh, you, right. You, I was you, like, you can get no, out Alex, walk. I won't be driving you home today. You can yes. get out and walk. <laughs> right. <laughs> I just want to be clear. It was all in good fun. Of course. Because I, like on. Tyler Durden, enjoy the chaos. I yes. viewed the bit as like the credit companies. You just have to blow them up. Yes. Because otherwise we'll never be free because we're a weak generation of men raised by movies. What do you want to say about Project Mayhem? It's just the movies turn from 
let's ex- I feel like by the back third of the movie mm-hmm. much like the back third of this episode because with the fight club you're like I understand the I metaphor understand this. Yes. Yes. not yes. only do I understand right. it but this was set up in emotional character driven terms that are right. so clear and so logical also satirical right. but very clear but this is self expression and then Project Mayhem has basically nothing new to say no. The, the movie has no new points to make. Right. It evolves into what it really like. Terrorism. Like, yes, but also like 60s revolutionary Absolutely. anarchy. Like it's yes. not that different apart from the, that. It's weather underground. It's more yeah, it's corporately yes. targeted, yeah. you know, but like, yeah, it's just, yeah, we need to start blowing shit up. Like, you know, we, we're right. going to take this to its log- logical yeah. and extreme. And it's like, we're going to break the law. We're going to the kill logical people. continuation of sure. let's just get out our aggression. Right. Is the logical continuation, let's blow up a Starbucks? I don't think so, because I do think that the, the defining thing, I mean, the Fight Club comes out of them being like, I don't I don't care about anything. I want to care about something, I right? I want to feel something. I have to feel something. Right. Even if that is a fist in my mouth. Right. Whereas Project Mayhem is like very pointed. It's more like, look, I'm, we're breaking out of the Ikea apartment. I want to break someone's face. Yeah. Now I want to go to the source of my angst and destroy that as well. And then the speed with which it becomes this national cell right, of kill people. Kill them all. We're, 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 is, a, we're a paramilitary it, it, organization. It just feels yeah. like a thing that's like they adapted the sequel into the book as well. Like it feels right. like that kind of thing. It's, just, it's I, so yeah. much content of movie. It's 50 minutes. I will say I do feel like though Tyler, all of the stuff he's doing as the cater waiter where he's pissing sure. and coming into yeah. food. Like I do think there is something to his character that like it leads to Project Mayhem. Like I do leads, see, totally. yeah, I see there like being sort of it leading up or escalating to that. It but, escalates right. nicely, but it's just like the point has been made. Yes, I, when Fincher talks about like I, I now with distance could go and spend six months and figure out how to cut this movie down, you do feel like this is what he cut down. Like the thing he wants to accomplish is. Tyler becomes scary to the narrator. Spiraling out of control. The narrator's not even aware of his other self at this point. He's turning on him. And it's like, it doesn't need to be 45 minutes. It can be almost the proposal. But if it was 20, it would just be a disaster. It It might even feel crazier, right? Yeah. 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 The the slow build of it is correct narratively, but like emotionally, the mood, like as we're saying, you see the beginning, you see a fight club. Someone like Ben and I says, you know, I can see the thrill of that. By the time they're in the black suits and they're blowing up the corporate art. I'm like, look, I like setting fires as much as anybody and I love fireworks, but like, come on, I don't want to do this. Mm. And as Edward Norton says, he's like, you're running around in ski masks. What do you think's going to happen? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, come on. I want to like fuck shit up, but I don't want to like get shot at by the police. Right. Yeah, well, these are the limits of our pussy generation. That's true. But but that's the point is like, it goes from being, I think, in a satirical heightened way, fairly relatable. Yes. I am angry. I know what it is to feel angry and to feel confused to highly unrelatable, which is like, I don't actually want, like, I'm not actually ready to run off and like join a militia. But I mean, like, I think it's just crucial because we need to understand that Tyler was then found guilty of his crimes and rehabilitated oh, that's by true. society. Sense of the but then there's, like, right? there, there's subtle stuff once the guys start living in the house that I do like a lot. Like early narrators, like after the first month, I didn't miss TV. Right. Then when Project Mayhem's there, they have a TV. Yeah. So it's like even Tyler is selling out these ideals. Even now, that's a great call and because has, it's like, because that's the thing. It's like and the, the American pure flag simplicity. is in that shot when they're watching the TV report. Right. The, there's there's like a makeshift shitty American flag on the wall. The yeah, pure I simplicity mean, of Fight Club, where it's like we're punching each other. There is no end to this except we don't want to do it anymore. Right. And that's fucking it. Someone taps so, out. The fight is over. Right. But that's so like primal and like understandable versus like. I'm the boss and you're my soul. You know, it's like suddenly it's like, fuck, we're, we're bringing rules into this again. Yeah. You know, what were you going to say, Greg? I mean, you're going to uh, sigh loudly the second I bring this up, but I think it kind of needs to be said. This it better be another Deadpool DVD cover. Well, he knows. I have like 20 more. I have He's saved. 20 I'll steps send ahead you guys later. He knows everything. He knows everything. He's already Photoshopped himself onto the artwork for this mini series. God damn it, Deadpool. And, and uh, Pat Reynolds hasn't finished it what yet. What are you going to make David sigh? Make I, him sigh. I, I, this movie is getting at, it anticipated basically like the radicalization of like rando nihilistic who gives a shit humor on the internet leading to like b- bizarre political righteousness. You know, it, it is. It's like when the you're Matrix ta- in that respect. But when yeah, you're talking about movies, that shift, right, of just like Fight Club is basically just being like, we're just like posting edgelord memes. 
to then like 4chan becoming this like place. Here's of, what I'll say. A, a, a political hotbed. What? These people have always existed. The internet, of course, you of know, course. you know, amplifies them or you know, channels them in certain directions. You have to go down to NPR. Right. Tone as um, we continue this conversation. But the tiresome aspects of some of the yes. people in Fight Club, like I said, like there are people like that in the 70s and 60s and before and before and before. But not after, really. What do you mean? That kind of radicalism is very much not a part of the culture. It goes away. Sure. From. Well, but people are always saying, it's oh, online, we got to blow shit up. Yeah, you know. I mean, that it's always going to be there. Is it though? I don't know. Maybe not. I just I'm feel too like tired. in the I feel like <laughs> in the last that's twenty right, years, that's how I, I can't even <laughs> discourse anymore. I feel like, like in the last I don't know, twenty years, sleep. this kind of action, yes, yeah. is very much not a part of the culture. Frowned upon I, more. Yeah, I sure. Just, uh, very few protests. Very few like yeah, there you haven't know, been any major yeah. crunchy radicals America, putting a pipe bomb in yeah. some like summit um, of some kind but this is this is my point feel feels good man which i think is an excellent documentary about the whole weird life cycle of pepe the frog is about this whole thing of like it's a bunch of people who went to message boards because they were like i don't give a shit about anything my life feels like an absolute dead end all of this feels me meaningless i have no value i think i am dumb and boring right and then all of them were sort of like bonding over that then they start like making comedy you know, what are funny jokes we can make online? What are funny gifts we can make online? And then that somehow, like, metastasizes. I keep on using that fucking word. You do use it a lot, but that's fine. Into them we being like, we've decided we care a lot about certain things. And we're going to get, like, really active. How long have we been recording? Like an hour. <sighs> we're, yeah. we're finished. He's we're about to say a number that's going to make you We're feel. at the end of the movie. It's two hours and 47 okay. minutes. Still going we're, strong. We're, 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 at the, so. we're at the end of the movie. The we're getting like, close to David okay. can't record ads today. Here's a, here's, <laughs> no. here's a question. <laughs> Does this tale of the movie make it harder to appreciate as a very, very good David Fincher movie? I just get a little bored. I it do doesn't too. make I, me this is why this appreciate is... the movie less. It's just in the act of watching it, I start to feel myself slipping. Because, like, this is a pre internet movie. It has to be. Yes. Yeah, so Literally, it's, because it's from yeah. 1999. Well, the there's... internet is just coming yes, into shape. Yes, but, like, it yes. does not reflect the internet as we now know it. Mm -hmm. Well, no. And it does reflect a mentality that is wildly rampant on the internet now. Yes. But the point of this movie is like, you find that in the basement of right. Lou's, Lou's right. Tavern. Now you find it on the message board. Sure. Tyler mm -hmm. would hate this. Now you find yes. a meme account. If you're doing this as an edgelord on well, the internet. Meme accounts are good. They've got, you know, dank memes. Inspired by dank the vitriol though. of this movie, you're missing the point, obviously. Because mm -hmm. this is about feeling something. And it's not, a, you know... The Having people soap uh, lie poured on your hand. I mean, the soap stuff is, we haven't talked about it, but it's it's very it's very funny. It's Not a big part of the movie. No. No, it's I feel like it is more important in the book just in, in terms of like economics. Like that is how he's part of the market. Money. Hits slap yeah. stickery yeah. when they're getting the fat. The is fat funny. scene is really good where it gets caught on the uh and he falls on the, a the, couple times. The barbed wire and yeah. then it's like gooping everywhere. Stuff like that. Griff, are you photoshopping Deadpool's face on something not. new? Well okay. One, you can't say that incredulously because you have photoshopped and David, I would never onto various things that would during this believe. episode. I would do such a thing. <laughs> uh-huh. What are you doing? Nothing. Oh, okay. I thought you were looking something You're up. You're getting distracted. Um, I what, just what feel like you this doing? is a movie that Read the... the fucking uh, dossier right okay, here. Okay, well, so am I. I got the tab open. It's easy to love nostalgically. It's yes. impossible to admire this movie now. I, I don't know if it's impossible. I admire, mm. I really admire this movie aesthetically. I think yeah. because movies look like such hot trash a lot of the time now, no offense to good movies that I like, um, you know, the way this movie looks really does oh, no. feel even, so special Even though I don't really love Fincher's digital obsession, like he never makes movies that don't look good. Yeah. No, I'm not talking about, Fincher always makes movies that look good. I, I, but I, I'm just saying movies yes. generally, you know. Sure. It's just like, like the amount of care put into yes, like. But also like, what I, what I mean is like the amount of words spoken in this movie that makes me watching it now just laugh and roll my eyes is ludicrous. Like mm -hmm. all of the stuff there's, you know, you know the, even no, the, the whole time you just have to be turning to someone being like, you got to understand, you know, right. in 1999, a lot of this felt like very sort of like with it and interesting and. Now, yes, I know it feels a little trite. Yes. I roll my eyes, but I'm nostalgic for it. Right. Yeah. You're nostalgic so and you're sort of clapping them on the back. I have a... You know, like, yeah, you guys... You know, I can offer, fun. you know, what feels like a concluding point on the movie before I list all the great Fight Club merch I had and we talk about the video game for we half an hour. We do have to talk about Please. the video game for two minutes. Um, great. Two know, minutes in, times in, uh, in Chuck Klosterman's book, The 90s, Yes, I looked up to see if he had anything about Fight Club. And he says... Either Slacker or Fight Club. 
could justifiably be called the decade's most generationally defining. Mm. I wrote one word here that I can't read of my own writing. Probably no. Edifying. Uh-huh. Generationally defining, edifying film. Uh-huh. It's interesting that he calls out a very stonery, gentle film and a very right. aggressive And also film. slacker, plotless kind 1990, of, you know, 1999. vibes only. Right. Yeah, and it's yeah, very yeah. interesting that he identifies these two movies from opposite ends of the decade as generationally defining, edifying films that crystallize what is clearly in the air for lots of people watching them. For Gen X men, especially. I, I can't find a number. But I, oh, just, I love Slacker. I remember Art Slacker Linson, the, the producer, having yeah. a quote of just like, we all thought this thing was going to be a big fucking hit and it was going to speak to this feeling in the moment. It was going to be this sort of like cultural touchstone movie in theaters. It ultimately became one. I have this quote. You want it? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know if it's a quote you're looking for. He said, I think we ended up realizing we made the first film of the 21st century instead of one of the last which films of the that, 20th which century. Which is a clever thing to say. Like, Absolutely. I don't even know what that means, but I still am also kind of, because I'm also like, this movie is kind of the end of the 90s. Yes. So it is kind of the last 20th and century once again, film in a way. Th- but I know movie, what he means in terms of feeling like current and new and like the launch of something. But the irony is that like the 20, the 2000s, like there is no cinema like this. It's not like, oh, no. Bonnie and Clyde, first movie of the 70s. Right. It's like, no, there are, the 2000s do not make art that looks like this uh, for $70 everything. million. Dollars. Yeah, 9-11 oh, baby. changes everything. You ever heard about it? Or yeah. did you forget? No, I never forgot. It's just a very, you know, like, well, you know it, it, it was a movie that was misunderstood like as it was being projected for the first time. Right. Which is why it failed because it was confusing to people and they thought they were seeing a movie about hot men making soap. Hot men. Well, right. That was Instead the they thing. were seeing like a two and a half hour long anti-capitalist screed about how pathetic it is to have emotions and feelings. They, <laughs> they made the soap the center of the marketing but then yes. like And I bought then, on eBay a pink bar of Fight Club promotional soap. What, do you still have it? I don't think so. I don't he know used what happened it. to it. Wash his hands. No, I definitely didn't use it. It sat on my shelf yeah. and it shrink wrapped for years. I think it disappeared when my parents got rid of the house but what they didn't want to save your commemorative soap. I mean, it, I, I might have it somewhere. Sure. I, I just I can't speak to it for sure. I also had, as Griffin alluded to earlier, mm-hmm. two prize pieces in the basement. I got the seven foot tall cardboard display from Blockbuster for Fight Club, holding up the bar. Right? Brad Pitt's holding up the bar. Yeah, it's three D. You know, it's several yep. platformed. Because I said, what are you going to do when you get rid of this? And they said, throw it in the trash. And I said, if I write my name on the back of it, will you call me the day you don't want it anymore? And they said, sure. Who cares? If you right. come get it. So I had that in the basement. It was right next to the Nintendo. Right. Looked great. And cool. I also got the four-panel Blockbuster window display. Okay. Which they used to put up in the windows. So it's like with the, you know, a beam in the middle, two and two, mm-hmm. with like six by four. Okay. Huge poster. Okay. Of Fight Club. And I had to nail it to the wall because the stickiness was gone by the time they gave it to me. Just nail it to the wall. <laughs> sure. So these were in the basement. I bought a lot of Fight Club stuff. Script, the book, the soap. Never the game, though. Uh, the video game, of Which I course, learned about yesterday. Uh, was on the uh, PlayStation and 2 and the Xbox. Yes. Was, Griffin, have you played it? I have not. And it's wild because I was such a, a fan of tie-in games. I was looking for a used copy on eBay for a price that didn't feel stupid. And which basically is anything under $5. I can see it on the shelf here someday. I, I will get here eventually. But the big thing, which you text it a is, photo of. It is, of course, an Immortal Kombat style fighting game. It is just game. a fighting game. It is right. not There's a some, game about dismantling capitalism. There's no. some narrative, I believe, but largely it's like men in jeans uh, punching each other in the rain. And who is one yes. of those men? Well, okay. So it has no likenesses, but it does have the characters of Tyler Durden, Angel This doesn't Fair. look like meatloaf to you? It pointedly has no likenesses. <laughs> okay, fine. But the characters are styled after the characters from yes, the movie. Yes, you can play as Narrator, Bob. Narrator, Tyler, Angel Face, Bob. The mechanic. Uh, right. That's uh, You know, you can play as Marla, apparently. Uh, oh, she's so good at fighting in this film. <laughs> um, Someone missed the point on that one. But sure. if you beat the game, the ultimate unlock, do you know this, Ben? The ultimate unlock character in the game is Fred Durst. Now, Fred Durst, Famously uh, close friends with David Fincher. Is that her? Yes, because this was uh, early, mid-2000s when Fred Durst is like being pushed. It's like, maybe he's going to be a good filmmaker. Maybe he's going to educate Charlie Banks. And it was like he would shadow Fincher on sets. Fincher says this guy knows what he's talking about. Fincher's boosting Durst. So I was like, is that how we end up in the game? No. They wanted to use a Limp Bizkit song on the soundtrack of the game. And Fred Durst's contract for any video game that wanted to use a Limp Bizkit song was, you can use the song as long as I am a playable character. Indeed. And Fight Club said, yes, the game. 
So he's the Fight only Club person yes in it game. that looks like a real Fight Club. The game said yes. He's, he's the only also person in various in wrestling games, I believe. Yes. Uh, and uh, this was always the deal. Did he ever pop up in a Tony Hawk? He should have. Probably. Yeah. Go on. Not seeing the story. So no, but, I mean, I've never played it, so I don't know this, if like appalling, he's good. appallingly misguided Fight Club uh, side-scrolling fighter game. Right. I just think it's so funny is to be like, called? and what's you the, won't believe the, who the final unlock is. But what's yeah, the, it's like, not like Goro. It's not like some superpowered guy. It's Fred Durst. It's yes. also not with like the hat, it's with not the hat. Fincher. It's someone who has nothing to do with the movie. <laughs> Yeah. With the hat. He's in classic sort of like... But that's like, like a perfect example of like music the, video the wrong Fight Club. Correct. Uh, that The wrong lens through which to view Fight Club is like, yeah, man, break stuff. Right. Right, right break each other. Yeah. And then, when, when does the game come out? Game comes out 2? So Correct. it's like, okay, this movie's a hit. There's a huge cult for it now. We yeah. can sell this to like dumb bros who have a PlayStation Correct. and think this is a fun movie about fucking people's faces and like, getting into fights. And this is probably just like a re Yeah, it's just fucking virtual King fighter of Fighters or whatever. Or whatever. Yes, right, yes. yeah. Um... I mean, I'm watching some gameplay now, and it seems heavy on punches and kicks. Uh Yes, we watched a little... I sent the gameplay clip. David responded with some personal stories about his relationship with Limp Bizkit that we can either save for another day or you can reveal I think we need to just quickly throw them out. I have personal stories about my relationship to Limp Bizkit? Well, you said them on a text yesterday. What did I say? I love Limp Bizkit. I always have, and I still do. (laughs) I'm listening to them right now with my daughter. (laughs) Pretty sure. That's not what I said. the classics early. I said, let's see. At first, it's us arguing over whether we're starting at noon. David, were you a Biscuit fan? Have to assume Ben wasn't asking would be a waste of time. Ben gave that a <laughs> thumbs up and said $3 bills, y'all. <laughs> I said, I downloaded at least two records, probably on Kazaa uh-huh. or LimeWire or whatever I was using back then. Said, don't think I owned them, but I did do them the honor of burning them onto a disc. So somewhere in the world, in hot tra- dog flavored water is one of them. In a trash land. Someone trash- before that, significant other. I think you have the order wrong. Yeah, I know. I'm yeah. saying before. Yeah, significant think, other and you, hot dog. Uh, you guys would know soda. better than me. Yeah, you burned them onto a uh, business card shape seat, right? <laughs> of course, a, a biscuit, a and biscuit I handed card. them to all my teachers. You had a wallet full of biscuits. <laughs> and I said, "Why don't you take a listen to that?" Uh, Jesus, significant other, seventy minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking shut up, Fred. Isn't that wow. like seven times platinum too? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And chocolate starfish is seventy five. I remember at one point listening to chocolate starfish with a friend of mine, and like three songs, and we were like, "What is <laughs> like what? What is the matter with us? Some kind of spell broker." <laughs> it's like we have to. Stop Stop listening to this music immediately. <laughs> Forever. You know the one that song that's just like, we live in a fucked up land with a fucked up place. You know, like he just says that over and over again. No, I don't. Yeah. But yeah. I, like, I don't remember I, that I like this rendition. Oh, one of us going it's so bad. As you do. You're clearly if they the biggest, had a video, I probably saw it. It's called Hot Dog, I believe. And it sucks. The song oh. sucks. I just remember. Oh, it sucks? I remember. <laughs> yeah. That's the Bad Limp Biscuit song? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. The Roland <laughs> single of off of the album is yeah. so bad. Yeah. Uh, what? Come on. Roll it, roll it, roll it, roll it. Yeah. It's the other thing also. It's like, I, all I did all day was watch MTV. So I had to watch Limp Bizkit. They, they were they were just fucking cramming that stuff down our throats. Yeah. It, yeah. it is a bad time. But it's a bad is, time. This is the yeah. crisis of yeah. post Fight Club, post 2000, post September 11th, like identity, masculinity, aggression, anger. Yes. It just became this. It became... Right. Fred Durst. It's right. accidentally it's Fred Durst being in the and Fight Club game makes a lot of sense. A hundred percent. The other thing, of course, is that Fight Club is about thirty something Gen X men, but then a bunch of thirteen year old future millennials are watching right. it, being like, "This has a lot to say." Right. And it's like, it's not like Fight Club has nothing to say. No, it's li- it's literally like, the Rage Against the Machine of movies, where right. it's like socialism, anti capitalism, and then these angry kids are just like, "Yeah, man, fuck you." <laughs> <laughs> Well, hang on. I'm going to set you on fire. Hang on a second. <laughs> hang on a second. There's a lot more going. The artists who are using a corporation's it's money. Like, kid, you don't have a credit card. You're not even, you don't have these things to be mad about yet. It's like, yeah, I do. The artists burning a corporation's money have a kind of a, a point that they're Trojan horsing in and the kids are just like, fuck you, mom. <laughs> It really is like an equivalent thing. I want chocolate milk. And if you're, you know, me, you, you're like, oh, th- I get into this because it's angry and I appreciate it <laughs> later because I see what it's doing. And uh-huh. if you're most people, you're just like fucking snowflakes, man. Bulls on parade, break stuff. Yeah, I guess so. I I, I, I got no beef with Fight Club in a way. Like, you know, I'm like, I, I you know, right? It's sort of I like think I, you because know. it was less uh, formative in my personality. I look on it with less embarrassment now where there are tons of movies that I will not name that I do feel that way about. All right, give us one. Scooby Doo, two monsters on leash. Fair enough. Think, and we'll just mention we have a real I mean, like, answer. But then to your point, as we end, like 
you're levitating when the pixie starts. Absolutely. That is it, like yeah, okay. Any fucking rules. You've been exhausted for thirty minutes. Maybe yes. the mayhem, as you said. And you're also like, "Where's this going?" When they and reveal, he shoots himself and doesn't yeah. die. And you're when like, they reveal, all, right, you're seeing all the know. scenes again. Norton is just. You're like, "Oh, right. that's that's where." Oh, there's only one of him. You're just like, "Come it's on." It's a cool this, twist the first time, but by the time so you've seen long. the movie a lot, you're sort of like, "I know." I and know. then yeah, sure, yeah, sure, sure, the pixie song starts, and you're just like, "Oh, five stars." It's it's yeah. a, it's great. It's just what it, I just find it to be one of the most evocative uh, endings, and it obviously is like uh, it's the obvious culmination of everything this movie's doing. But I also just think like God, I wish you, you could fucking end most movies this way. You could end most movies with someone looking out a window and watching the world it's a collapse. Good end, it's a good yeah. end of the decade, right? Yes. Now, they premiered this film at the Venice Film Festival. Uh, it went very badly. Mm. Brad Pitt remembers the Helena Bonham Carter and the Marla line. I haven't been fucked like that since grade school. Like, he's like, Edward and I are the only people laughing. Like, this sort of like Tony Festival audience is like walking out. Do you know basically. the story behind that very quickly? <sighs> In the script, it was during that scene, she says, I want to have your abortion. And Laura Ziskin was like, I fucking hate that. Can you please shoot an alt? Right. And Fincher said, I don't want to shoot an alt uh, unless I right. come up with something that I like so right. much that I prefer it to what we have in there right now. Right. So you have to promise me if I reshoot it, you use whatever it is. And he shot that and gave it to her. And she was like, you fucking mm, son of a pain bitch. In the ass. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Norton does say while the movie's getting booed, Brad Pitt turns to him with like a huge smile on his face being like, this is the best movie I've ever been in. Like, yeah. clearly Pitt is like, I did it. Thrilled. Like, you know, yes. I got to actually channel my image in a way that I really like. But he yeah. does that again, you know, like Jesse James is another thing where it's I like, agree. I want to deconstruct yeah. the myth of the guy who looks like me. Well, I mean, yeah. that's what Moneyball is. That's why Moneyball is the greatest. A film lot. Ever he made. does that a lot. After I this know. Because yeah. it's, oh, it's the thing that works for him, right? Yes. I mean, like, when, well. Yeah, like even in Glorious Bastards or, you know, like, you know, it's like he's making fun of his image in the perfect way or he's like, you know, sort of messing with it. Like, you know, yeah, this like this is when he starts to figure it out. He's like really, playing a movie star, but also yeah. their self-awareness. I mean, yes. I, you know, uh, the film made uh, 11 million dollars in its opening weekend and 37 domestically. Uh, and worldwide, it took 100 even. Sure. So certainly a failure, but then, as we have said, mm -hmm. makes a lot of money on DVD quickly. It makes it back. Uh, Paul Thomas Anderson famously uh, called the movie out and wished David Fincher testicular cancer. Uh, do you remember? Do you know this? I forgot. I about don't it. know yeah. um, because his dad had recently died of cancer. And he right. said, "I thought saw thirty minutes of the movie." This is also like late 90s really nervy young PTA who is kind right. of like this kind of like wired He's also got Magnolia asshole. to be he yeah. also was right. just worried that he's well, going this to lose line. this chain and then Kevin Smith shits on Magnolia like these guys are all they're fucking all needling each other and they're all other. you know yeah. but he says I saw 30 minutes of it only because our trailer's playing in front of it I would love to go on railing about the movie I'm just gonna pretend as if I haven't seen it it's unbearable I wish David Fincher testicular cancer for all his jokes about it I wish him testicular fucking cancer. I really 20 years later, oh. Fincher says, I've been through cancer with someone I love. I can understand if someone thought that we weren't making fun of cancer survivors, but he's basically like, I kind of get it. Like, if you're Still in a makers. if you're in a rough state like that, my dad died. It made me feel different about death. Sure. My dad probably liked Fight Club less than Paul did, which I think is a funny line. Uh -huh. But I just love the Finchers. Like, yeah, I get it. Like, filmmakers need to talk like this more often. We've really lost this. I do agree that we need some like beef wars with filmmakers. The yeah. only problem is no one makes good movies anymore, except for you know. But like you know, it's like no, no, I don't it's just guys on Twitter arguing with guys who like different directors on Twitter. <laughs> right? It's we the just same so, complaints so from the worst from thing. people who have no skin in the game. We just, we just need like top tier beef. Like this. This is right. we need. We, we need the auteurs to have the knives out. Instead, they're all basically like, "Look, man, if you made a movie, I'm proud of you. We need this industry to survive." Yeah, that's that's Paul Thomas Anderson's thing. He says yeah, all the time, "You got to respect the swing." Um, There's that yeah, where he takes John Krasinski aside. Yes, yes. Like, yes. I think ever, about it all the yeah, time. Don't ever say anything Never. bad about any movie. Never. Um, the other thing I, Fincher, I love this era of PTA. He's such an asshole. It's great. Yes, uh, Fincher also says when his daughter was nine years old and she uh, went to some school function with him and said, "Oh, I want to meet my friend Max." Fight Club is his favorite movie, mm -hmm. and Fincher says, "I took her aside and said, you are no longer to hang out with Max. You cannot be alone with Max.'" <laughs> <It's very laughs> uh -huh. October fifteenth, nineteen ninety nine. Griffin. Okay. Yeah. Fight Club opens to eleven million dollars only on two thousand screens, which also mm. feels like kind of a mistake. Yeah. But whatever. It's sure. a bomb. Sure. Pretty big bomb. 
right? Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. Many, there's not that many more screens in 1999. There's no 4,000 screen. Releases. Well, I will say there are two films playing on 3,000 screens, though. Okay, so that's that's the things it goes. Yeah. October 99. This was in a box office game online recently. This, and I oh, just, really? Uh, right okay. away, I was just like, oh, oh fo a Fox movie that's not doing well, that's Fight Club. Number two is from the good people atop the mountain. This is number one. I know. No, I'm saying Fight Club was yes, Fight Club with, was with, a, with 11. a soft one. A soft one. A very soft one. Number two had been number one for three weeks in a row. Okay. It is a crime thriller from the good people atop Paramount. Is it Double Jeopardy? Mountain, and it is called Double yeah. Jeopardy. Yeah. Movie we rewatched less than a month ago. And? So fun. Yeah, that's like a rare... That's I a mean, movie where at the time we were like, eh, this kind of like B-list exactly. thriller. Now I watch and I'm like, a taught masterpiece. I had <laughs> never seen, I had never yeah. seen High Crimes. Oh yeah. So I've never seen High Crimes either. So solid. I mean, a terrible, like the sixth Xerox of Silence of the Lambs in Seven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but again, now you're Is just everyone like, smoking that dank weed in that movie? No, no, no. These it's not are that kind of high. No, no. It's, oh, it's, it's very serious crime. How dare you? Do you want to end the episode? <laughs> I'd never We're seen it. We're just starting to get somewhere. <laughs> Super solid. And then yeah. I was like, let's rewatch the other Ashley I'm Judd. I'm going to paraphrase him, but I was talking to. That's the uh, second Judd Morgan Freeman as well, right? That's them reuniting yes, them after right. Kiss but the Girls. Then, but, yeah. but it's the first Alex. Where, I forget the Alex Cross. Alex well, Cross, Cross is Kiss the Girls. Not Kiss the Girls. Along came a spider. He's Kiss the Girls and Along came a spider, not High Crimes. Okay, exactly. So High Crimes is just. He's a lawyer. Yeah, exactly. Know. So it's right. like a reunion, but it's a franchise. Right. There's a literal Alex Cross sequel, and then there's a spiritual. Yeah, we have a Long Game of Spider thing. next after doing High Crimes. Long Game of Spider Double Jeopardy kind of stinks. Kiss the Girls is pretty good in uh, my memory. Or no, wait, that's what we watched. We didn't watch High Crimes yet. High Crimes is like 2002. Yes. High Crimes is also okay. No, we, I'd never that's seen. Like, I'd never seen Kiss the yeah. Girls. That's High what, Crimes is the last. Okay, of no, we're the doing the Major thrillers. Oh, I had okay. never. I had never seen Kiss the Girls. So you watch Kiss the Girls, and then we watched Double Carrie Jeopardy. Carrie Elwes, okay. the, the Carton of Milk. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good movie. Yeah, I mean Bill, it's kind of bad. Bill Goodberry, friend of the show, absolutely. We're talking to him the other night. Brack, humble brack, and we were just talking about like watching any three star movie from like 1987 to 2002. You just go like, well, this three star movie is now by default a five star because of its like ambition, knowing exactly what it's trying to be and actually executed with good craft. Right. Yeah, yeah uh, fun, I, punchy. I completely right, agree. Double and of Jeopardy course, falls into. You it. also throw on one of those movies, and it's like Ashley Judd, Tommy Lee Jones, and you're like, "Yes, I know the stars of Bruce Double Jeopardy." Greenwood. But then, right, it just keeps going, and you're like, "Holy shit!" Everyone in this movie is somebody. Like, right. I'm so happy. Bruce Greenwood obviously is the villain. Anna Beth Gish, Roma Mafia, Michael Gaston, Spencer Tree Clark. Like, I mean, it's not a, a the movie best that version basically this, made most people misunderstand the law. Absolutely. What do you mean? Just from the trailer, it's like, well, of course, there's a double. Double Jeopardy, double, double Jeopardy situation. Number right. three at the box office, an even bigger bomb than Fight Club. Even Griffin, bigger bomb. Than I would Fight say Club. I, the, the, this is opening at number three to nine million is an underperformance. What studio? Ah, uh, the, the studio is a globe spinning. Universal words come dun, around dun, dun, saying dun, Universal. Dun, 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 dun. They're here to tell a story. A story. A romantic comedy drama starring two movie stars, uh -huh. directed is by a big story director. Of us? Story of us. The story of us. Bruce and Michelle. Bruce and Michelle. Playing for Oscar, I feel like. Yep. Oscar doesn't pick up the phone. <laughs> it does not. No. A rhino they send him a letter. Oscar returns to sender. Yes. Haven't seen the story of us. Have you? No, I don't think so. No, not not like, the kind of... that. That's going to be really low on my 90s recovery project. I feel, right? like, it, I feel like there's a chance Anna and I might have watched it like 10 years ago back when Netflix would just have random, like, you know, yeah, sure. real right. movies on it. Right. Mm -hmm. But I don't know for sure. Um, number four, the box office. We've invoked this director a bunch on this episode. He was the first choice for Fight Club. David O. Russell, Three Kings. Three Kings. Maybe September. stealing the gold. Um, good movie. I think so. I haven't, haven't seen it in a, a while. Long time. I would like to. Do you guys know what the tagline for Story of Us is? Um, no. Can a marriage survive fifteen years of marriage? What? That's the hook. The poster is so bad. Oh, it's narrated. <laughs> yeah. It's narrated? Well, let's narrate the poster. Okay. Michelle Pfeiffer. Wait, it, my eyes have to be drawn left. It's one of those classic, like, Bruce Willis' famous diagonal, verse, but right. Michelle Pfeiffer's name is above it. Sure. And then uh, Michelle Pfeiffer in profile, smiling wanly as she is, you know, 
often does. He's like whispering in her ear, but it's clearly photoshopped and they're not in front of the camera. I was going to say, time. I think it's supposed to look like he's whispering in her ear or yeah. sort of kissing her on the cheek or something. Instead, it kind of looks like he's being blown away by a yes. big fan. Yes. Because he's like blurry <laughs> and he's kind of like, eh, like, and it says, can a marriage survive 15 years of marriage? A Rob Reiner film in little uh, floating it's got a little, uh, uh, ribbon. scroll. <laughs> ribbon. Right. You'll you do go. it when you do Reiner. I thought this was a Zwei Bell. Zwei Bell wrote. I've mentioned, I texted this to, I think, at least David at some point, but whenever you play online the daily box office game, mm-hmm. yeah. 1999, you're like, one of the great year. Yeah. How many gems are going to be in this right, top It's five? all trash. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> oh, okay, it's one movie that people like and then four of the biggest pieces of shit that have ever <laughs> yeah. been. Well, it's, it's so true. And of course, the Oscars that, that year are like that. a right. lot of whiffs yeah. like and yeah. ignoring, obviously, movies like Fight Club. Yeah, not a great Oscar. Um, nah, number four is Three Kings. Number five is um, the Best Picture winner of 1999. American Beauty. In its fifth week, What's it let me be $41 Frank. million. <laughs> well, He's I back. do declare. You ever jerked off in the shower? It's been the highlight of your day. I rule. Nothing gets me going like a rose petal. <laughs> uh, number six at the box office. Speaking of like forgotten 1999 crap, uh, uh-huh. Sidney Pollock's Random Hearts. Yep, that's a real. Um, which has maybe one of the most exist. misguided uh, studio decisions in history. Chris and Scott Thomas doing an American accent. Yeah, why do that? Uh, number seven at the box office. Superstar. I like when Helena Bottom funny. Carter is listing all of his names when she's standing in the middle of the street. And as her line reading goes on, she just gets more and more British. She's uh, like, any of yeah. the names they call you? Rupert? <laughs> Cornelius? And it's like, what is Rupert. she doing? Yeah. Did they not want to ADR this line? That's, uh, they're you, all movie characters. Like, it's supposed to be Rupert Pumpkin and Cornelius from Planet of the Apes uh, makes, and whatever. Okay, yeah. that makes yeah. some sense. I know Rupert is, they use it. Wait, what was after lot. Random Hearts? Superstar. Uh, SNL movie. Another Funny. great, 1999, man. Great Mark, year for some. Mark McKinney. Not sure. That's an incredibly strange film. I haven't seen it since I was a kid. It is. Kid. In incredibly strange. Now you guys got to do the SNL movies. I thrown it out. I mean, with some finessing. Yeah, I told no. you what do them all. I no. told you how we're closing out Patreon for the year, and yes. you got so excited. Got excited. I'm uh, excited. Ding. It's a joke. That's a joke from the, one of the movies we're covering. Okay, uh, and a very obvious one if you know the trailer. Yep. Uh, and I know you know it. Uh, number eight of the box office is The Sixth Sense. Uh, oh, right. Three months in, has made 250 million dollars. Uh huh. Uh, number nine is Martin Lawrence comedy Blue Streak. Uh huh. Is that the one that people helped me remember? Correct. What it was when I said when I left you was like ee, and then I came back and you was like well boom. Yes. And then correct. someone was I was like I need some blankie to tell me this. It's it's Blue Streak. Right. Number ten is a uh, Christian film. Okay. Opening this week called The Omega Code. Oh yeah. Sure. Which yeah. is like the Antichrist is using yeah. the Bible to take over the world or is something. That the one that Christopher Walken's in. Am I uh, right it's got there? Michael Ironside and Casper Van Dien. Okay. Are you thinking of prophecy. Yes. I'm Which is not right. Christian. Just no. uh, Michael York as the Antichrist. He was playing Basil Exposition and the okay. Antichrist. Yeah, yeah. Good year. Uh, you've also got Drive Me Crazy, the Melissa Joan Hart vehicle with Adrian Grenier. Saw that first week. I'll Absolutely. tell you that much. Banger of a Britney song. And... Uh, the Elmo, Adventures of Elmo and Grouchland, which I should probably fire up for my daughter. Yeah, she'll love it. Yeah. You know who's fucking... Patinkin. Ham sandwich. Patinkin is really good in that movie. Fucking eyebrows for days. Uh, yeah. So for the Love of the Game, which we've covered. Uh, Stigmata. Mm. Will we cover that one? A very important film. Uh, Price. Mis- Mystery Alaska. Price is in Stigmata. Jonathan Bryce? I believe so. Is he playing like a priest? Sure. That guy's played a lot of priests. Yeah. He also played a pope. Yeah. I don't know if you know this. Which one? One of the two. One of two? One of He's two. playing Pope 2. Okay. He's part of a set. My daughter likes to say that there are two of things. Like, mm. that's the most exciting thing for her. And it would be really funny if I could, like, make her say two popes. She likes to say there are or likes to observe when there are. Like, she'll, like, pick up two things and be like, you know, two spoons. I see, whatever. I see. You know, like, that's that's her favorite number. Two. Good number. Good number. Well, that's how old she is and mine as well. That's very true. They, they, know, they know from two. Yeah. We got to get them together. You've been away. I was briefly away. You were away for like two weeks. That's true. Yeah. Then I'm away. So you say. But the, well, geez, leave me alone. Can we wrap it up? David, what do you mean? mean? You're drawing this episode out. God, David. You're making plans go. with Alex. Well, I got to make go. food, dinner for my baby. I got to get out of here. <laughs> Wait, who's your baby? <laughs> my baby. 
I'm just imagining. Griffin has a basket case as <laughs> no. baby. In a, no, a, I'm imagining like a baby Yoda doll. It's like sitting in a high chair. And I'm, get out of here. I'm imagining a mutant in a wicker basket that Griffin feeds slop you know to. Aquaman's in its third series of reshoots and is something that uh, the Hollywood Reporter just posted. I wonder what if, if we're going to cover that one. Will ever <laughs> that got an indie SAG waiver, right? No studio money? Yeah, yeah. No, no studio will acknowledge being involved with it at this point. It is wild. That is the only DC movie since the Nolan Dark Knight trilogy to make a billion dollars and they have been treating it like it is the biggest disaster on their hands. Uh, yeah, it's, it is really weird. The number one, you know, like thing uh, uh, that DC ever produced and the sequel is basically radioactive. I don't know, man. Alex, final thoughts. Very complex rewatch for me. Oh. Belo- a beloved film. Yeah. That you I, demanded, I, or not demanded, but I, requested. I, I accepted Kindly. it when Griffin was Politely like, you should do that. Just a, right. It's just a complicated movie to look back. I mean, I remember yeah. having like raucous sunshine midnight screenings of this a few times when I was in college. Just like, man, I get to see a print of Fight Club, people going nuts. You're there until 2.45 in the morning. Yeah. It's a very silly movie. It's very silly. Is Zodiac your favorite? I would say I would rank it number one yeah. if, if, if pressured. Yeah. But it's insane to be like, yeah, this was my favorite movie for like three years. It would maybe be like my third favorite Fincher now, possibly fourth. Yeah. Wait, what What else is above it? I mean, I would put seven above it. I would probably put Social Network above it. You'd and be, then I just... Now be wrong. I'm beyond that, I just couldn't justify anything else above it, even if I'm like, yeah. What about yeah. Benjamin Button? He's a venerable senior citizen. Benjamin. Gotta give the guy some respect. He, yeah. <laughs> and how does he look relative <laughs> to how old he actually is? <laughs> Let me be frank. Yeah. I would put the first episode seven, possibly but I look a lot older. Ben looks like he's melting. <laughs> <laughs> ben, you came in ready for Project Mayhem, and we gave it to you. Yep. You did. Yeah. Really did. Yesterday, we did a different episode, and I was like, do we have anything planned for Fight Club? And Ben was like, I don't know. We might fight. <laughs> That's the only <laughs> idea I have. That was his pitch. He's been, been doing some complicated bits recently. Yeah, and I, I, I feel like for this one, I was like, I know we're going to go for approximately three hours. Yep. Your complicated bit, let's say, and you did put a lot of prep work into it, was not sleeping for two weeks. Yes, that's yeah. true. Yeah. So I, you gotta I, take you gotta become a sleepy time honkshu king again. You gotta <sighs> do it. I know. Maybe we'll get you a big cap and a candle on a plate or something. I mean, like we gotta do something. Can I tell you what Ben told me after yesterday after the court? <laughs> I don't think I was this like, will I am a sleep you, therapist, and I'm like, here's what you do: put this big cap on, take this candle. <laughs> no, sorry, go ahead. Can I say this, Ben? I don't know. What? I don't think it's too embarrassing. Wow. Ben was like, I've been sleeping so poorly. I was like at the beginning of the episode really struggling to stay awake. Mm-hmm. And then you guys in what was the Alien 3 episode it brought out, out him falling asleep that on when a we did the Alien, alien commentaries on Patreon, uh, he fell asleep. and was did, like, I couldn't do it twice. You were yeah. so, you did seem out of it at the start of the episode to the point that I was like, is Ben mad at me? Like, what's going on? And I think you were just sleepy time on show. Very sleepy, sleepy time, time on show. King. I'll say this in closing. Yeah, I think I'll save hip hop sims for another day. Hey, yes, yeah, you're never going to reveal promise. that one. That's a promise. We've ben, ben and I are working on something. Okay, great. Mixtape. Ben's Ben's got his assignment. His project mayhem homework is. Ben, I understood the assignment. Yes. He understood the ben, assignment. Ben looks full of vim and vigor and energy <laughs> about this assignment. Yeah. Ben um, needs a nap. Alex, thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks, happy Alex. to come by. Yeah, uh, and I'm glad you, you got your present. Mischief, mayhem, lucky numbers on VHS. It's what we promise here at Blank Check. Thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Marie Barty for our social media and helping to produce the show. AJ McKeon and Alex Barron for our editing. Joe Bowen and Pat Reynolds for our artwork. Please don't put Deadpool over our faces. Thank you to JJ Birch for our research. We end up using a lot more of it than we thought we would. Uh, Lee Montgomery and the Great American All for a theme song. You can go to blankcheckpod.com for links to some real nerdy shit, including our Patreon Blank Check special features where we're doing the Fincher music video episode, but we're also doing the Brosnan Bond movies, including uh, Jonathan Price's, uh, of course, vehicle Tomorrow Never Dies. Mile a minute action excitement. Dude, so great. It's a good episode, though. And, uh, and you're yeah, doing all really the cards. Episode. And we're doing every, we're doing a, a house of cards one minute at a time. Right. But only if you pay me $1 million in unmarked American cash. <laughs> yes. yes. And then we'll get real Frank, Frank on Frank Maine. Frank is your <laughs> That's, anytime I can get you to do the voice, I'm really happy. Uh, mm-hmm. Tune in next week for Panic Room mm-hmm. with Eva Anderson. The great Eva Anderson. We already recorded the it. Show. It's a good app. It's a corker. Love that movie. And as always, gentlemen, check your texts. 
Erdogan, just please go to your oh phone. Oh my god. This was this a difficult good. one. This is good. Yeah, it's well, this is why you've been so yes, occupied. Thank you. The last hour. Tell them what it is. Well, I'll I'll read this poster aloud for everybody. Starting at the top left. They're headed to the homeland. Head. Who could be headed? I swear, sort of move my eyes over. <laughs> Nia Vardalos. John Corbett. Well, I'm sure you're seeing their faces on this poster. My big fat Greek wedding three. And this is, of course, Griffin has taken a very soberly photographed poster where everyone's faces looked normal. Ten different humans. <laughs> and everyone was clearly in the same room. Yeah. And he's put Deadpool's face on everyone. Lainey Kazan, <laughs> Joey Fatone. <laughs> Not Michael Constantine because he sadly left us. God bless. He got out before he, <laughs> he did. Pulled. He was like, they were like, we're gonna make my big pack recording three. And he was like, I'll see you later. <laughs> R.I.P. to Michael Constantine. Uh, yep. Only in theater September eighth. Love the movie that comes out during TIFF. That's probably premiering at Venice and Telluride, though. That's why it's coming out then. Telluride secret screening. Well, they're all secret. Well, this is top yeah, secret. No, doing, yeah, is, pain of death. This is classified. You need a Q clearance to see this one. Bye.